Good morning, everyone. I'm Lissy Medvedow, Executive Director of the Rappaport Center for Law and Public Policy at Boston College Law School, along with Dan Canstrom, Faculty Director, and Abigail Chingo, Administrative Assistant. Welcome to today's recorded conference after Bruin, Gun Safety and Gun Laws in Massachusetts and Beyond. This conference delves into the legal issues arising from the Supreme Court decision in Bruin, the myriad organizations working to protect communities, and the outside of the box thinking by municipalities and lawyers of how to address gun safety. We all want to feel and actually be safe in our homes, in our lives, and in our communities. Guns in the United States have resulted in approximately 100 deaths a day. And in recognition of October as Domestic Violence Awareness Month, included in that number are an average of 70 women a month in the US who are fatally shot by an intimate partner. As we are all painfully aware, guns have caused unbearable heartbreak across the United States, in Newtown, Connecticut, Las Vegas, Parkland, Florida, Buffalo, New York, Uvalde, Texas, and more, too many to name. The Washington Post just reported that more than 320,000 children have been exposed to gun violence during school hours since Columbine happened in 1999. Our hope is that at the end of the day, we'll understand more about current laws, programs that can be replicated to reduce gun violence, and creative approaches that lawyers, legislators, doctors, healthcare professionals, community activists, and others can consider to make our country a safer place to live. Let me provide you with a very quick rundown of the day. We'll begin with a keynote address by the esteemed United States Senator Chris Murphy, whom I'll introduce in a moment. Panel one, which begins immediately after the Senator's remarks, addresses the Supreme Court decision, which dramatically altered the landscape of gun laws. During panel two, which runs from 11.30 to 1 p.m., we'll hear from the experts who run community violence prevention and interruption programs across the country. And panel three, which will be held from 1.30 to 3 p.m. to close out the conference, showcases innovative gun laws and regulations being implemented in the U.S. Now I have the great privilege of introducing United States Senator Chris Murphy, from my home state of Connecticut, who has been an extraordinary advocate for practical, common sense gun reforms to reduce gun violence. Who will ever forget the Senator standing on the Senate floor after the horrific shooting in Uvalde, Texas, imploring, begging his colleagues to take action, to find a path forward, to find a way to pass laws. And here I'll paraphrase just a bit so that fewer schools and communities will ever have to experience the horror and suffering of places such as Sandy Hook and Uvalde. In addition to fighting for gun reforms, Senator Murphy serves on the Foreign Relations Committee, the Health, Education, Labor and Pensions Committee, and the Appropriations Committee. He has worked to make college more affordable. He has led a bipartisan effort to improve our mental health system, and he's fought to expand American manufacturing. The Senator has been a longtime public servant. Before being elected to the US Senate, he served for three terms in the US House of Representatives, and prior to that, eight years in the Connecticut State Legislature. He's a graduate of Williams College and the University of Connecticut Law School. Senator, my 91-year-old mom still lives in Connecticut, as do my grandchildren and my daughter and son-in-law. Thank you for working so passionately to keep them safe and healthy. I bring you U.S. Senator Chris Murphy. Well, thank you very much, uh, Lissy, for that uh, very kind introduction. Um, thank you to Boston College, the law school, um, for convening this really uh, important panel. Uh, and thank you so much for inviting me to take part uh, in it. You've got a really impressive lineup today. Um, looking forward to uh, getting a, a download uh, as to um, what recommendations come from your um, panels. Um, particularly grateful that you're uh, 
including some good Connecticut representation uh, today, um, opening with me and then closing with my great friend, Josh Koskoff, who can speak um, much more expertly than I can uh, about the avenues for legal action and legal redress. Um, but um, let's just start with the obvious. Um, the scope of this epidemic is absolutely enormous and it is growing. Um, Lisa, you mentioned the statistic that gets repeated over and over, over 100 people die every day from guns in this country. Um, that's mostly suicides, but of course it also includes the um, high income world's highest gun homicide rate by a factor of 10. Um, it does not include all of the people who are injured by guns every day. And, um, thanks to um, our medical system, we save the lives of far more people than perish, um, but those injuries last forever, um, both the physical and the mental wounds that result from being shot. But the real cost of this epidemic um, never shows up in the statistics about a shooting, either a mass shooting or a shooting on a street corner here in Hartford. Um, I live in the south end of Hartford. I live in you know, one of the more violence uh, prone neighborhoods in the state. Um, and just a few weeks ago, um, I spent an afternoon at um, Burr Elementary School. It's a K through eight school um, in the south end of Hartford. Um, I met with a group of student leaders. Um, they were all about seventh grade, eighth graders. Uh, and, you know, sometimes it takes a little while for, you know, kids to, you know, come out of their shell and um, be honest with you, especially when they're meeting, you know, with the United States Senator in a suit and a tie. Um, and it took these kids five, 10, 15 minutes before they got to the topic that would consume the rest of our hour and a half. And it was the topic of their walk to and from school. That's all they wanted to talk about. All they wanted to talk about was how their entire life is dominated by a feeling of insecurity, a feeling that they could be killed any day, walking to school or walking home from school. Many of them had parents or guardians that would not let them leave the house uh, if that parent or guardian wasn't home. One girl talked about the fact that when she leaves school every day, she has to go home, go inside her house, lock her door and not come out until her mother returns, sometimes very late at night. Others talked about the fact that they live close to parks, but they can't and wouldn't even consider going in that park because of the reputation for gun violence that exists in those public spaces. These kids are living life lives of never ending 24 seven trauma. And what you know or will learn over the course of this seminar is that there is a biological process that plays out in the brains of these children. Um, their brains are literally bathed in this hormone called cortisol um, that you or I may sort of, we may experience a burst of cortisol only maybe once or twice in our life when we're subjected to some immense trauma. These kids are getting cortisol pumped into their brain every single day because of that unending trauma. And that cortisol for young brains is corrosive, it's corrosive. And so it's not a coincidence that all of the underperforming schools, quote unquote, in this country are in the violent neighborhoods because these kids' brains are broken. They cannot learn. They cannot form lasting relationships. They don't have resiliency, bounce back abilities. Um, not because these kids are born different than any other kid in this country, but because their brains are literally fried by the constant exposure to gun violence. And today, that exposure is never ending. I was in Bridgeport, Connecticut just a few weeks ago talking to law enforcement there, and you know, they were shaking um, as they explained to me how fundamentally different the streets of Bridgeport are today than they were just 10 years ago. 10 years ago, a group of kids in Bridgeport might share a gun. You know, there might be a community gun that lived in somebody's house or maybe lived in a car, or maybe lived in a public space. And when they needed that gun, you know, 
that group of kids loosely organized would know how to find it. It used to be that the police in Bridgeport would you know, make traffic stops and occasionally come across weapons in those cars. Today, every kid has a gun. Every kid has one. Every car that they stop, not every car, but many cars, more than ever before, have guns. One police officer said, in the last two years, I haven't responded to a single fist fight. Every fight is a shooting. The ubiquitous of guns in our society is fundamentally different today than it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Every beef, every argument in some neighborhoods ends up in shots being fired. And that can be explained simply through the prism of American gun laws, which allow for these weapons to flow so freely from the legal market to the illegal market, from states with loose gun laws into states like Connecticut or Massachusetts with tougher gun laws. Now, I wrote a book on the epidemic of gun violence in America. I will make the case to you that um, American violence is about a combination of factors, including intense poverty and racism. Violence has been used as a mechanism to oppress primarily African-Americans, but minority groups and new entrants to America over the course of human history. But American violence is mostly about the guns. It's mostly about the guns. Uh, and our decision a long time ago uh, to um, essentially allow these weapons to move into America at a rate that no other like, with no other parallel amongst like countries. Um, and so I just wanna frame your discussion um, with a sense of urgency uh, about getting this right. The good news is, I mean, I know you're gonna have a panel on innovative solutions, but here's my plea to you. Don't, don't search too hard for innovative solutions. We really don't need to make up new solutions. We actually know what works. We know what works. Connecticut has a rate of gun violence 400% lower than Florida. Now, people in Connecticut are different than people in Florida. I'm sure that's true, but they're not 400% different. The reason that we have lower gun violence rates is because we're just a lot more careful about who gets a weapon. We don't allow for you to buy assault weapons in our state. It doesn't mean that you can't get them. It doesn't mean that bad people still can't get weapons, but we just make it a lot harder for that to happen. And thus we have a lot lower rates of gun violence. We banned these military style assault weapons in this country for 10 years. And it's just not a coincidence that during those 10 years, we saw a rapid decline in the number of mass shootings. So I'm all for innovation. But universal background checks and restrictions on certain very powerful weapons designed to kill as many human beings as quickly as possible, we know that works. We know that works because we saw the experience when we implemented some of these changes at a national level, and we see the difference in state experience, depending on what laws they have on the books. Um, you're going to talk about the legal paradigm, and you are right, um, let's see, that you know, we're in a different environment after the Bruin decision. Um, this sort of new invitation to look at historical tradition is, you know, uh, potentially a blank check for politicians masquerading as judges to interpret history any way they see fit and impose their political worldview, their political opinions about firearms uh, onto the country. But the truth of the matter is, if you really wanna get into a conversation about America's tradition, America's historical tradition of gun regulation, it really points um, to the government being able to play a pretty significant role in the decision over who gets which weapons. Because from the very beginning, America was a country um, that regulated guns. Our founding fathers believed in the regulation of guns. 
there were laws on the books during early America um, that banned certain classes of individuals from owning weapons, largely for racist reasons. There were laws on the books banning weapons from being hidden, concealed. There were laws on the books requiring the registration of weapons, ammunition, gunpowder. Fast forward to the 1880s, excuse me, fast forward to the 1800s, and states all across this country, especially as the handgun became um, more ubiquitous, started passing laws that today would be considered politically unpalatable. States passed laws banning weapons. Counties and cities all across America banned the possession of guns outright. Um, and courts didn't bat an eye. There was no suggestion during that period of time when states were engaged in wholesale prohibitions on individuals carrying guns that the Second Amendment barred that kind of law. The contests normally were over whether state constitutions prohibited those kind of laws. Um, most judges deemed the state constitutions to allow for that regulation in the Few cases where courts determined otherwise, states rushed to change their state constitutions to permit significant regulation of guns. But at no point, up until the mid to late 1900s, did any courts suggest that the Second Amendment, the federal constitution, was a bar on any restriction of gun ownership or gun carrying imposed by states counties or municipalities. So if you really want to have a conversation about the historical precedent of gun regulation in this country, you have to admit as a jurist that the entire idea of the Second Amendment being a block to the regulation of guns was anathema to American political leaders, American jurists, the Supreme Court for 80 to 90 percent of American history. And so we are all worried about what courts are going to do in the wake of Bruin, but there should be an argument, whether it matters or not, that advocates of gun regulation should invite a survey of American history, a survey of historical tradition, when it comes to what is feasible, what is allowable, when it comes to the regulation of firearms, because this country has a robust history of regulating firearms and a robust history of jurisprudence in believing that the Second Amendment allows for that regulation. Um, and so I look forward to the discussion that you're gonna have. I worry, uh, listen, I see what's coming. I, I, I see the Bruin decision is just basically providing an invitation to conservative, uh, politically motivated district court and appellate court judges to just make up whatever justification they need in order to impose their political views on the country. But um, I actually think the real history is on our side. Um, let me end by just you know, saying a word about what we did this summer, um, because you are talking about innovative approaches and you're talking about community anti-gun violence initiatives. Um, there's a lot of innovation in the piece of legislation we passed this uh, summer, but you know it, it, it wasn't innovation dictated by policy needs. It was innovation dictated by political needs. Um, because again, I, I believe that there's not a lot of reason to innovate if you're just looking for what works, um, but we had to innovate in order to find 60 votes. Um, I'm proud of what we did. I think what we passed this summer um, is a breakthrough. I think it fundamentally shifts the power dynamics on the issue of gun violence. And I think it will provide um, a platform for a lot more agreement and a lot more um, policy advancement in the coming years. Um, but um, we also, you know, this summer, I think gave a lot of new tools to states to do some good things as well. I'll just give you a couple of examples. Um, and, and examples where innovation can happen. Um, we funded the development and implementation of red flag laws 
um, in this country. It's up to states whether they want to adopt a red flag law, but now you've got a steady stream of federal funding to help you implement that law. And that's really important because red flag laws, this, this idea that you know, parents or law enforcement can petition the court to temporarily take weapons away from somebody who poses a danger to themselves or others, they're dead letter if people don't know about them. In the wake of the Highland Park shooting, you know, people in Illinois said, well, why did this kid have a gun? We have a red flag law. Well, the reason is Illinois didn't do any education about their red flag law. Law enforcement, parents, first responders, they didn't know about it. Um, there's one county, DeKalb County, that I actually visited just a week ago, that was responsible for about 60% of all the red flag orders because in DeKalb County, they had actually done the work of educating law enforcement. Well, we provide some funding for states to do some innovation around implementation of red flag laws. Second, the second thing I'll mention is um, on these uh, under 21 buyers, we provide for um, a new process, an enhanced background check um, to just be a little bit more careful before we transfer a weapon to a young person. On that checklist, that the FBI has to do as part of this enhanced background check is a phone call to the local police department. Because again, looking at Highland Park, looking at Uvalde, these were young men who were known to the local police department, but the police department had no idea that that individual was rushing out to buy a gun in the middle of crisis. Now, before that gun is transferred, the FBI has to call the local police department, alert them that this 18-year-old or 19-year-old is going to buy an assault weapon or six assault weapons. And if the local municipality, if the county, if the jurisdiction innovates and provides a process inside the police department to do something with that information, right? Not just sit on it, but actually alert officers that this young man is buying a gun, it can allow for an intervention to take place. Maybe not a legal intervention, but a, a check-in from the police department at the home um, that often can interrupt uh, that act of violence. So we do have the opportunity for some innovation here. Um, we also have the opportunity for investment in innovation and community anti-gun violence initiatives. Last year, for the first time, the federal budget invested in community anti-gun violence initiatives and the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act doubles down by uh, supplying um, a, an additional big chunk of money for anti-gun violence uh, programs at the state uh, and local level. Um, listen, there's a lot of these programs that work. There are a lot of them that don't work. And so the work of the next year and a half is to really um, learn what interventions work, what violence interruptions programs work, which don't work, and then start putting money behind the models that do work. So there's a lot of important innovation that will happen there. I'll stop there. I know you uh, want to have time for a few questions, um, but again, I'm grateful for you uh, including me in today's forum. Thank you so much, Senator. We do have a few questions. The first is, in order for common sense gun reform to make it through the Senate, we're going to need to have some Republicans who vote for it. And the question is, certain senators benefit from and seem to be fearful of lobbying organizations such as the ILA, which is the Institute for Legislative Action, the lobbying arm of the NRA. Is it possible to meaningfully tackle the influence of ILA slash NRA without addressing campaign finance reform? Well, I, I would argue that the power of the NRA has almost nothing to do with their money. Um, so the power of the NRA and the gun lobby is, um, you know, what their endorsement means. What the, 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 over time, the NRA has been able to um, uh, sort of co-opt the conservative movement um, in a way that allows for their endorsement to become the most important stamp of approval for a candidate who's looking to prove themselves as a true conservative, a true government-hating conservative. Um, as the Republican Party is become pretty bereft of any ideas other than the destruction of government. The NRA endorsement matters more than anything else because that's the way that you prove that you hate government. What, what could stand more for your, for the, for your distaste for government um, than the endorsement of an organization that supports the right of the public to engage in armed insurrection against the government. Um, so it's sort of what the endorsement means 
that's important here, not the money behind the NRA. But that is, um, you know, that the importance of that is vanishing over time, um, in part because the NRA endorsement is now um, a liability in many general elections. Um, it wasn't 10 years ago. Now, as you have more and more swing voters, more and more parents and young people who are voting on the issue of guns, there are more and more Republicans who still see the efficacy of the NRA endorsement in their primary, but worry about it in the general election. And so that's why this summer you had 15 Republican senators join us and support this measure, even though the NRA opposed it, even though it compromised their ability to get the NRA endorsement, because now they're sort of equal weight. The power of the anti-gun violence movement is just as significant as the power of the gun violence movement. And I think that 15 number will start to grow as the power imbalance grows, as the anti-gun violence movement starts to become a more menacing force to politicians, even Republican politicians compared with the power of the gun lobby. Okay, next question. What's the role of the ATF in helping to solve this epidemic? Uh, I, I met with the new ATF uh, director, Steve Dettelbach, yesterday. Um, um, really important that we have a leader at that agency. Um, of course, when Republicans are in charge of the Senate, they leave that agency leader list um, for good reason. Um, first and foremost, um, you know, the, the ATF is hamstrung by the law. Um, we have still not removed the, um, uh, the provisions passed by Republican Congresses in the 1990s and, and, and 2000s um, that really tied the hands of the ATF. So, you know, gun records, for instance, can't be computerized. They have to be paper. The ATF can only do inspections of gun shows once a year. Um, they're all, that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's a number of legislative handcuffs on the efficacy of the ATF, but they absolutely can be um, more impactful. Um, in particular, they can be much more aggressive in going after um, individuals who are selling guns online or at gun stores that should be registered as gun dealers, thus doing background checks, but aren't. The ATF can also now have a much bigger impact on interrupting these gun trafficking rings Gun trafficking was not a federal crime. Straw purchasing of firearms was not a federal crime before the passage of the Bipartisan Safety Communities Act. Now it's a federal crime. So the ATF working together with prosecutors and local law enforcement now has the opportunity to be much more vigorous in going after these gun trafficking operations that are buying tons of weapons, you know, in Georgia or South Carolina, online or at gun shows, and then bringing them up to Massachusetts and Connecticut and selling them in the black market. So the ATF has some new tools. All right, we have time for one last question. What is being done to address the regulation of ghost guns? The Biden administration moved forward with um, a um, executive action, a regulation around these ghost guns that will require um, many of the parts that get sold online and then get constructed into a full gun uh, to, to, to be regulated as firearms, meaning they would have to go through a background check. Um, there is some criticism of that regulation that it doesn't go far enough. Um, and that was one of the reasons I was meeting with um, uh, Director Dettelbach yesterday. Um, I think the Biden administration believes there's a limit to what they can do through regulation. Um, and so it is ultimately incumbent on Congress or state legislatures to pass laws um, that make it clear um, if you are buying a gun or the components of a gun, you should still go through a background check. Um, and listen, once again, let's make clear background checks are not onerous. They normally take five minutes if you are an individual without a criminal record. Um, and so some people will say, well, I mean, really, I got to go through a background check if I you know, want to buy um, a, a piece of a gun. Well, you know, it's just not that it's, it's not that big a burden. Um, and given the number of ghost guns that we are seeing right now, right? I mean, you're seeing an explosion of ghost guns. The recoveries of guns in our cities now very quickly went from 0% ghost guns to 30% ghost guns. And that number will probably be 60% within a couple of years. It just requires us to update our laws. So I'm supportive of what the Biden administration is doing. I would maybe argue they should have gone a little bit further. I think Congress and state legislatures need to lead right now. Senator Murphy, thank you so much for being here. 
you were the very first person I reached out to when we were planning this conference. And I hope you keep fighting the good fight and continue to work as hard, diligently, and passionately as you have been. And I look forward to hearing more about what you do in the future. Thank you on behalf of all of us. Thanks for having me. Uh, have a great conference. Thank you. Okay, everyone, thank you for being here. We're going to start with our first panel on June 23rd, 2022. The Supreme Court issued the Bruin decision holding that New York's law requiring a license to carry concealed weapons in public places is unconstitutional. To help guide us in a conversation about Bruin and its implications in Massachusetts and elsewhere, we are truly fortunate to have one of the country's most preeminent Second Amendment scholars serving as moderator, as well as two preeminent lawyers. But I'm going to introduce our moderator, Professor Joseph Blocker, the Lanty L. Smith 67 Professor of Law at Duke Law School, where he also co-directs the Center for Firearms Law. Professor Blocker has published widely on the Second Amendment, including in the law reviews of Yale, Harvard, Stanford, NYU, Virginia, Duke, and Chicago, and in popular media outlets such as the New York Times, the Washington Post, and Slate. Professor Blocker's recent work on the intersection between guns and democracy includes When Guns Threaten the Public Sphere, a new account of public safety regulations under Heller, published in 2021 in the Northwestern University Law Review with Reva B. Siegel. He is also the co-author of the Positive Second Amendment, Rights Regulation and the Future of Heller, a 2018 book written with Daryl A. H. Miller and published by Cambridge University Press. Thank you so much for being here, Professor Blocker. He has another conference. The beauty of Zoom is his other conference today is out of UCLA, I believe. So thank you for being here and thank you for introducing our other esteemed panelists. Thank you so much for that really generous introduction, Lissy, and thanks to you and Abby and everybody else who's been involved in pulling together this uh, this really amazing conference. Uh, I'm honored and happy to be a part of it, and I'm thrilled uh, to have a chance to moderate a discussion today between two lawyers uh, who are exceedingly well positioned to help us understand both what Bruin did and what it means for uh, the constitutionality of gun regulation going forward. Those two lawyers are Timothy Casey and Aaron Murphy. I'm gonna briefly introduce the two of them, um, give a couple sort of framing remarks uh, and then turn it over uh, for what we hope will be a, a free flowing um, discussion. So let me start by introducing and welcoming Aaron Murphy. Uh, Aaron is a partner at Clement and Murphy and by any measure is one of the nation's leading appellate and Supreme Court advocates. She has argued dozens of cases in trial and appellate courts throughout the country, including, I think, in nearly every federal court of appeals by now, and repeatedly uh, at the United States Supreme Court, where she successfully argued, among other cases, M McCutcheon versus FEC, major First Amendment case, uh, represented the U.S. House of Representatives, I think, in um, Texas versus the United States, um, the Wisconsin legislature, I believe, in Gill versus Whitford, the list goes on and on. Erin um, also has a very active pro bono practice, wherein she has represented um, uh, religious organizations and adherents, criminal defendants, asylum applicants, adoptive parents, and more. Um, of most direct relevance to our discussion today, Aaron successfully represented the petitioners in New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus Bruin. So we'll be able to hear directly from somebody who helped shape the litigation and the outcome there. Uh, but she's also um, represented um, uh, petitioners in a, in a range of other Second Amendment issues uh, across the country. So she can have, help us, I think, maybe think more broadly about what Bruin is going to mean uh, going forward. Uh, Aaron clerked for Judge Sykes on the Seventh Circuit and for Chief Justice John Roberts, and also served um, as a Bristow Fellow in the Office of the Attorney General. Thanks for being with us, Aaron. Um, and then we also have with us today Timothy Casey. Uh, Tim works in the Massachusetts 
Attorney General's Office, where he is Chief of the Constitutional and Administrative Law Division. Uh, Tim's division defends state statutes, regulations, policies, and adjudicatory decisions against constitutional and other challenges in court, uh, and that includes defending Massachusetts's gun safety laws against, cons uh, against Second Amendment challenges in state and federal courts. Uh, Tim himself has worked directly on Second Amendment litigation, including his successful defense of Massachusetts's good reason requirement for uh, firearms licensing, which came before uh, the Supreme Court's decision in Bruin, um, and also uh, defense of Massachusetts statutes and regulations that impose safety requirements on handguns before they can be sold um, within the state. Um, in the aftermath of Bruin, uh, Tim has assisted in advising the state legislature on changes to Massachusetts's gun safety laws, uh, specifically its firearm licensing statute, uh, and also has assisted in uh, drafting an advisory from the AG's office to local law enforcement and law licensing authorities about necessary changes in the aftermath of Bruin. Uh, Tim is a graduate of Harvard College and Harvard Law School. Uh, he then clerked for Judge William Young of the U.S. District Court in Massachusetts, uh, was an associate at Ropes and Gray, and then joined the AG's office in 2007. Uh, thanks for being with us, Tim. Um, so our hope is to keep this a very sort of free-flowing and open conversation. We want to leave plenty of time for questions and answers. Um, please just go ahead and pop those into the Q&A throughout our discussion. I will feed them uh, to the panelists. Um, and our goal, I think, overall is to really just give a sense of the constitutional constraints. I think landscape was the phrase that Lissy and the senator used earlier, uh, especially in the aftermath of Bruin and kind of what is available in the policy space um, that would uh, that would be consistent with the Second Amendment as the Supreme Court has uh, has interpreted. So uh, my goal as moderator here is just to sort of situate the conversation and then I'll turn it over to Aaron and then to Tim for some opening remarks and then follow up with some questions for them. Um, but just to amplify a few things we just heard from the Senator, um, I think it is uh, so important, uh, and again, thanks to Lissy for pulling this together, to have this conversation now uh, in the midst of what I think are some of the most significant developments that at least I've seen in gun rights and regulation uh, in recent memory. Uh, the past few months, of course, we've seen some incredibly prominent, traumatic, horrific mass shootings in places like Uvalde and Buffalo. Um, according to the most recent release of CDC data, we've seen the highest number of gun deaths since the CDC started tracking that. We've also seen a big spike since 2020 in gun ownership, especially among first time buyers and apparently a more diverse set of gun owners than in the past. Um, we saw, as the Senator said, the first major federal gun legislation in nearly 30 years uh, in the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act. And in the midst of all of that, in fact, just a few days before that legislation passed, we got the first big Second Amendment case from the Supreme Court in nearly a decade. Um, and our goal here, I think, is mostly to try to unpack uh, unpack that. So I just want to give two quick thumbnails of what I see at least as the sort of important substantive, I'll call it substantive holding of Bruin, and then the methodological holding, uh, and then turn it over to Aaron and Tim for uh, for their thoughts. So on the substantive holding, you know, what is it that the court did? What did it strike down? Um, uh, uh, what the court did just narrowly, I guess, was strike down a New York law which required a person to show proper cause in order to get a license to carry a concealed handgun in public. Now, proper cause had been interpreted by the New York courts essentially to mean something like a heightened need for self-defense above and beyond that of the average person. You can't just say, I want a gun and I feel unsafe. You have to be able to show something more than that. This is a good example of what's often called or was called, often called a may issue uh, regime, meaning that there's some discretion in the licensing authority about whether the license will be given. Massachusetts's law often put in that same category, California, New Jersey, depending on how you count it, Delaware, Hawaii, and a few others. Um, all were may issue, may issue jurisdictions prior to Bruin. Those can be contrasted with what are often called shall issue jurisdictions, where the criterion for getting a license are more objective, right? If you satisfy the age requirement, training, you don't have a disqualifying conviction, or et cetera, then the licensing official shall issue your, um, your public carry license. By the time Bruin was argued, about 20 states had those, and then about another 20 had what were called permitless, or sometimes constitutional carry, which is basically what it sounds like, 
effectively without a permit you can publicly carry. So that's where the sort of snapshot of state law was um, when Bruin was decided. But that was a big change from how things looked even as late as the 1980s when there was one permitless jurisdiction, that was Vermont, um, and most states had some version of May issue. If you go back even farther, things maybe arguably look different. Aaron and Tim can help us unpack it. But what Bruin did was strike down the May issue regimes like, uh, uh, like New York's. And that meant, you know, immediate impact on the people living in those half dozen states, which is about 85 million people. It's about a quarter of the American population. So that substantive holding, really important. But I think the bigger news uh, going forward is the methodological holding. That is, the court announced a new test for how we're going to evaluate the constitutionality of gun laws going forward. You heard the senator, I think, mention this a little bit, but just to unpack it some, when Bruin was argued, the federal courts of appeal had sort of, I think to, I think the word that Bruin used was coalesced, coalesced around what was called a two-part framework for evaluating the constitutionality of gun laws. And in the first part of that framework, courts would ask, does this challenge in any way fall within the scope of the Second Amendment? Because according to the Supreme Court in Heller, there are some people and activities and places that just don't fall within the scope of the amendment at all, sort of in the same way that libel or securities fraud might involve speech, but they don't count as speech for purposes of the First Amendment. So felons, the mentally ill, sensitive places, dangerous and unusual weapons, they, they were interpreted by many courts to just not even raise a Second Amendment question. And a lot of cases, especially the felon in possession uh, cases, just failed at this step one. They don't even trigger Second Amendment scrutiny. So that's step one of the two-part framework. Part two, for those uh, cases that did make it through that threshold, courts would proceed to apply some level of scrutiny. Now, this is where things get a little harder to summarize because the level of scrutiny varied from court to court and case to case. Um, generally, it seemed to be stricter when the law came closer to um, uh, interfering with a person's ability to have a gun in the home for self-defense. That would get a heightened form of scrutiny. But in general, courts were applying or said they were applying something like intermediate scrutiny. A lot of gun rights advocates said they're not even doing that. This was actually more like rational basis. They're bending over backwards to defer to the government, treating the Second Amendment as a second class right or a constitutional orphan, as Justice Thomas memorably put it uh, in a dissent from denial of cert. Uh, and that, I think, uh, maybe gave wind to the sales of an alternative test, which was the test grounded solely in text history and tradition. Some lower court uh, judges and dissents had endorsed this test, and in Bruin, the majority adopted it. Uh, in a six-justice majority, Justice Thomas ruled that the two-part test has one part too many, uh, that really it comes down to one thing, which is that if a challenge is, well, it still sounds to me like two things. We can talk about that. If a challenge falls within the plain text of the Second Amendment, then, and I'm quoting here, the government must demonstrate that the regulation is consistent with this nation's historical tradition of firearm regulation. Only if a firearm regulation is consistent with this nation's historical tradition may a court conclude that the individual's conduct falls outside the Second Amendment's unqualified command. So it would seem, at least at first cut, that evidence of a law's contemporary effectiveness doesn't at least directly factor into this analysis. It at least sounds like it's gonna be purely historical. Now there's a lot to say about this. Fortunately, we have more than an hour left to do that in. Um, I wanna stop talking now and turn things over to Aaron first um, for your thoughts on, on Bruin um, and then to you, Tim, uh, and then I'll follow up with some questions. Again, any of you listening, feel free to put your questions in the Q&A box whenever you'd like. Aaron. Great, well, thank you, um, Joseph, for, for the introduction and for the great kind of, Introduction to to Bruin and and all that it did, which I think was an, an excellent, very helpful summary to kind of set the stage for where we are at this point. Yeah, as as Joseph said, I mean, I, I think as, as somebody who was very involved in the Bruin case, and I've really been litigating this issue for probably about a decade. The the question of whether there's a right to carry outside the home. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to by any means kind of undervalue the actual holding of Bruin and, and the decision that the court made that there is a right to carry outside the home, as we'll talk about, you know, whether the, the, the limitations on that right and where it can be exercised and all of that are, are issues that I'm sure will be subject to a great deal of litigation in years to come. Um, but, you know, there was quite a, deal, quite a great deal of litigation over the past decade about that core question in Bruin of whether there 
there's a right to carry outside the home and really more broadly, um, you know, many courts had sort of taken the view that the Second Amendment is was largely a homebound right, and that kind of any time anything was happening outside the home, um, that that you were outside kind of what was viewed as the core of the Second Amendment right, and that laws that ha imposed any kind of restrictions outside the home were sort of presumptively less likely to implicate the Second Amendment. So, um, so the substance of holding a Bruin is is extremely important for purposes of thinking about how we understand the scope of the Second Amendment right. Uh, but I do think what, you know, what ultimately really is sort of the game changer in Second Amendment litigation, and, and frankly, you know, there's lots of discussions to have about how much is the game changer in, in all sorts of other areas of constitutional litigation in, in which I'm involved, but is the court's holding about methodology um, and that shift toward a you know a, an originalism type methodology that's very focused on historical tradition and whether laws are consistent with historical tradition, and, and I just want to kind of underscore what Joseph was saying in terms of the impact of that on Second Amendment litigation. Um, yes, there were certainly you know some challenges, probably largely in the context of criminal laws raised by criminal defendants that would get resolved at step one of the old two step inquiry. But by and large, the, the more that the challenges that can, arose in the civil context, challenges to laws like New York's um, proper cause law or other states' reasonable cause laws, all these may issue laws, challenges to, as we'll talk in a bit more detail about things like the types of arms that are covered by the Second Amendment, whether you can have restrictions on, um, on magazine capacity, laws that have to deal with you know, commercial transactions and what kind of restrictions can be imposed at the point of sale. Most of that got resolved at the second step of the two-step analysis. And, and indeed, most of the courts, the way they would look at these cases, particularly when it came to things like a right to carry outside the home or a right to possess certain types of arms, is that they would assume without deciding at the first stage of the analysis that the conduct in question was protected by the Second Amendment. So they'd really kind of largely forego any need to discuss the history and the historical understanding of the amendment by just saying, well, we'll grant you that, we'll assume that, that there is a Second Amendment right, we'll grant that to the challengers, but nonetheless, we're going to go on and hold that the law can, that the government can uh, impose this law under the second step of the two-step analysis. And a big component of that was a fair degree of deference to the government. Um, at, at that second step, the way courts were looking at it was a little more focused on, you know, does this law further a government interest? Does it further it in, you know, some at least somewhat or marginally tailored way? But largely courts were looking at kind of has the government made a reasonable argument that this law would advance public safety? Um, and and by and large, you know that would that would go the government's way in a lot of cases because if you think about the question at that level of generality, I mean, you know, most gun laws aren't like pure like wholly irrational. Um, they they are passed for you know some there's a, there's lots of debate to have about whether they really accomplish their ends. But if the court is saying we're not really interested in resolving the debate, we just want to know if like somebody reasonable might think this law could achieve some public safety end, the government's going to win. Um, so that's how you know, many issues, uh, many challenges, affirmative challenges to laws that were passed that impose restrictions on the exercise of the right to care, keep and bear arms were resolved over the past decade and, and you know, most of them failed. Um, you would have, a, there, were, uh, there, there was lots of disagreement about this. Many of these decisions produced dissenting opinions but mo many of the dissenting opinions, as Joseph alluded to, were focused on the methodology and saying, you're only getting to this result because you're not subjecting these kinds of laws to the same serious scrutiny that you would subject laws to if they were imposing, say, restrictions on the right to free speech or other constitutional rights. And a growing body really beginning back with an opinion written by then Judge Kavanaugh um, back around uh, you know, just a few years after Heller, there was a growing body of, of, of decisions in the dissenting or concurring capacity from lower court judges saying, look, we read Heller as saying that at least in this context of the Second Amendment, you know, the, the focus should be on the historical understanding of the Second Amendment and the historical tradition surrounding 
what the people who ratified the Second Amendment understood the right that they were ratifying to, um, to encompass and to protect and to guarantee. And, and that really has been, you know, just a, a huge part of the discussion in pretty much any case out there. Um, and we have made the argument in many cases over the past decade of if you take this seriously and you really focus on the historical tradition, this is an easy case and, you know, and, and we clearly prevail. And more often than not, rather than take that argument on, lower courts said, yeah, well, you might be right, but we're, we're not going to apply that methodology. We're going to go on to a second step. So by virtue of the court deciding here to have an analysis that's focused more on historical tradition, uh, you know, it, it really does reopen a, a huge number of the issues that have been litigated over the past decade. Yes, as you know, there's going to be some types of challenges, things like felon in possession and such that um, are things that, you know, from the, from the get-go in Heller, the court made clear it considers to be consistent with the historical tradition of the Second Amendment, but um, but there's just a whole slew of laws and laws that lower courts have upheld and upheld under tests that really were are, are, that the Supreme Court has now made clear are no longer the tests that can be applied in this context. And indeed, as we'll talk a little bit more about, you know, there's some specific cases even that were pending before the Supreme Court while Bruin was up there that have now been vacated and sent back down. So it, it really is a complete game changer for at least for kind of civil litigation that's affirmative litigation brought by um, gun rights advocate groups and gun rights advocates that are challenging restrictions that are coming from you know, states that have been more restrictive and tried to pass more laws in, in this area. Uh, so, it, 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 and, and there's, you know, while, while we've been litigating a lot of these questions focused on history and tradition, since that wasn't the test in the lower courts, you know, there's a lot of room for courts to start figuring out exactly what that test means. I mean, we, we certainly got plenty of guidance on that in the Bruin decision. The court talked about how, you know, it, it laid down what I think of as a few really important principles here. First, the court said, I mean, I, I can't barely count how many times the court said that it is the government's burden to prove that a law is consistent with historical tradition. Um, that is itself an extremely that that notion of whose burden it is matters quite a bit here because, you know, one of the big critiques of the analysis that was being applied in a pre-Bruin world is that it was sort of the government's burden in name only and courts really didn't take that seriously. And I think that it's not an accident that the Bruin case went out of its way to say repeatedly that the government must affirmatively prove that laws are consistent with the historical tradition of our country. Um, the, 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 but, but, you know, where a lot of the rubber is going to meet the road under a Bruin analogy test is Bruin talks about how we look at history and tradition and we have to kind of understand history and tradition in terms of if, if a particular law could have been passed and wasn't passed for hundreds of years, that's sort of the easy case. But the court also acknowledged that not every case is going to fit into that pattern and that there are some types of laws that just because of say changing technology or concerns that just didn't exist historically, but do today, um, that there's just some types of laws as to which history is not going to speak as directly because there just might not have been the particular type of law or the opportunity to pass the particular type of law 100, 150, 200 years ago. Um, so when you're in sort of that bucket of having to deal with situations that involve kind of, changes in technology or changes in the types of concerns, you know, what the court, the court called unprecedented social concerns or dramatic technological changes, uh, then the court articulated a test that focuses more on analogizing to historical uh, laws that existed historically. And, and I think that's going to be a huge area of litigation um, you know, going forward. We, we've already started to do some supplemental briefing and various challenges that have been brought to some new laws in the wake of Bruin. And you know, I think that's that's there are some cases where it is, at least to my mind, pretty straightforward that a certain type of law could have existed and didn't exist. Um, and that should really be the end of the analysis, but there are also certainly going to be some instances and certainly going to be lots of cases where there's a debate about whether, you know, who, who's, who's right about that and a debate about, you know, is history really able to be completely informative? Um, 
And so there, you know, then, then you get into a whole second level of debate about, okay, well, how close of an analogy do you have to have? How are we going to determine which laws are the types of laws that support a historical tradition in the kind of affirmative burden of proof way that the government, that the court had in mind for the government to prove? Um, and, and I think, you know, there's, there's definitely, Bruin gives some thoughts about that, but it's, it's something that's going to be, have to, have to be fleshed out quite a bit. But, but I think probably, you know, one of the guiding principles that the court offered in thinking about how to do the reasoning by analogy in the cases where that's warranted is that you have to look at both kind of how a law burdens Second Amendment rights and why a law burdens Second Amendment rights. And, and you want to look for laws that are similar in both the how and the why. Um, and I think the how also to me probably encompasses like the degree of the burden um, and thinking about, you know, whether something today is analogous to the type of burden you would have had in the past. And I'll just throw something out there just to, to give a concrete illustration of this because I think it's all a little abstract. And I'm just throwing this out there as, as a way that I think is helpful to think about it, whether, you know, whatever you may think the right answer is in, in this hypothetical. But say you're thinking about something like background checks. Um, background checks for firearms and uh, have been around about you know about a century and background checks for a while have had a component of some degree of waiting period that historically was justified on the reasoning of it takes a little bit of time to do a background check um, and so you know if you, you want to just kind of assume for the moment that that's permissible a permissible restriction on second amendment rights I think a lot that where you'd start thinking about what's different in terms of the how and why is over time, um, some states, California in particular, has imposed a much longer waiting period that it hasn't justified as necessary because you need that long to do the background check, but instead justified on the reasoning of we want to have a waiting period as a so-called cooling off period. Um, we want people to have to wait just because we don't want them to have access to a firearm as quickly. To me, that's that's a nice concrete illustration of taking something that, you know, at a high level of generality, you'd say, oh, well, there's been waiting periods. But if you're taking Bruin seriously and thinking about the how and the why, the why is quite different when you're saying there's going to be a couple of days waiting period because we need to conduct a background check versus we're going to impose a waiting period just kind of to, to make it take longer for you to get access to a firearm out of, you know, out of, I'm sure I would say out of safety concerns. Uh, this is something Bruin actually flagged in the opinion as kind of its own example of something like background checks and waiting periods, you know, maybe generally permissible, but that doesn't mean there may not be as applied instances where we're concerned about the length of the wait or the cost of getting a of paying for the background check or whatever it may be. So I, that's, you know, th those are the kind of tools that I think we're going to be using going forward in trying to uh, take this this new methodology and apply it in contexts where we're dealing with different types of laws and what you know I think many states would would admit are novel efforts to regulate in ways that weren't done before, which of course is always going to be a challenge under for for states to defend under a test that's focused on historical tradition. Um, so I will stop there uh, and uh, and and let let Timothy jump in. Thanks so much, Aaron. That was fantastic. And I want to just put a pin in or two pins in the how and the why principles that Aaron surfaced there. I think that, you know, the Bruin majority uses some version of the word analogize, I think 30 or more times. Like, I think that analogy really is going to be that analogizing is going to be central to the cases going forward. And we can certainly unpack it a lot more. But um, first, let me turn things over to Tim. Um, and again, invite, I see some questions already coming in to the Q&A, but invite anybody in the audience to go ahead and send your questions in now. Thank you, Professor Bloker, and it's a pleasure to be with you and uh, with you, Aaron. Uh, I want to thank the Rappaport Center and Lizzie and her team for uh, inviting us and uh, for putting together this really important and timely uh, conference and panel discussion. Um, so um, there's no question that uh, Bruin makes the job of state governments harder uh, when it comes to keeping people safe through uh, gun safety laws. Uh, and in a state like Massachusetts, where uh, we pride ourselves on having uh, both some of the most robust uh, gun safety regulations 
uh, in the country and also the lowest rates uh, of uh, gun safety, sorry, gun related violence and death uh, in the country year in, year out. Um, and where we don't think that's um, a coincidence that those two things go hand in hand. Um, uh, we acknowledge that uh, our job of defending uh, our gun safety laws just uh, got harder after Bruin. Um, and uh, one thing that Erin mentioned at the end of her presentation is Bruin also um, arguably hamstrings uh, state and local governments in their ability to come up with novel solutions to um, unprecedented new unique uh, problems posed uh, by gun violence. Uh, so uh, it, it's going to be hard uh, for governments and uh, but uh, we are committed to defending our gun safety laws. Um, we uh, don't have the luxury of uh, complaining about uh, everything that we disagree with respectfully about Bruin. Um, we will uh, uh, apply and defend our laws under uh, the tests announced in Bruin. And uh, uh, I will say that um, uh, a, a lot of uh, what we have done over the past 10 years between, uh, 10 or more years between Heller and Bruin um, is uh, in some ways not that dissimilar um, from what we will be doing post Bruin. Um, it was uh, commonplace for us in litigation defending our gun safety laws to start with um, an analysis of how the particular gun safety regulation in question uh, relates or compares to a historical tradition. And um, uh, I think at this point, uh, this is a point where I would sort of respectfully disagree with Aaron about um, uh, court's treatment of history uh, under the two-part framework uh, that postdated Heller and predated Bruin. Um, it is true that uh, courts uh, often, uh, although not always, um, uh, gave sort of shorter treatment to the historical record than they did to the second part of the framework, which uh, involved applying either intermediate or strict scrutiny. But um, there are exceptions. For example, um, the Ninth Circuit's en banc decision in Young against Hawaii was uh, an exhaustive uh, historical treatment um, of uh, uh, proper cause laws like Hawaii's and uh, like New York's and Massachusetts. So uh, uh, courts did engage with the history, but I but I think that that was perhaps a recognition of the fact that judges and lawyers are not historians. And uh, there is great peril in pretending that we are uh, in engaging in historical analysis, especially where uh, the historical record is often indeterminate. Um, and, uh, but in contrast, what courts uh, are quite comfortable doing, uh, what they're used to doing uh, in constitutional cases is balancing uh, the imposition upon uh, private rights and interests against uh, the governmental interest uh, in the, involved or justifying the regulation in the first place. So um, it's not a surprise to me that uh, courts often um, uh, ultimately ended up focusing on the second step of the two-part framework uh, after Heller that uh, all courts essentially coalesced around. Um, and it, uh, also doesn't surprise me that to critics of that test, it looked like a very deferential test for the government. Um, I think a big part of uh, uh, the reason for that is because uh, uh, under intermediate or strict scrutiny, um, uh, courts look at the, uh, the nature of the governmental interest. And it is pretty hard to uh, dispute that uh, the government's interest in both uh, public safety, crime prevention, uh, reducing violence and death uh, uh, on in, in public uh, areas is not only uh, important, but compelling. Uh, so uh, cases that involved intermediate scrutiny often involve not really an assessment of the, the nature of the governmental interest, but really the fit between um, the, the governmental interest and the way in which uh, the government attempted to further that interest. And uh, at least under intermediate scrutiny, that uh, involves some measure of deference to the predictive judgments of our elected officials. Um, 
So uh, I'm sure to the Supreme Court and uh, to critics of that framework, it looked like uh, kind of a blank check uh, to state and local governments to uh, regulate uh, 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 the right to keep and bear arms. Um, but um, so now we have a test that uh, uh, sort of formally uh, eschews that um, part uh, of the framework. Um, uh, it uh, there is a, a step zero, uh, if you will, uh, of the new framework uh, that talks about whether um, the uh, regulation in question uh, falls within the plain text of the Second Amendment. While I don't expect that that will come into play in uh, every Second Amendment case, or maybe even most, um, that will be um, a place where courts will pause uh, in some cases and where states will will focus in some cases uh, if an argument uh, can be made that uh, the regulation in question does not in fact uh, burden meaningfully the right to keep and bear arms. Uh, but uh, in terms of history, um, uh, as I mentioned, this is something that um, uh, states and uh, other governments uh, uh, looked to and briefed uh, prior to Bruin. Uh, it will obviously now become a focus uh, in all of our cases, but uh, I, I still think there is room for states to make arguments about uh, the importance of the government's interest that I, I think is essentially uh, made clear in Bruin when it mentions the two uh, metrics, uh, at least that the court identified for whether um, a regulation is relevantly similar to uh, our historical tradition of firearms regulation, which um, are, are as, as noted, both um, the how and the why, the, the nature of the burden imposed on the right to keep and bear arms and the government's justification for that burden. Um, certainly with respect to the government's justification for imposing the burden, uh, I expect governments will continue to make use of the same kind of arguments and evidence um, that they have always uh, about how uh, many of the weapons being regulated um, are incredibly deadly um, in the wrong hands. Um, they can uh, inflict tremendous amounts of violence and death. And um, so the kinds of arguments that states used to make in service of defending a law under intermediate scrutiny, I think will continue to be made. Um, they will just be made in a different way as identifying the governmental interest, justifying the current regulation as a comparator against uh, the government justification for historical uh, laws, insofar as that can be uh, determined. Uh, but it, uh, there's no question that this will be difficult for states. And um, I, I agree with Aaron that uh, the decision seems uh, sort of designed to make it much harder for governments to justify their gun safety laws. Um, uh, repeatedly talking about the government's burden and how courts need uh, courts can rely on the presentation as part of an adversarial uh, proceeding uh, on the body of evidence that's provided by uh, the government as defendant. So um, uh, it will be incumbent upon governments to uh, try to identify uh, analogs uh, from 1791 or 1868. Uh, it's a little unclear uh, uh, which is the relevant uh, data. It seem, the court seemed to say it need not uh, resolve that question, although it seemed to put its thumb on the scale of 1791. Um, uh, so we're going to have this very um, bizarre exercise uh, in uh, making arguments about whether state assault weapons bans or uh, ghost gun restrictions or uh, sensitive places uh, regulations uh, bear some resemblance to laws from uh, 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 the late 1700s or the 1800s. Um, uh, that is, um, you know, leaves much less room for uh, governments to argue about uh, the, the, the modern day importance of uh, gun safety regulations and uh, the particular modern problems uh, caused in our era of uh, uh, tragic gun violence, mass shootings, 
um, the kind of uniquely modern, sadly, uh, threat uh, that modern weapons pose to uh, society. Um, governments will be more limited in their ability to uh, make arguments in those in, on those points, but we will continue to make them. Uh, I think even the Bruin test leaves some room uh, to make those arguments. Um, we will, uh, and as I said, we will defend our laws vigorously. We will uh, retain experts where we need to. Um, we will um, uh, comb the historical record. Uh, we will uh, do our very best to identify analogs. And um, I, I also um, make, the, make the point for whatever it's worth that um, judges have to live in this world too. And it's this world, not the world of 1791 or 1868. Um, they have to send their kids to school um, uh, worried about mass shooters. Uh, and so, um, yes, they will be applying this test, which uh, feels um, uh, arid and divorced from our um, modern problem of gun violence, but um, uh, uh, they will be doing it after states, I expect, make arguments about why it remains important today uh, to engage in vigorous regulation uh, of firearms. Uh, given, um, I, I think, the growing threat that modern weapons pose uh, to society. So uh, our job is harder, uh, but um, we don't have the luxury of complaining. We're, we're going to vigorously defend our laws, and um, uh, there's no question there will be a lot of litigation. I, I agree with Aaron that it um, uh, a lot of what uh, the, the litigation that has happened uh, over the last 10 plus years, we're essentially starting from square one. Uh, some things that were settled uh, are now unsettled um, and things that were litigated will be relitigated. Um, and uh, we'll all um, digest the decisions and uh, make use of them and deploy them as best we can. Um, I, I, one last point, um, uh, there is also the the question of what use to make of the presumptively lawful exceptions to the Second Amendment uh, that the Supreme Court identified first in Heller and re-endorsed uh, through Justice Kavanaugh and the Chief Justice's concurring opinion in Bruin. Um, uh, I suppose, uh, although I'm interested in others' views, that those sort of fall within a uh, category of because they are uh, they have a historical pedigree. Um, uh, they would be kind of uh, fall within uh, uh, the category of things that survive uh, the, the historical inquiry presumptively. But um, uh, I think you'll see a lot of arguments and I think you'll see, whereas courts again, uh, may have acknowledged the history and then moved on to intermediate scrutiny under the old framework, um, arguments about whether um, a regulation is a uh, restriction or regulation on the commercial sale of arms, just to give an example, something that was identified in Heller as presumptively lawful. Um, uh, I think you'll see uh, more arguments made about those kinds of uh, presumptively lawful regulations and whereas courts might have um, assumed without deciding uh, in the past that um, uh, it, uh, the, the regulation in question did burden Second Amendment rights and so proceeded to intermediate or strict scrutiny. Um, just as I would say, uh, most courts assumed without deciding that there was a right to keep and carry outside the home, um, not just inside the home. Uh, uh, I, I think courts will give closer attention to those uh, exceptions identified by the Supreme Court in Heller and in Bruin. Um, and uh, you may have more case law develop over what constitutes a uh, 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 restriction on the commercial sale of arms or those other exceptions identified uh, in those uh, Supreme Court cases. So um, uh, it'll be very interesting. We're at the very beginning um, and um, uh, no question, uh, the landscape has gotten much more inhospitable to states that uh, believe deeply in uh, the power of their gun safety laws to make um, things safer for their citizens, but um, we're going to continue to defend those laws um, uh, under Bruin. 
Uh, thanks so much, Tim uh, and Aaron both. That was a fantastic overview of a lot of the, I think, big issues that um, uh, all of us trying to figure out this case are confronting. Um, I'm seeing we're also already getting some uh, questions in the Q&A about things like high capacity magazines and assault weapons and um, risk protection orders, also known as red flag laws. I want to work my way around to those, but maybe start with some more sort of broad questions about the methodology, because I think you've both in your comments raised some some maybe interesting points of convergence and and divergence uh, as I hear it. Um, uh, and Aaron, maybe I'll start with you just to um, uh, get your thoughts on where Tim ended there. Uh, and maybe I should have said something about this in my thumbnail about the case. I mean, one of the things that's interesting about Bruin is although there is a six justice majority, this is not cobbled together, all the six justices joined the majority opinion. You also have concurring opinions by four of the justices who were also in the majority, um, Justice Barrett, um, uh, Justice Alito, and then Justice Kavanaugh joined by uh, the Chief Justice. And of those, just, just Justice Alito and Justice Kavanaugh, at least as I read them, seem to be sending out some signals about, look, we're still preserved. This is still Heller. Heller's still good law. Kavanaugh, uh, in his opinion, actually like cuts and pastes that paragraph from page six, pages 626 and 627 of Heller, reproducing the felon in possession, mentally ill, et cetera, language, which had been the centerpiece really of the Heller to Bruin case law. Um, I wonder what you make of that. I mean, on the one hand, the majority, it feels to me, pointedly doesn't reproduce that language, although Justice Thomas had joined Heller, um, which, you know, where that language first appeared. Um, I have seen at least some lower courts already, especially in felon cases, essentially citing it still as if it is good law. Um, what's the status, do you think, of the of the the Heller, I'll call them carve outs or presumptively lawful? What's their status, do you think, after Bruin? So I, I, I think the right way to think about it, I think this is how the majority was thinking about it, and I, I, I have no reason to think it's not how the concurring justices were thinking about it, is that those are just an application of the Bruin test. Um, and that, you know, the, the court was identifying in Heller that there are types of laws that are that historically have been consistent with the Second Amendment. And, and it was speaking in a broad brush. I, I think, you know, one of the mistakes I think lower courts have made is to take things like the phrase, you know, regulation of the commercial sale of firearms to mean that there's like blanket immunity, full, st you know, if, 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 it's, if it's a regulation of commercial sale, that's the end of the analysis. It's outside the scope of the amendment. I don't think that's ever what Heller meant. Um, and I don't think it's what the concurring justices mean here. I think what they, what, what all of the opinions from Heller to McDonald, where this was reproduced, and to Bruin, have meant is, you know, as a general matter, the fact that there's a Second Amendment doesn't mean you can't regulate the commercial sale of firearms. But as the majority opinion, which everybody joined, including Justices Kavanaugh and Alito and the Chief Justice, who were all in concurring opinions as well, you know, what the majority said is you, you still have to look at those laws and determine things like does the restriction in place you know, impose too high of a fee such that it makes it cost prohibitive to obtain a firearm or so long of a waiting period that people can't get the firearm when they need it, things like that. So the court was making clear um, in Bruin, this has been an issue that's been litigated a lot because there, are, there have been states that have made the argument of, you know, Heller said that there were some categories and those categories are just immune, immune from any analysis of whether they comply with the constitution. Heller has declared that end of story. I mean, which doesn't even make sense because the, the language in Heller was that they were presumptively constitutional measures. So Heller itself contemplated that we're dealing with an area where there may be, you know, presumptively the government can pass laws, but that doesn't mean that that's the end of the analysis. So if you put all of that together, I do think what the court is, is I, I don't think there's any real tension between the majority and concurring opinions here. I think the point is, you know, that's those are examples and the work will have to be done as it's already been done. I mean, I agree with Timothy that it's been done in some of these cases along the way to talk about why um, those some, you know, those those categories generally may be consistent with historical regulation. Um, and that, you know, if, if you're coming in and saying like this burden, you know, this violates the Second Amendment solely because like I have a right to purchase and this regulates the right to purchase, end of story, you know, you're going to lose. Um, you're going to have to make a stronger challenge than that about, well, yes, it may be that you could always regulate 
sellers, but you know, this one goes too far or that you could always impose restrictions on you know, some type of regulation on purchasing, but this is categorically different. It's a burden that's different for the how and the why. I, you know, we, we've been arguing all along that those types of what you'd almost think of as sort of, you know, it's not exactly an as applied challenge in the sense of necessarily saying this law is unconstitutional only as applied to me, but, but as applied in the sense of kind of, look, this is a law that while generally you may be in an area where the state consistently with historical tradition has some more regulatory, um, some more, you know, a little bit more room to operate that that doesn't mean you don't still have to do the historical tradition analysis and that doesn't mean that someone can't come in and demonstrate hey you know it may be the case that there are that that that, that felon in possession laws are presumptively constitutional but it's another thing when you get to misdemeanors or it may be the case that you can have commercial restrictions but this commercial restriction bears absolutely no resemblance to anything that has ever been done by a state before, even though it's been the kind of thing that was on the table forever. So I think those arguments um, are, are, you know, I, 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 I think, I mean, Justice Thomas, who authored Bruin, is probably the most attuned of any justice up there to what has been going on in lower courts because he's been writing concur, uh, dissents from dis denial and opinions about lots of these issues for the past decade. And so, you know, I, I suspect part of why the categories aren't rearticulated is to make clear not that there's reason to doubt, you know, that that what Heller said there was true, but that there the, the court has never intended to declare certain things to be just completely Second Amendment free zones. And instead, it's just that the court recognized from the outset that as, as Bruin says, you know, historical tradition is not a regulatory straitjacket, and there are some types of regulation that are going to be consistent with historical tradition and, and have existed for quite some time. So, Tim, let me flip that back to you, because um, what, what Aaron just said there, and also in her opening remarks, I think sort of raises this sort of questions about, like, what's the shape we should expect from Second Amendment case outcomes, like not just whether they prevail or not, but like how they prevail or not. And, you know, there are as for any other constitutional claim, like there's a lot of ways to lose a constitutional claim. It can be like, you said you have a free speech, but the thing you're asserting is an expression. You just don't get to make a free speech claim at all. Like you wanted to raise an equal protection claim, but you didn't show discrimination. So you just don't even get the machinery up and running. Like you can lose at the threshold or you can go on to scrutiny and lose at some sort of stage of scrutiny. And as Aaron mentioned in the sort of pre-Bruin world, a lot of cases, if you hold aside the felon prohibitor, you know, cases, would assume coverage and then go on and then strike down it, you know, and then uphold the law rather at step two. I assume that's probably true of the cases that, of the Massachusetts cases, at least, that you were involved with. Um, do you expect now that more of these cases are going to be resolved at what you, I think you were calling the step zero, that we're going to see more bright line, you're in or you're out? Um, and maybe because courts, I think, are not going to be inclined to strike down every gun law, they might actually be resolving more cases as this is totally outside the scope of the Second Amendment. We're not even going to assume coverage. I think you're likely to see more arguments by states um, and more robust arguments about um, step zero, which I, I think of as both the, the, the textual argument and um, I take Aaron's point that she views these exceptions as sort of part of the the one step of the the Bruin test, but um, uh, I I expect you'll see states to say to make arguments where where they can be made that uh, it falls outside the text of the Second Amendment. It is a then it is a species of these uh, exceptions that the court has uh, recognized as presumptively lawful, and then uh, that uh the the regulation is also consistent with the historical tradition of firearms regulation so i think um uh while i i think that the two-step framework that predated bruin um was uh, worked very well as evidenced by the fact that every circuit court in the country uh adopted it um it probably did have the effect of um, stunting the development of the law around these exceptions and uh, uh, what the text of the amendment means because it was uh, courts assumed a lot without deciding and went right to uh, intermediate or strict scrutiny. So I do think um, uh, 
I do think you're likely to see certainly states making more arguments uh, beyond the historical uh, tradition argument. And uh, you might see some court cases uh, that grapple with those issues more than they have in the past. I, I you know, I can understand uh, lower courts natural reluctance and I think that informed states reluctance uh, to draw attention to particular decisions by resolving it on sort of categorical grounds when you could instead resolve it by applying intermediate scrutiny. Uh, but I think because uh, there is now this very difficult, onerous historical uh, test that I think often is going to yield indeterminate results. Um, uh, I mean, one thing that uh, I think is quite discouraging uh, about Bruin, there are lots of things that are discouraging about Bruin, but uh, first, this, this characterization of these, um, these good cause laws as being outlier laws, even though the uh, the fact is that they were adopted by states that represent 25% of the nation's population and most of its most populous cities. Um, uh, so it didn't, and these states uh, and these laws had a reasonably good historical pedigree. Uh, most of them were over a century old uh, and they had ancestors that uh, sometimes went back to the founding. So, um, and you know, um, I, I know Aaron and I will disagree on this, but I, I felt like the historical analysis that was undertaken in Bruin involved a lot of cherry picking. Um, this is not a relevant analog because it's from a territory. This one is too old. This one is too new. Um, so um, uh, it's deeply concerning how the historical analysis is going to be employed, at least at the Supreme Court level. I think it is intended to uh, not only make it harder for states uh, to defend their laws, but to strike down uh, more gun safety laws. So, um, uh, but I, I think as a result of that, you're going to see more arguments about uh, step zero of the framework, if we can call it that, and court more willingness by lower courts to engage uh, in that part of the analysis. So Aaron, uh, Tim, Tim phrased that very gently. Let me cut, let me, um... I think quote from something that Senator Murphy said in his opening remarks, I think along the same lines. Um, and and I, I think I got this quote right. I try to try to jot it down that, that Bruin is potentially a blank check for politicians masquerading as judges to impose their preferences, that this historical test, in other words, invites um, a, the, you know, the kind of discretion and judicial intuitionism that the court said it was trying to get rid of by adopting the test. Um, uh, what, what, what do you think? I think it's precisely the opposite. I mean, the, the, the defense you just heard of the, the, the other test is the idea that courts are comfortable balancing what they believe to be the strength of the government's interest versus the strength of the interest in exercising a constitutional right. What in the world expertise do, do courts have in that? That is a policy judgment. That is a legislative judgment. That is a judgment by the people to make in deciding what rights we want to be in our constitution. Those are extremely important questions, and they are extremely important debates to have about you know, when we think the government's interests overrides the interest of individual rights, we have a constitution that enshrines individual rights to make precisely because we want it to be very hard for the government to act when it's acting in the realm of individual rights. But, you know, the notion that this is, this is the criticism that the majority has of the test that was being employed in the lower courts that who are unelected judges to be making determinations about which interests they think are stronger or not, particularly in a context when you know, the people already made a choice and drew a balance and whether people like it or not, you know, that's a whole debate to have about what people think about should we have a second amendment or not, but, but we do. Um, and, and so the court said, look, we're trying very hard, and I think this is really a, a much broader dialogue the court is having, not just in the context of the Second Amendment, but you know, to have something that's objective, something that, that courts can do that says why you know, nine of us are, are, are the right people to make a call here, as opposed to the famous sign from Justice Scalia saying, you know, you could pick like nine people out of the phone book and ask them whether they think the government's interest is stronger than the, the people's interest. It's, it's just that is inherently an indeterminate question. 
Whereas I really don't think a lot of, I mean, many of these historical questions are, are just not nearly as difficult as people want to make them out to be. And if you take something like proper cause laws, there's no dispute. There was, there was no law. The, the first proper cause law that had anything like this was New York's law, the Sullivan law. And if you really drill down on the laws that existed before it, that states were trying to analogize to, they just look absolutely nothing like this. They were not laws that made it impossible for the average law-abiding citizen to carry firearms for self-defense. And having sat there through the argument at Bruin, I mean, even the justices who were very unhappy with the result in Bruin didn't even really try to put up much of a fight about the history because the history just, I don't really think is indeterminate in the way that people want to claim that it is. Now, that's not to say, you know, that there's not real work that has to be done to understand history and that there may not be cases where it is a little bit harder to do that analysis. But I think this whole idea that, you know, history is just kind of like a, a completely subjective thing that we can't analyze in, in any way whatsoever is really just not consistent with reality and is a way that people are trying to kind of undermine this whole notion of you know, having something that's a little bit more objective test. It's also, you know, I, I would take issue with the idea that this is completely novel. I mean, history has been part of constitutional analysis in many parts of the constitution for a long time. There are all sorts of cases in the fourth amendment that talk about how we understand the right to search and seizure and what, what reasonable search and seizure are consistent with looking back and understanding what property law and property rights have been for hundreds of years. You can find many of the same strains in the first amendment. We understand what speech is protected by the first amendment by looking back at the types of things, restrictions that existed on speech for the past hundreds of years, looking to the common law, looking to laws that existed. So th this is not some you know, novel exercise that courts have no experience doing. It's how courts have dealt with constitutional rights and many other areas of the law for quite some time. Um, so it's, you know, to me, a little remarkable to have this, 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 this extreme resistance and the idea that this is just like made up and impossible and there is no such thing as history. There is history. We, we do actually know, you know, what types of laws existed or not. The difficulties are going to be in having that little bit more subjectivity of asking what kinds of laws, you know, how, how we're going to do the analogizing. But I do think the court pointed to some helpful things that are designed to ensure that that's not a completely subjective inquiry. Tim, did you want to quickly respond to that? Yeah, I, I, you know, the, the reference to unelected judges, I, 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 I guess I agree with in the sense that what if, if I had to sum up Bruin in one word, it's anti-democratic. Um, I mean, it's just breathtaking how um, the court has has assumed for itself um, the the role of second guessing and ultimately invalidating the work of elected representatives to decide how best uh, to keep their citizens safe. Um, uh, yes, historical analysis has uh, been a feature of um, uh, you know some constitutional analysis. So has uh, tears of so have tears of scrutiny uh, for a long time. Uh, so have balancing uh, governmental interests against uh, private interests, uh, whether it's equal protection, the First Amendment. Um, so, um, uh, uh, you know, I thought what came before Bruin was a was a workable framework, and the idea that we're now going to decide something like an assault weapons ban based on whether it is relevantly similar enough to uh, I don't know, a ban on trap guns or regulation on trap guns from the colonial period or a regulation of Winchester repeating rifles from the Civil War era is just a remarkably, uh, it, it's remarkable. And not, in my mind, not in a good way. Um, it's uh, because our, our weapons are so much more lethal uh, and so much more dangerous than anything that the, the founders imagined. Um, so, uh, you know, we have no choice. We will uh, undertake the, the, that analysis and defend our laws on that ground. But it's it is um, it, it has a kind of bizarre world quality to it. Let me ask this as sort of a, a general question, maybe to, to sharpen or clarify maybe the agreement and disagreement here, at least as I, as I'm hearing it. Um, and the question, which is be for both of you, and Tim, you mentioned this a little bit already, which is, you know, how does contemporary empirical evidence matter? in the post-Bruin framework? Like, how does it come in, if at all? Um, and Aaron, you mentioned this in your in your um, sort of opening remarks that, you know, prior to Bruin, you know, the major debate in, in many ways was like, how should judges defer, if at all, to the, you know, empirical assessments of, 
of, of elected officials. And one of the complaints by many gun rights advocates is they were deferring too much. And on the one hand, like a co constitutional rights are not to be, we don't balance them away. It's not just 50, 51, 49. Therefore, you don't get to raise your, you go, don't get to raise your constitutional claim, free speech, criminal procedure rights. They're like proudly insensitive in some ways to social costs. Like we celebrate that in some ways. And history certainly matters as part of that. On the other hand, most areas of constitutional law aren't totally insensitive to public safety. Um, and one of the readings of Bruin, at least, is that it says you can no longer at all look at this modern uh, evidence. And that's that's more than I think what you were saying, Aaron, about history matters. That's saying only history matters. And that does seem to me a little different. And so I guess, you know, maybe start with you, Aaron, and then Tim, like, where do you think the modern empirical evidence about whatever it is, high capacity magazines, the domestic violence prohibitor, where does that enter into the analysis now? Sure. Um, yeah. And, and I'll just start with one, one minor point, which is simply to say that, you know, constitutional rights are supposed to be anti-democratic. I mean, that's, that's why we put them in the constitution is to say, that we want certain things to override what otherwise would be the democratic will in just the legislative process. So, you know, that 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 to me, you know, it, it is sort of, you know, I, I don't think when we're thinking about a lot of other constitutional rights, we think about it in terms of the goal is supposed to be for the legislature to impede, impinge upon First Amendment rights whenever a lot of people want to do so, or, you know, so on. So, but putting it all kind of in that context, the, the place where I think there is, um, room in in the analysis to talk about modern day interests is the as I read Bruin when you know the, the court basically says in some cases the historical inquiry is going to be straightforward in the sense that you're really dealing with a problem that's always existed and a type of law that always could have been passed and you just look at whether the law existed and if it didn't you know that's sort of the if there's not a a, a strong tradition of that kind of law having existed that's sort of the end of the analysis the court then really, it didn't kind of say, if there's not such a law, then you get to move on to analogizing. It, it actually said the more nuanced analogizing approach is, is permissible only in cases that implicate, to quote the court's language, which I think I did earlier, unprecedented societal concerns or dramatic technological changes. And so to me, you know, if there's room in the Bruin test to be focusing at all on kind of modern day empirical questions, it's, it's really in, in uh, what I would, where I would expect states to make the arguments is in trying to argue why they think something is an unprecedented social um, concern or, and, you know, a, a, a dramatic change in technology. And we've seen this already, you know, we can talk a little bit about it in specific cases where I've seen the states already making these arguments, but um, that I, I do think there's, there's room there for a state to try to make the case for why it thinks it should be in that analogizing bucket. Um, but, you know, that is an analysis, I, I will freely concede, that's focused less on you know, does the state sort of have a stronger interest today or really on kind of the, 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 the how, how strong, how well does this law advance the interest? Some of those questions that were the way the courts thought about it under the two-step test, I think instead the focus is more on trying to explain why the law today is really addressing something that the law, that a law could not have exist, uh, could not have addressed in the past or addressing it in a way that a law could not have, have, have addressed in the past and trying to make that case for this is, you know, yes, this is novel, but it's novel because it's really not something states ever would have had an opportunity to do in the past. I think that category is going to be narrower than, you know, a lot of states would like it to be, but I'm, I'm sure Tim will, will, would, will make a strong case for why it should be much broader than I think it should be. Well, I, um, I just think that states will will continue to argue about uh, the reasons why they are regulating uh, uh, in the way that they are. So I, I think um, uh, I, I don't think states are going to let this be solely about history. Um, I, I think it's important for us to let judges know, remind them of uh, why we're regulating the way we are. I think. Uh, certainly in the cases, the, the, the novel cases that require the nuanced approach that the court talked about, um, there is room, I think, for explicit use of uh, the modern um, justification for the modern law as a comparator for the justification for historical regulation. But I think even in other cases, I think states um, will want to make sure that judges are aware that when they're doing this historical analysis, they are doing it alongside 
a modern day problem that the that the government is trying to offer a modern day solution to and um and it is one that uh, imposes a very real human cost every time a court strikes down a gun safety regulation so i think um even if it, it you know even if some judges ignore it um uh, and tell us that it's improper for us to to raise these kinds of uh, facts and evidence and claims uh, after Bruin. I think we're going to keep doing it because it's uh, it's important for judges to be uh, keenly aware of uh, the public safety cost of striking down gun safety regulations. So one thought I had is in terms of making this um, discussion even more concrete um, and thinking about constitutionality of laws after Bruin um, would be to run through a few um, laws which are currently being litigated. Um, we've got some questions in the Q&A about a few, but um, why I'm going to start with one that um, I was thinking of since um, ever since Lissy's introduction this morning. Lissy mentioned that this is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, um, and of course, of course, current federal law has a domestic violence prohibitor, um, the constitutionality of which I'm sure will be challenged if it hasn't already after Bruin. Um, and I wonder what how each of you would go about analyzing it um, under the Bruin test. So, Aaron, I heard you saying, um, uh, and and Bruin suggests that. If something was a you know continuing societal problem, it was not addressed with this you know with a gun law in the founding era. Then the burden on the government kicks in, and it may be hard to defend. Obviously, domestic violence was a reality uh, in 1791, and yet was not criminalized for the most part, and certainly wasn't something you could lose your gun for. Which, on the one hand, would suggest that the DV prohibitor, I would guess, is unconstitutional under the Second Amendment, which I feel like is not a result that. The vast majority of judges um, would be willing to embrace. Um, how are they going to get there uh, under a historical test that's consistent with how Bruin is written? Um, maybe uh, I, I'd love to hear both of your thoughts on this, but maybe Aaron and then Tim. Sure. I mean, you know, so I think that if I were trying to defend it, um, you know, what I would try and say is, look, the this is an area where uh, you know to kind of pick up on the language about unprecedented societal concerns um, that that this is an area where social norms have just changed radically. Uh, you know, I mean, if you go back historically, like that they're just, we didn't have a concern with and real laws that were, you know, unfortunately that were protective against domestic violence and norms have changed dramatically in that sense. And so, you know, I think I'd try to make an argument that was based on the notion of okay, yes, you know, in theory, you could have had these types of laws, but like you didn't even really have the need to think about it because you weren't really criminalizing the sub, the underlying conduct, the predicate conduct here at the time. And that's, that's quite a societal change. And really this then just becomes analogous to, you know, the consequences that would attach to things that we did historically think of as um, as, as that, 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 that really the way to think about it is, you know, if you've got a, a sufficiently serious crime, losing your Second Amendment rights is, is an appropriate attachment to them. Obviously, the pushback from the challenger side would be to say, sure, but that's that's typically been in the, the felon context, and we've always treated the distinction between felons and misdemeanors as a critical, important distinction about the that that is supposed to govern um, when you and not just in the Second Amendment context, but generally, you know, that that implicates when you can lose constitutional rights. And historically, you know, obviously felons were subject to much more uh, severe punishment uh, historically than, than today. Some of these laws don't exist a couple hundred years ago because the punishment for felonies was often just death. Um, so you didn't get to the question of what rights you would continue to possess as a felon. So, um, you know, so I, I think as a challenger, I would say that's great, but then, you know, you, you, you actually need to make it a felony and treat it as a felony because otherwise you're kind of doing a second class rights analysis to Second Amendment rights saying, well, we're not going to treat this as a sufficiently serious crime for purposes of every other thing that normally attaches when we think a crime is very serious, but we are going to um, make it serious for this purpose. So, you know, that, that's sort of how I would see the arguments shaking out here, um, and which is not, you know, radically different from some of the ways that, say, the, you know, the, the federal felon, mis uh, federal domestic violence misdemeanant provision has been argued and, and produced a lot of di dividing opinions um, over the past decade in the lower courts. 
Um, I, I, I don't have a lot uh, to add to that. Um, I, I do think that, um, I mean, one could read Bruin to say that that's a straight, this is a case of a straightforward inquiry, that domestic violence was a problem in colonial times, uh, the same way it is now. And if, um, uh, if governments then did not disarm uh, perpetrators of domestic violence then, then that is uh, a sign that it is, um, uh, that um, it can't be regulated now. Uh, I, I, I would expect states to argue, just as Erin uh, said at the outset of her answer, that uh, this is uh, a new or at least a newly uh, pervasive and severe problem. Um, and that it does require uh, reasoning by analogy and that uh, laws uh, disarming uh, felons and uh, similar kinds of laws would be relevantly similar. So I'm gonna go uh, to the Q&A here. So um, continue to add um, whatever questions you like to answer. I'm gonna do my best to get through as many as possible. Um, and for some of these, I'm gonna um, synthesize maybe or or, or condense. Um, we have a question in here, um, which um, among other things sort of involves themes of race uh, at the founding and what we know about the racist beliefs and laws that existed at the time the second amendment was um, proposed and ratified. I wanna twist the, the question itself, um, maybe to ask a, a broader one, which is, um, with the DV example we just discussed, we are looking at sort of a historical failure to regulate, which today we would, you know, we would, we have remedied um, through federal law. But also when we look back at the history, we find a lot of laws on the books in 1791 or 1868, whatever your time reference point is, um, which we would today reject for obvious moral, legal, constitutional reasons, including at the time of the founding, a lot of laws which disarmed Native Americans, Black Americans, people refusing to take loyalty oaths. Um, what do we do with those today? Um, this one, I'll start with you, Tim. If you're defending, let's say, a Massachusetts law, how do you go about, you know, the fact that, let's say, you're defending a DV law or whatever, and you don't have that direct historical analog, but you have these other laws that existed at the founding? Are you comfortable citing them? How do you analogize from that? And then, Aaron, would appreciate your thoughts, too. But let's start with Tim. Um, sure. Um, well, I'm sorry, Professor. You talk. Um, I, I mean, I mean, as, a, as, a, as I'm imagining myself not having, fortunately, the having to do your work uh, and actually defending these laws. That you know, if my job were now post Bruin to reason by analogy based on a historical record, which Bruin has directed kind of narrowly, even in time, to focus at it seems like maybe 1791, maybe 1868. Not sure. Um, that the, the an enormous number of the laws you're going to find on the books at that time are reprehensible for so many reasons, race based or whatever else. Yeah. But they might be the best proxy for a government, a principle that the government can regulate groups they thought to be dangerous, even if we today think it's a different group. Um, so I, I just wonder, as a as a you know, as a government litigator yeah. trying to defend a modern law, how do you or do you make use of that of that of that sort of that racist legal history? Yeah, um, very carefully, if at all. Um, uh, I think uh, it's it's a very uh, you know just another example of the difficult place that governments trying to defend their gun safety laws are put in. Um, you know, we'll be we'll be looking for any. Um, relevantly similar historical regulation. And uh, we may find ourselves arguing that something is an uh, analog while disavowing any kind of endorsement of that kind of regulation. Um, but say that, look, this is, shows that uh, the original understanding um, or the public understanding of the right uh, did not extend as far as uh, the plaintiffs claim it does. So, um, uh, I think I think we may be forced in some instances to rely on al analogies that we would uh, disavow uh, or be uncomfortable with in other circumstances, but uh, say that nonetheless it shows that um, the Second Amendment right was uh, limited in a way that uh, saves the law under attack. So I, I think this is you know it it it's it. it it's a particularly difficult dynamic in the context of the Second Amendment because quite there was quite a great deal of history of laws that were passed in this area being passed based on kind of racist notions, blatantly trying to keep firearms out of certain hands. I mean, there's you know, just even to take the law that was at issue in Bruin, there is evidence that when it was passed back about a century ago, it was passed in significant part out of anti-immigrant 
um, animus and that the discretion was put into the law so that it would be easier to deny permits to uh, particular immigrant groups that were, were disliked at the time. But there's a lot of laws, you know, back um, particularly, of course, in the post-Civil War era that were passed by a lot of states for, um, you know, often when you see discretion, it was there to, to try and keep firearms out of the hands of newly emancipated Black Americans. You know, if you take things like um, some of the the, the carry restrictions that did exist, some of them were specifically designed to make it so that you could carry the firearms that only people who had a lot of money could purchase. And the whole point of it was because that way you would ensure that Black Americans could not carry because they wouldn't be able to afford the types of, of firearms that were permissible. So it's really, I think, even in more than in some other areas, um, an area where it's a complication that I, I think for um, for, for everyone to think about in terms of thinking about the history. But this is part of where I think that how and why becomes very important. Um, if you think about it as, you know, it's sort of a converse of whether you're doing it for the same reason today. I do think that the court, you know, if you, if you spend some time reading, say, Justice Alito's discussion and Justice Thomas's discussion of the history in the McDonald case several years back, when it's talking all about the history in the post, in the kind of Reconstruction era, um, of, that, that I think the court is going to expect that, that the, the Supreme Court expects lower courts and litigants to be sensitive to that and thinking about, okay, was this law passed for a reason that is sort of permissible and consistent with the Second Amendment interests, or really was it a law that existed um, to say, look, we actually think there's a right to keep and carry. We just want to ensure that certain disfavored groups don't get to exercise it. And if you have a law that was passed and the motivation was that animus of we want to, you know, effectively just discriminate against certain groups, I think the Supreme Court would say that's not a law that actually speaks to the historical tradition and understanding of the Second Amendment. It's a law that speaks to a, you know, a, 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 a a, a, an entirely different, unfortunate reality of our country that we had a historical tradition of pervasive discrimination at certain periods of our history. And you have to be sensitive when doing the historical analysis to that in thinking about what was um, a motivating factor and how was a law applied. And this is the kind of stuff that a lot of great work has been done by, you know, by, by, by all of you professors who are out there doing wonderful historical work in this area, uh, looking at, you know, understanding you can't just begin and end with looking at the words of a statute. It, it actually, when we're talking about historical tradition, it's, it's important to understand how a law was applied, if a law was applied at all, if it's a law that sort of was never um, invoked, or if it's a law that was only ever invoked against disfavored groups, that's, that's relevant to thinking about how it informs the the historical understanding of a constitutional right. So that was very generous of you, Aaron. Thank you. Um, let me shout out the scholars who are actually doing work on this. Um, uh, really good work. Um, if anybody is interested in this question of race and history, of course, the opinions that um, Aaron just mentioned, Justice Alito's and Justice Thomas's in McDonald, give um, uh, you know a, a deep dive on one view of the history. Bob Cottrell is a law, a law professor who's written sort of, a, I think, in a, in a view similar to theirs. Others who have written in this area include Brennan Rivas, R-I-V-A-S, Patrick Charles, Mark Frasetto, Carol Anderson. You can find all their work just by Googling. I wish we had time to dig through it all um, here today. But I see another question here, which is a little more sort of present in the sense of this is a kind of law that is um, a relatively recent development. The question is, what do our panelists see as the future for the constitutionality of risk protection orders? Uh, and I'll just give a quick thumbnail on these for those who don't know. Risk protection orders, also sometimes called red flag laws, uh, allow a gun to be temporarily taken away from a person who a judge has determined presents an immediate risk to themselves or others. That is then usually followed by a hearing in a week or two, some varies from state to state, to determine whether a final order should be entered to keep the gun away for usually a year or some longer period. They've been subject to challenges both under due process and Second Amendment. To my knowledge thus far, none have ever been struck down, um, but they are almost all, at least in their current form, new. Um, I think all maybe 18 of them have been adopted. There's 21 states have them now, I think, 18 in the last five years. Um, what do we think? How do we go about evaluating their constitutionality post Bruin? I'll start with you on this one, Aaron, and then uh, and then back to Tim. Aaron, sure. Um, so you know, I think uh, look, I, I think by and large, everybody is very sensitive to the need to kind of have laws that deal with immediate threats and 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 want to have ways that the government can address those 
you know, when you, when you really, I mean, you know, everybody understands that you don't want the, you, you don't want to err on the side of the firearm being in the hands of someone who really you're confident is posing a, a serious threat. At the same time, you know, the difficulty is ensuring, uh, as, as you mentioned, I mean, we have, we, we have due process rights in this country that apply in all sorts of contexts, not just when it comes to um, the deprivations of Second Amendment rights, and and you have to ensure that you think about laws through that lens of, you know, is there sufficient process, and or are we putting people in a position where, say, you know, the abusive spouse is able to go quickly get the firearm out of the hands of the victim uh, by going in and making some false statements because there's not enough process to ensure that we really get to the bottom of it before kind of reflexively, um, you know, saying let's 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 abide by whoever's making complaint. And so I think that's really where you know the concern here is that 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 everybody I think wants to ensure that you tailor these laws in a way that gets at the real problem, but doesn't, you know, make it kind of so easy to come in that you're actually putting the victims of violence at risk. And I think the way that a lot of that, you know, to the extent it continues to be litigated, will be litigated in, in conjunction with thinking about how we are we use are we employing due process here in the same manner we do elsewhere? Because the one thing that seems, you know, it, it seems like we should be able to grant is you shouldn't have less due process before taking away an enumerated constitutional right than you have before taking away, you know, other types of things that the constitution more generally protects. And so I, I do think, you know, there's been a lot of work to try to ensure that these laws are designed in a manner that creates the greatest process possible and is consistent with due process. And that most of the attack will be, you know, on focusing on that rather than sort of a broad scale, you can't have this, you know, these types of restrictions at all, because we've, you know, it, even outside the context of firearms, I mean, we, we've always kind of had some notions in our country of trying to, you know, do what we can to to prevent the crimes from happening in the first place. Um, but but it's a it's a really difficult area, I think, both from a policy perspective and from a legal perspective. Uh, you know, I think it's a it's a great example of the potentially really difficult results that could flow from Bruin. Um, uh, if, if someone wanted to make a, a very robust Second Amendment argument about how laws like this did not exist in 1791 or 1868, and a court is not satisfied that the analogies that the government identify are relevantly similar enough, um, then it's a Second Amendment violation, even though I think all might agree uh, as a policy and public safety matter that the government ought to have tools not just to uh, arrest those who perpetrate violent crimes, but to try to stop violent crime from happening. Um, so, um, you know, the due process point is an interesting one. My understanding, which I, I uh, big grain of salt is limited with respect to some of the red flag laws, is that they provide for very robust process, uh, including a court process uh, and, a, you know, requiring a court order after a hearing uh, before someone is disarmed. Um, so, um, uh, my understanding is that those laws provide quite a bit of process, but, um, it just is an example of how, um, some of the results that might flow from a, a literal and robust interpretation of Bruin is that if, uh, the, the analogies offered by the government aren't good enough, aren't similar enough from 1791 or 1868, uh, it may violate the second amendment. If I could just, just, um quick addendum on this. I mean, I, I, but I, I just want to, you know, this is a, is a point where, I mean, I, I think people don't need to be so afraid of history. You know, the, the laws, several of the laws that were invoked in Bruin, um, these, they were called surety laws. They weren't relevant to Bruin because they actually didn't prohibit people from carrying firearms, but they actually might be quite relevant to a debate about red flag laws because what those laws did was allowed somebody to come in and swear, essentially swear out an affidavit to a court and say, I'm facing you know, a threat from someone who I believe is about to misuse the firearm, and the courts could then restrict the rights of that person. Now, they were different types of restrictions back then, but you know. I don't think those laws were particularly relevant at all to the question in Bruin, but they might be of, of a great deal more relevance to the question of what the historical tradition is surrounding the ability to um, temporarily restrict somebody's ability to carry a firearm in the face of a credible threat that they're going to misuse it. 
So I think amazingly and fortuitously, we have ended on what sounds like actually some maybe agreement between the two panelists and between sort of history and um, empirics and common sense. It's nice, I think, that we can come together on that. Um, so I think I will just thank you both. Thank you all um, for participating for your fantastic questions. My apologies to the questions we didn't get to. And I believe now it's my job to turn it back over to Lissy uh, to wrap up the, pa uh, the panel. But thank you again um, to Tim and Aaron. Absolutely wonderful. And I just want to say thank you to all three of you, Joseph, Aaron, Tim, for helping all of us understand the issues and nuances of Bruin and anticipating post-Bruin litigation. The breadth and depth of your knowledge, all three of you, was really quite stunning. And I will just say, as someone who used to be what I call a real lawyer, I am very grateful I do not have to argue against any of you, <laughs> ever. So thank you for being here and sharing your wisdom and insights with all of us. Thank you. Hi, everybody. We are all here, I believe, ready for panel number two. So I want to open up this panel by saying that every day, seven days a week, community organizations are working on the ground in communities and neighborhoods, on the streets and hospitals with kids and young adults, with gang members, with families, with formerly incarcerated individuals with everyone to help stem violence, particularly gun violence right now. As I mentioned earlier, we have gathered quite an extraordinary group of experts, all of whom work in this field 365 days a year. So they will share their successes, their challenges. They hail from across the United States from New York, Boston, Baltimore, and Chicago. So I'll introduce our moderator who will introduce everyone else. So with great pleasure, I will introduce Dr. Talib Hudson. He is a community-based scholar and advocate from Harlem, New York. Dr. Hudson is the founder of The New Hood, a community-based policy center empowering urban Black and Latinx communities. He's also the Director of Research and Innovation at the National Network for Safe Communities at John Jay College, where he works on violence prevention strategies. Dr. Hudson earned his doctorate in public and urban policy from the New School. So thank you, Talib, for being here and for helping to get this panel together. I turn it over to you. Great, thank you so much uh, for that uh, warm introduction and thank you for, for having me and thank you for having all of us and thank you for everyone to joining uh, this event for this very important dialogue uh, and discussion. We hope you take a lot uh, from this. Briefly, let me just uh, uh, frame things a little bit and let me tell you a little bit about um, who, am I, who I am and my background and then We'll get more into the specifics with some of our guests today. So, as you heard, I'm Dr. Talib Hudson. Uh, my uh, I have a couple different hats. Um, one is a, is uh, the director of research and innovation at the National Network for Safe Communities at John Jay College. And from those of you in the Boston area, you may be familiar with the Boston Gun Project and Operation Ceasefire that was started by David Kennedy back in the in the 1990s. Um, subsequently. Uh, he launched the National Network of Safe Communities at John Jay College, um, which is where I um, which is where I now I now work today. Um, and uh, and and looking at uh, how we can uh, um, and not only in, improve um, on the the strategies and, and the methods that are employed, but but also uh, seeing how to more holistically uh, look uh, at at the research and, and what's out there. Additionally, I did launch a think tank called The New Hood, which focuses on empowering Black and Brown communities through community-based policy ideas um, and solutions. I, I came to this work uh, through, through working at Street Corner Resources, uh, which is a small community-based organization in Harlem. My mentor was Aisha Sekou, who is just doing wonderful, fantastic work in, in Harlem to this day. She is now one of the crisis management sites um, within New York City. 
previously I've uh, worked with Community Justice Action Fund uh, as their policy director, working with folks like uh, Chico and, and JT to get the, the Biden administration to, to commit to uh, giving, uh, putting more federal resources um, into community violence intervention, which you heard Senator Murphy talk about earlier today. So um, I'm really excited to be here with this August group, but you didn't come here for me, so I'll, I'll stop there. Um, and uh, we'll get into into uh, the, the folks here. So um, I, I won't read all of their bios because you you have their bios in front of you. Is my understanding, and it's been tweeted and, and it's online. But I do just want to talk a little bit about some of our about some of our folks. Um, Dr. Hannah Sachs um, from Massachusetts General Hospital. Um, she's an she's an instructor at Harvard Medical School, and she's been an extremely vocal advocate for for gun violence prevention. You know, not only is she um, a doctor at one of the, the leading um, medical institutions um, that we have in this country, but she also has a very personal story uh, regarding gun violence um, when um, her, uh, her cousin's seven-year-old son was killed at St. Hook Elementary. And so from there, she's also started the Mass, the Mass General Gun Violence Prevention Coalition, which is a multi multidisciplinary initiative dedicated to reducing morbidity or mortality from firearm-related violence and promoting gun safety do research um, and education. And so she's doing really fantastic work and I, I can't wait to hear more about her work. Uh, Dr. Chico Tillman is a senior research fellow at the University of Chicago uh, Crime Education Lab and also executive director at the Heartland Alliance Ready Chicago and is also leading the Ready National Center uh, for Safe Communities um, as well. Uh, Dr. Tillman, who, who's in, well, formerly incarcerated and has his, his own story, um, you know, came home with a purpose of improving and, and changing his community. And Dr. Tillman has been recognized by President Biden and, and the White House and others. And he has been a fantastic uh, national voice and champion on this on this issue. And James JT Timpson, I'm gonna call you, I'm gonna call you Dr. Timpson as well, because we may we may have accredited degrees, but you accredited in the streets. So um, you know, and so so I want to call you Dr. Timpson as well. Um, you know, it's 20 years, over 20 years of extensive experience and expertise violence prevention initiatives. Um, he has uh, helped to drive the successful expansion of ROCA in Baltimore as the founding director and has now joined ROCA Impact as the managing director of community violence initiatives. And he oversees their skill impact institutes training and coaching initiatives with community violence intervention programs across the country. So I could talk on and on about how great all of you are, um, but let me just uh, 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 start with with each one of you and and we'll go to to dr Sachs first um you know when we talk about this uh field of community violence prevention community-based prevention gun violence prevention i was i was actually i'm in la right now i'm in los angeles and the ucla law school is also doing a um a similar um panel this the symposium on brewing and one of the questions was what is community violence intervention and what is that work in um, and basically, for anyone who does not know who is new to this, uh, there is there are people all across the country who are doing work on the ground, like the people you see in front of you, to address the real impacts of gun violence, right? So we can talk about the legal aspects and the regulatory frameworks, and you know, the senator all the this morning talked about the, the impacts of the proliferation of guns and children in schools. But you have folks all across the country who are doing things, whether they're in a hospital, whether they're in the streets, whether they're in community-based programs, whether they're in schools, whether they're working with folks coming home from prison, um, who are working to stem uh, the disproportionate violence that we see in, in Black and Brown communities across the country. And these all kind of fall under the umbrella of what we're calling community violence um, intervention today. So just want to make sure that folks have that framing in case, in case anyone um, was, was unfamiliar, unaware. So Dr. Sachs, can you just tell us a little bit um, about some of the work that, that you're doing, um, what, you know, what you see, the things that you need, and um, anything you want our audience to know to start us off this morning? Thank you so much. It's just, it's, it's my honor to be here and in community with all of you. So thanks so much for having me as, 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 part, of this, uh, as part of this panel on this, on this day. Um, as, as you mentioned, for, for so many of us that, that do work in this space, this issue is, is deeply personal. And um, as you mentioned, I was uh, I was in my my medical training when when my cousin's seven year old son was was murdered at Sandy Hook. And um, 
in the aftermath of that and reeling from that, I was in the middle of my medical training and I was an MGH resident, Mass General Hospital resident. I knew how to look at the medical literature. I knew how to think about complex problems um, and see what the evidence was. And when I started to look through that evidence and really understand it, it was actually just amazing to me how minimal it was, how porous it was, how few resources had been uh, directed towards this problem that was taking tens of thousands of lives every year. And we started to, to ask this question over, over years, which is what's our role as the medical community in, in this complex problem? And one of the things that was, was very clear is that I was not alone in my entire medical school training and my entire residency training in having not one course education, anything, and thinking about what it would mean to bring, bring gun violence prevention to the bedside. Way too little in terms of trauma-informed care. We in the medical system were trained to uh, treat bullet holes when they, to treat people with bullet holes when they come into a hospital. And we knew far too little about what then happens in the weeks, months, years after those, after those injuries. We track in this country the number of gun deaths. I can tell you with precision that in 2020, 45,222 people were killed from guns. If you ask me how many people were injured who become our lifelong patients, I mean, people who are shot and survive become our lifelong patients. If you ask me how many are those in this country in that same year, I would tell you, I don't know, because we don't track that in nearly as a reliable way as, as we need to. And those those where we choose to invest, of course, those are answerable questions. And where we choose to invest just reflects our policy priorities uh, across the board. We started really working on this issue. The only way to do this to do this work is to be centered in community and centering the voices of survivors and those who are most affected. There's there's no other way to do it, even though plenty of people do try. And you know, we started a center for gun violence prevention um, in in 2019 at Mass General Hospital, and that can land me on the front page of the Boston Globe in a in a big article where people who have been on the front lines of this issue, doing this work in communities most affected for decades, don't get. In an eighth of that of that media coverage or an eighth of that spotlight. And that's a divide we're really looking to bridge and say, how do we how do we do our part um, in really transforming these narratives of gun violence? So the work that I hope that we talk about to, uh, today is what comes after a bullet injury? What are the violence intervention programs that we need to be putting in place and the resources we need to be wrapping around people and families who are affected on both sides of a gun um, during during these injuries? Love to share some more work that we're doing to transform narratives of gun violence, partnered with communities, um, and thinking about the, how do we change the media and the journalism reporting that focuses almost exclusively on mass shootings, which, believe me, I understand are horrific. And they do account for about 1% of all gun deaths in this country. How do we think about the, the, the gunshots that are going off every day in our cities? And really the theme that I want to talk about is, as we go through is that I, I work, I live and work in Boston, Massachusetts, often thought about as one of the safest cities and one of the safest states when it comes to, to violence. And yet young people growing up in certain neighborhoods in our city tell me that they dodge bullets for a living. You sit in youth coalition meetings like I've done across our city, and every young person has a story. Way too many young people have stories about how gun violence affected their family, their lives, what it means to be growing up in a neighborhood where the sounds of a gunshot going off at night keeps them up. And what does that mean for their performance in school the next day and so many other factors? So I really hope that this, this panel today can be part of transforming narratives um, because really the media discussion about gun violence in America is way too shallow. And I hope our, our role all here together today is gonna be really centering the voices of survivors, people most affected and thinking about what, what our role is in helping elevate their voice. So thanks for having me. Thank you, Dr. Sachs. I think I'm gonna have to just pack you up and just take you with me <laughs> when, 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 you know, when I go to different places because the way you just uh, said that I think was was, was really powerful. Um, so so thank you for that. I um, accept. Tell me where we're headed. <laughs> um, let's let's go to um let's go to 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 to, to JT. Um, talk uh, just a little bit about some of the work that uh, that uh, that that you're doing. Um, anything else you want to kick off with for, for folks to know? Yeah, so uh, thanks again. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, so in Baltimore, uh, I work for ROCA. Um, we, we have a direct service location here where we service in about 275 young men here in Baltimore City, um, all who are deemed to be high risk. And what we mean by high risk is those who are most likely to be your next victims or perpetrators of gun violence. 
Um, and we really focus very narrowly on that population that, that we deal with. Um, our real focus is around behavior change, is really showing them that change is possible. Um, however, with the belief and the understanding that we know it takes time. Um, we know that they didn't get into the lifestyle that they're in and be put in harm's way overnight. So it's not gonna take overnight to change the process. So we help these young men take that journey through figuring out what life really looks like, what options they have other than what, they, what they've been exposed to each and every day. Um, and we get an opportunity to work with them for four years. Um, so really we, we allow them to come in and, and kind of create their own roadmap. And we stick with them along the way to, to help them achieve the goals that they set for themselves. And as time goes on, you'd be surprised how the goals that they set in, for themselves in the beginning start to look different towards the end, you know? And so we just graduated our first four year cohort uh, because we've only, we've only been in Baltimore for four years. So we just graduated our first four year class and I'm, I'm so excited that we actually hired one of our first four year members as a youth worker two weeks ago. So one of our first young people, we've been able to reach back into the community and be able to hire to be a part of the staff now. And I was having a conversation with him this morning and just, just, just seeing the joy on his face and just hearing him talk about the work so differently. And I remember the young man that walked through the door four years ago and that wasn't him today, right? But it was just a testament to me that we're doing something powerful and really working with these young men and showing them something different. Um, Roca has uh, five, six different sites now. We have one in Baltimore, five in Massachusetts, and I believe we have one in uh, Hartford, Connecticut, where we're doing a, a mother's program um, or a young mother's program up there. So we're expanding. My role has changed. I was one of the co-founding directors of the Baltimore site four years ago. Uh, recently, I switched over to work for the Impact Institute as the manager director of community violence initiatives. That gives me the opportunity to really share some of what we've been learning here in Baltimore around CBT, our cognitive behavior theory, which is the foundation of the work that we do, um, is really that we teach these young men these seven skills that teach them how to emotionally regulate. We really refer to them as the seven life-saving skills because it teaches young men things that we've been taught to avoid our whole lives, like labeling our feelings and getting touch and getting in touch with ourselves and who we really are and creating a space of vulnerability and a, a, a safe space of vulnerability that allows you to be able to actually grow and thrive. So we're showing young men that that's okay. We're showing young men that, that, that we will help you with that journey. Um, and we, we, we've really been able to, to have some great successes with the young people that we're working with. Now with the Institute, what we're doing is looking at how we can help other community-based programs across the country do the same thing using our CBT as a tool to really af affect this behavior change with young people who are at the center of urban violence. I say that because we're hyper-focused on working with young people that are really at the center of urban violence. Um, so there is a distinction. There's at-risk young people, there's high-risk young people. We work with high-risk young people. And so really showing programs, other programs across the country, how to use CBT to really help these young men think about the choices that they make differently, think about how to, uh, actually live life a different way and be able to do things differently. So, you know, we have a lot going on. This is a city that's full of uh, a lot of things that we wish we could change, but we're in it and we're gonna stay in the work and, and we're gonna keep fighting until it's done. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here and share with you guys this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Timpson. Now let's go to Dr. Chico Tillman. Um, you know, please tell us a little bit about uh, the work that, that you're currently doing um, and anything general you want folks to know to kick off the conversation? Um, first of all, thank you for um, allowing me to be a part of um, this particular pan panel. Uh, everybody described the body that went before me, um, described the body of work that um, we really committed our lives to in such an eloquent way. And I don't want to um, reiterate things that's already said. So I will touch on things that we do um, or that I'm doing that might be um, in addition to what they do and support the work that they do. Um, as he indicated, my name is Dr. Chico Tillman and my current position is executive director of Ready National Center for Safe Communities. In addition, 
I am a senior research fellow at the University of Chicago Crime and Education Lab. Lastly, I am a subject matter expert that's working collaboratively with the White House that help inform policy and have been working tirelessly for systems change. The, Ready, the reason we created this Ready National Center for Safe Communities is because with the new resources that have been allotted or given to communities, there comes a responsibility to put or support programs in a way that they can have optimum impact. So in order to continue that, um, because every city isn't as rich in knowledge as a Baltimore, Chicago, New York, I'm thinking about cities like Omaha, Nebraska, where there might be high violence, but they're starting and they like, where do I start? I got this funding for um, violence prevention. Where do I start or what do I do? Um, and in many cases, what has happened is people have resulted or responded in a way where they do what they've always did. They give it to the police. So we wanted to first lay the groundwork that CVI is a complementary strategy to policing, that it works with individual prior to it breaching the level of crime and afterward. The reason why I say an afterward because we deal with retaliation. Mm -hmm. um, we work with in situations with, with individuals that's at the highest risk because we understand at risk is the whole community. Anybody in the community can be shot at any given time because it's almost like a war zone. So at risk, the whole community, vulnerable communities are at risk. But when we say individuals at the highest risk, we're talking about the drivers of violence the individuals that are involved in subculture behavior are carrying guns, are the individuals that actually have shown past behaviors that involve shootings. And what Ready, the National Center wants to work in three buckets of work. The first is field support, and that is to build up communities, cities, organizations, programs around the country and provide technical assistance so that they can start their own programs and be empowered. The beauty of Ready and what I love about Ready more than anything is that Ready does not do the foundational work in order to do CVI, which is the foundation would be street intervention where they access the, what Ready is, Ready does a different type of case management similar to ROCA that is centered around CBI. We say CBI because we use cognitive behavior intervention. The difference between intervention and therapy is intervention allows paraprofessionals to um, facilitate the services where therapy, you typically need clinicians overseeing this process. Along with that, we do innovation. We help people think about building our programs that are specific to their needs. And under, also we understand that things are emerging, challenges are coming up. Some of the problems and violence that exist today didn't exist in the 90s, even though the characteristics are same. So we have to be more, more flexible than rigid. Mm -hmm. Another thing is knowledge sharing. Ready is fortunate or sit in a privileged space because we are one of the few organizations in the country with an RCT. So we wanna be doing knowledge sharing. We wanna share, not that we know everything, but we wanna share our mistakes. This is what we learned. This is the best practice. This is what, these are the modifications we made. These are the improvements we made. More importantly, we wanna share our curriculum. We wanna share, mm. we started out with for CBI with the Cincinnati curriculum, but it wasn't as culturally, competent for the community or the population that we serve. So we made two, three iterations. So when somebody else choose to start or work in this space, they won't be starting from where we started, but they will be starting from where we're at. And lastly, what we wanna do um, is systems change. And with systems change, 
we're working with and collaborating with organizations on a local, state, and national level to, to, to move or change the way these communities look because despite the hard work Aroka does or my sister that's working with the hospital, if we don't get systems level change, we just gonna keep doing the work into perpetuity. We need to change the environment or the mm -hmm. conditions of the way people are living. When I say that, I mean disinvestment in schools, poor housing, lack of access to, we gotta deal with the root causes. So there has to be some systems level change at the state and federal level so that our work can complement it. And the last thing I wanna say is we're trying to galvanize or convene all the assets within an ecosystem to mitigate violence in the same manner that we did with COVID, and then you'll see our success. You cannot put the onus or responsibility on one organization to resolve all the violence in a community or city that's been going on for 100 years. It's not going to happen. If that was the case, then the police department would be able to solve the problem because in many cities, police departments are given a billion dollars or two billion dollars to mitigate violence, and it's not happening. So to give Roca three million and put all the responsibility on them to resolve a challenge where a billion has given to the police and it hasn't worked, it's not going to happen. So it's not so much about the way we allocate resources alone. It's about galvanizing everybody to get on the same page to mitigate that. The last thing, and I got to say this, um, my work at USC, uh, the thing I'm most proud of what I'm doing now is we're creating a leadership and management school inside an Ivy League school, the University of Chicago for leaders in the field. not We're not trying to replicate what other people are doing, training individuals to do the work. We're training leaders to be able to lead the work with management science and with leaders from all over the world so they can run these organizations, but also have the transferable skills to be able to go in other sectors so other sectors can be trauma-informed. We need some of the people to take the skills that they have in this space or sector to other sectors. And we need them to be validated by somebody with the credentials like the University of Chicago. And the most important point, and this is what I'm most proud of, we're gonna do it free. We're raising the money so that people with organizations or leading organizations can go to the University of Chicago get in this program, the certificate program, and get these skills, these hard skills free so that they can not only elevate the work of the body of CBI, but can transfer into these or transition into these other sectors and take those skills as well so that they could better understand our work. One more thing, and then I'm done for real. <laughs> my goal or my mission, and I would love if JT, and Dr. Sachs put this, you know, partner with me in this. My goal is to make CVI a permanent part of the public safety ecosystem where we are a line item at the federal, state, and local level and not a castaway where we're working on grants to survive. That's a horrible way to work in an atmosphere so dangerous. I think at some point they need to acknowledge us as a part of the solution. And the best way to do so would be us being a permanent part of the public safety ecosystem. Go ahead, go ahead, Dr. Sachs. I see you coming off mute, go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna say when when Senator Murphy kicked us off this, this morning, he told us to, he said, I know there's a panel on innovation and while that's good, we already know what works. I respect, with all due respect, let me just say, like, I, I, please take away what, what Dr. Tillman said and, 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 and uh, what Dr. Tillman and Timpson said here, that this innovation, this is what we're talking about. When you talk about background checks to communities, I, I live and work in Boston. We have most of the, the strictest gun laws on, on the books. And when you talk to communities that are most affected day in and day out and say, we've got strict gun laws, it is just, it doesn't resonate with them. 
It's just not reflecting in their, it's, it's just not reflective of their experience. It is a part of the problem, but it does not stop and end there. So I know sometimes their skepticism comes up. We heard it this morning about what does innovation in this space mean? It means this. It means how do we really think about people on both sides of the gun and, and breaking retaliatory cycles of violence? How do we wrap the right resources around people to really break these cycles that we've all witnessed time and time again, way too many times? This is what we mean by, by innovation. And it's easy to be skeptical, but when you hear those when you hear those words, I mean, Dr. Tillman, I'm a University of Chicago Pritzker Med School grad, so you're stuck with me. I like, can't wait to talk more about this, but <laughs> this is what innovation in this, in this space means, what you just heard. So, so Dr. Sachs, can you tell us a little bit more um, about, you know, because you mentioned a couple things that y'all just said so much, my, my brain is firing. You know, Chico was talking about um, when he said billions of dollars, one billion, two billion, I imagine some people might've said, that don't sound right. Well, I just did a quick Google search and according to WGBH Boston, shout out to WGBH, um, article from this July um, mentions that in the, in the Boston Police Department, uh, it is the city's largest line item in the city of Boston uh, with approximately four with approximately four billion with the B dollar budget. Um, and then additionally, um, it looks like an additional 70 perhaps million dollars for overtime. And this is nothing against the Boston Police Department. We're not saying don't, I'm not, there's not a defund, there's not, there's not that there's not what we're talking about. But just to point out the uh uh the the funding allocations, right? You know, it, you know, I don't think I could be wrong. I don't think there's four billion dollars going to uh the Center for Gun Violence Prevention and and other folks doing the work on the ground in Boston. But I could be wrong. So, so Dr. Sachs, can you tell us a little bit more since you talked about what you're seeing in 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 the local area? Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about about that experience and and, and what's going <clears throat> on? Um, and and now that the audience has a general idea of what we're talking about, in case they're new to this conversation around violence prevention, and 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 um, thank you for challenging Senator Murphy earlier and and bringing this to the to the perspective. What do you see going on um, in your community in Boston? Thank you for that. And, and and you're not wrong. And again, you know, I think there's different ways where we think about partnering with law enforcement and we and we work with with closely in a lot of ways. But just what you're saying, I mean, budget priorities ref, should reflect our values and, and investments in, in how we think we move forward. And clearly, violence intervention work is underfunded. I I, I I don't. I haven't seen the Maryland and, and Illinois budgets lately, but I would I would I would I'm going to go out on a limb and say that they that they feel it too there. Um, and and that's just that's just across the board. And and what's great about that is that's a solvable, remediable problem, right? That's a solvable problem because the resources are are there as as we know. So I mean, in one way, it manifests in the hospital at, at Mass General Hospital right now. There, we have a violence intervention advocacy program. We call it VIAP. And Boston Medical Center here in Boston is um, has one of the leading VIAP programs. Um, I work with and learn from uh, my colleagues there uh, uh, so much. And we need to fund those programs at a, at, re, at absolutely the next level, thinking of what, what happens when people come in with a with penetrating trauma, with a bullet, b bullet injury. How do you take those sentinel events, that moment in somebody's life, which is, which is uh, traumatic and uh, horrific and could be a, a potential um, moment for change? How do we think about what, what gets wrapped around that person and their family during those times? You know, one thing that, that strikes me is when I mentioned it earlier, we talk and we count gun deaths in this country. And of course that metric is important, but really it's the tip of the iceberg of what we mean about the ripple effects of gun violence. And the ripple effects reverberate across families and across communities. So you have, we talked about gun deaths, we talked about injuries and people who, uh, who survive gun injuries and become our lifelong patients. But a gun doesn't have to even hit anybody to be traumatic. And when we think of our research group right now is doing work thinking about what are the effects of sleep disruption caused by gunshots going off at night. And it's not just a gunshot, it's a gunshot goes off and then the entire lights and sirens emergency response that goes with it. What does it mean that in Boston, one of the safest cities and one of the safest states, there's on average a couple of gunshots going off every day in our city. And that burden of trauma is not distributed equally across the city. There are some communities that are really disproportionately affected, communities of color disproportionately affected. It's true in Boston, around the country. And what does that mean? The, the, the young person whose sleep is disrupted, who then doesn't do as well in school the next day, those, those ripple effects of gun violence don't show up on a stat sheet anywhere. 
And really getting these narratives right, defining what gun violence means correctly, really matters. Because when the dominant narratives are wrong, when the dominant narratives evoke in people's minds gun violence means these mass shootings in schools, which of course are horrendous and way too common. When that's the only thing too many people think about when they think of gun violence, that means all the solutions and all of the funding goes towards, towards that. That means we get ridiculous solutions like we're gonna harden schools and harden our way out of this problem. We have to take that seriously on a national level, even though for any of us doing this work, know that for that to be the beginning and end of this conversation is unforgivable. What does it mean that 95% of public schools in this country do these active shooter drills? Because the young people I talk to, a lot are choosing not to go to school on the days of these drills when they're announced in advance. We have no evidence they work, but we really have an obligation and it's where a center like ours at an academic medical center can, can maybe add some value here in really quantifying and describing the potential trauma that we're causing to generations of kids by putting people through this day in and day out. All of that are the ripple effects of, of gun violence. And we've got to get that narrative, that story right, if we're going to be if we're going to be funneling our resources into the right types of solutions. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I want to go to, I want to shift from uh, from from the Boston area, and my understanding is that that Roca was founded in Massachusetts, right? And I and I want to shift on down to Baltimore and uh, go to you, JT. Um, you know, tell us a little bit. Let's drill down a little bit more um, into into your local community, um, and let's talk about uh, what 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 you're seeing um, and uh, and help enlighten our audience um, from your perspective of what's going on 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 the ground. Yeah, so uh, to Dr. Sachs' point, I mean, something really interesting about what she said about the, the lack of sleep. I just wanted to touch on that for a minute because I literally watched a study on the news this morning that talked about how people uh, at a certain age, like younger people can deal better with the lack of sleep than older people can, but it's because the, the patterns develop when you're young and they carry to when you're older, then you have chronic diseases that are connected to a lack of sleep. Right. You know, they said usually people, I think it was at age 50 or over when they have a, a, a sleep pattern where they're not getting enough sleep at night. They usually have two or more chronic diseases, high blood pressure, diabetes. Right. What communities do we know that those affect the most black and brown communities? Right. So it, it was funny to hear Dr. Sachs say that because I literally heard the study this morning about the lack of sleep and even just looking at what we see on the streets. You see this sense of desperation, this sense of survival. You see all these different types of things that people don't take into account. And all these things are systematically driven, right? And so when we think about the systems that are responsible for a lot of what we see that keep our people impoverished, that keep our people having to go through these cycles of violence consistently over and over again, Dr. Tillman is right. We got to start really figuring out how to challenge these systematic changes or help these systematic changes so that we can really address the root causes of it. We see the root causes every day, but they're always not going to look the same. They shift over time as desperation, as time shift. We've been in a pandemic. Young people rob, steal, and kill for different reasons than they did before, right? Some of it is survival. Some of it's about, you know, uh, uh, conflict or the lack of being able to resolve conflict. And some of, some of it is for, for gain or for self gain, right? But the point is that we don't have time to worry about making a judgment as to what reason they're doing it for, as opposed to just addressing the issues as to why we know that they do it, right? The root issues that, that drive it. So we're seeing more and more young people becoming involved in, in a lot of things that are happening in the streets. And I remember, um, you know, me and my friend, uh, me and, me and uh, Dante, uh, RIP, we're talking about this um, a couple of years ago when we first saw this, this epidemic of these, of these, of these uh, the, the pills. We start seeing a pill epidemic, ep epidemic start to pick up. And what we noticed was that it was a lot of young people involved in that, popping pills. And so we said, man, like, yo, this is going, we're going to see some major effects of this in a couple of years. And I'm looking back now when I'm seeing the lack of emotional regulation, how quick young people are to pull a trigger around conflict. You know, how everything is just so survival driven, it just reminds me, that it just points to the fact that I could almost pinpoint the day and time when I saw this coming. And I was like, whoa, we in, we in trouble, right? And we've never addressed those issues. Like you said, we, we should, these type of programs have to be viewed differently and have to be really a part of the ecosystem. So part of the problem is that we have to redefine the narrative. 
And we have to redefine what true collaboration means. True collaboration means that any people within our community that touch the well-being of our community should be working together, working together to make sure that our community thrives. Right? I don't care what area or what entity they come from. If you're in that community, we should be working together for the best interest of the common good of the people within that community. We look at collaboration in so many different ways that it keeps us just segmented and keeps us from really reaching the common goal, right? So what I see specifically with my young people is that they do want something different. We are failing with the systems that aren't wrapping around them to really help them achieve and realize something different because Dr. Tillman might be able to do a little bit for this 50 young people, or this 200 young people. I may be able to do a little bit for this 200 young people. To lead may be able to do something for another 50. Dr. Sachs may have 25, 30, 50 that she's doing something with, but that still doesn't equal up the total of young people that need to be served. Or this still doesn't equal up to the total damage or harm that's being done to that community that they come from and have to go back to each and every day. We miss a lot of the, we miss a lot of the, the we miss a lot of the, the most important things because we think about this issue in a, to in, a, in a totally wrong way, in my opinion, or we have been, right? And it's really about how do we change the narrative so that it is almost a after, they're not, not an afterthought anymore, it's almost a foregone conclusion that absolutely they should be included in the budget. Why, why would we not? That's the way we think about policing, right? But when you think about health disparities, when you think about food deserts, when you think about all these different things that plague our neighborhoods, and then young people go to school and they get labeled with ADHD. No, he doesn't have ADHD. He has a bad diet. He woke up this morning and ate a honey bun and drank a, a cup full of sugar and went to school. Of course, he's not going to be to sit down. You know what I mean? But we say that, that he has a, 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 a he has ADHD or something like it, Again, it's about the whole system. How do we address the whole system? That will, we, will we help make these changes that really affect the community at the root causes? When we start affecting the root causes, then you will start to see the work that we're out here doing that we're not going to stop doing regardless, but we're out here doing it. Then you will start to see the real effects because the generations behind the work that we're doing now will be healthier, will be in a better position to be able to really hold the position that we're trying to set for them, right? So it's a whole lot. Like it's a lot that's happening and a lot that's going on. But I, I really like I, I never thought doing this work that I'd be worried about health disparities and stuff like that. Like I just didn't realize how important it was to the work. Brain science, all this different type of stuff. I'm like, man, what, what does this have to do with people shooting each other until I knew? And then when I understood, I'm like, oh, this this is more powerful than anything I could ever message out there. This is really helps us understand where it comes from. And when people don't understand that, they label people incorrectly. Our, our kids have been labeled as their behaviors. They're murderers, they're robbers, they're thieves, they're all these different things. When that, they're, they're none of that. They're traumatized. They're traumatized and they're symptoms of the trauma that, uh, that caused them to exhibit certain behaviors. If we can't understand that and we keep demonizing them, then the systems will remain the same way that they are, right? We have to take a different approach, think about it a different way, change the narrative, and really bring systems together so that we can benefit the young people in the communities that are being harmed the most. Thank you so much for that. And, and you mentioned um, Dante, so I wanted to give a, a shout out and respect to, to Dante Barksdale. And any of you who don't know, you know, Google him. And um, it just shows, I just wanted to, to, since you mentioned him, I just wanted to just um, elevate that this work is dangerous. Right. This 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 work is 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 dangerous. And if there are people who are putting their lives on the line on a regular basis, literally out in the streets, stopping bullets sometimes with with with, with their bodies. Right. To, to try to to try to uh, bring about a positive change in the community. So when folks are when we hear some of the passion that people are talking about, um, sometimes I think it's it's difficult to kind of understand, like, why are they so mad or what's going on? Is because people are literally putting themselves on the line um, and 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 giving their giving the ultimate sacrifice, um, you know, without 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 the the honors, you know, that that our state, um, our st nation, state, um, government, state, and, and you know, uh, small s state um, uh, gives to folks. So I just wanted to just acknowledge that and lift up um, lift up Dante. Um, so I want I want to come to 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 Chico, Dr. Tillman. Um, you know, we, we've talked about what's going on in the grounds. 
um, in, in the Boston area. We talked about what's going on on the ground in the Baltimore area. You know, I want to I want to come to you and and get a, a perspective of the national scope and and just so folks know, um, you know, I'm, I've have some familiarity with with, with Chico's work, um, working with various different organizations, coalitions, advocacy organizations all across the country. So so I know Chico wanna be able to give us everything because he's just doing so many things. But I also want to give a shout out to um uh Ruth Zacharin and, and the Massachusetts uh coalition uh to prevent gun violence. Um because there's so many state um associations, organizations um who are who are doing work on the ground nationally that have been working with folks like Chico to change policy um not only at, at various state levels but but also at the federal level. Shout out to Ruth. So so Chico, um, you know, can you tell us a bit about what you're seeing from this national uh landscape in terms of policy regarding gun violence prevention? On the national, the national is a macro reflection of what's going on on the micro level. Um, the only difference is in some cities, they have a spirit of desperation and are more prog progressive and willing to try or invest in CVI. At the national level, even though we've made strides, um, considerable strides, let, let me say this, you know, and I want to shout out um, Susan Rice, the White House administration for um, not only listening to Black and Brown people and making an attempt to move the body of work forward with Help, we raised $2.4 billion nationally for people on the ground through ARPA dollars and another $250 million for um, groups over five years through DOJ, another $100 million. So $350 million. Now, what's interesting is in comparison to $25 million, period, Prior to that, they were only given 25 million at the federal level for CBI. That's insane. Wait, Chico, is that 25 per city? 25 million, period. Total. So you got to slice, take that 25 and slice it up. And okay, really, I just want to make, so make sure people understand what we're talking about. 20, you know what I mean? And the 25 million was only going to researchers. It was only a lot. And, and you can't even do research for 50 states, let alone cities, with $25 million. So really, you was getting high-level overviews of what might be causation. And it was, listen, man, until people can feel the problem, they are not going to move on the investment. Let me say this. What allowed us to expedite or get this funding now too is a perfect storm. COVID, which caused the spike, but also the mass shootings, which most other people in power could relate to because they could see it impacting them. When we had an onslaught of mass shootings in Atlanta, um, Colorado, at the beginning of the year, they was like, we got to do something. And that allowed them, us to be heard for the first time in a way that we haven't been heard, period. So it was a combination of things. And still, it's cities that don't give the proper resources to. CVI groups to do the work without putting nobody on the spot. It's cities where cataclysmic events happen like George Floyd, Breonna Taylor. They not, you would think cities like that would be like, hey, whatever you, example, Minneapolis. And I don't want to put nobody on the spot, 
but you know, cities will blow them up. But I have to be real. You would think with the George Floyd thing, the defund the police, all that stuff that came for, oh, they finna, they about to fund CVI in a way that's never been before. Three to four million for like 20 groups, 50,000 a piece to survive off of. After receiving almost a billion dollars at ARPA funding between them and St. Paul. So you begin to think like, how important is this, this problem to people who is not impacted, to people who believe they are safe within their silo community? And the answer is violence is fluid. That's what we learned about with COVID is that the way we were able to stop the COVID epidemic and what I'm proud of, even say, you know, people, whatever your thoughts about the history of America is your thought. What made me proud in America is that we all came together and was like, hey, we need y'all. Even the vulnerable communities, they say, hey, we need y'all. Even the CBOs got money for that. Because if we don't address this population that's hard to reach, we can't stop COVID. If we don't deal with these individuals at the highest risk, it's just going to keep, it's going to be circular, keep spreading. That's the approach we got to take with violence. That is fluid, that it's going to come, eventually it's going to come in our community because these individuals go to the show, they go to concerts, they go to sporting events, and you walk in right past individuals that's at the highest risk, but you're thinking that it can't happen to you. And what has happened is JT hit on something powerful with the use or the spike of hallucinogenic, these hallucinogenic drug or these, these ecstasy and popping pills. Now younger people are committing these atrocities in spaces that they never did before. That's the biggest difference from now in the night. Like now violence has happened, it's more spatial. People, cause that same person now is on a drug. He don't care, he see you, he'll shoot you right here. And what they don't understand is that endangers their families as well. The way to approach it is the same way we did COVID. Everybody, let's get on board and let's dismantle this problem. Because what I learned from COVID, we, de we defeated something that's invisible by getting everybody on board. But know what we did? And this is what really pisses me off. We were saying we was broke when Biden first got in. Remember? The country was like, this is, we're in a deficit. We might go in a recession. COVID happened. We found, even with um, Trump, we found trillions to stop it. Money wasn't even an issue because it was something that was destroying our country and people were dying at an alarming rate. The same thing is happening in black and brown communities. We, we, found, we find the money when we want to. What's a travesty is, and no disrespect to what's going on in Ukraine, we invest more money externally in Ukraine and more people are dying here in America. And for us to be some of the most brilliant people on the planet, that doesn't make common sense. More, people, more black and brown people are dying, as my sister just said, yearly in America than over in Ukraine. But we, when, when it happened in Ukraine, we sent billions over them but we grappling with we but look they voted down five billion over 10 years they don't even want to give black and brown communities that's trying to stop the violence 500 million for 50 states what I, I, I'm, I, so when you say what you know like we making strides but there's not near the level of urgency that it takes to really resolve it. And it's not a priority. People talking about it because what's happening is right now it's impacting influential communities, um, communities uh, that's on a different level as opposed to them impoverished communities. Affluent communities are, are like my sister talked about, Sandy Hook, Parkland, 
all these communities are when they impacted, they sent more. One, I, I, I talked to, I love, I tell you, I got a love for my people at Sandy Hook and my people at um, March for Our Lives. They told me when those incidents happened, more resources came into the community than the people could utilize. They had to turn some social workers, some, some clinicians, some um, first responders away because of the onslaught and outcry from America and the financial support. And then they even told the president and everybody else in Congress, more people are dying. This is happening at, this is happening every day in black and brown communities. The sad part is in Chicago, we have about 100 to 200 mass shootings, according to the CDC, a mass shooting is any shooting that involves four or more people a year. So when 17 people shot in Chicago, you know what happens? Nothing, because it's normal now. When 17 people shot in, in Baltimore, what happens? Nothing. This morning or last night, nine people were shot in Louisiana by Southern University. Is it all over CNN? No, because they say, oh, that's normal behavior. We can't look at it like that. And the, mm -hmm. and the resources are there. The resources are there. We can't support external things or environment and all these other things and neglect people. And I think once that begins to resonate on a national level, then we're going to see results. And we can't have politicians that care more about being aligned with the party than saving their, their constituents' lives. So, so Chico, I want to, you, you put a, a lot on this. This is always why I love doing stuff with, with Chico, Dr. Tillman, because um, cause he, he always give, he give, it's like you, it's like you get, go someplace and you, you get fed. You know what I'm saying? It's like, you know, Chico give you that old school style, like me to go to somebody's house and they feed you. And you'd be like, nah, I'm not hungry. He'd be like, okay, we'll take this plate. You know what I'm saying? You, Cause you can't, you know what I'm saying? Cause the food just be so, you'd be like, you gonna, you gonna eat. If you coming over to my house, you gonna eat. And so Chico, you, you giving us so much to think about. And I wanna contextualize some of the things that, 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 you, um, that, you, that you mentioned. Um, one is it's interesting uh, how you mentioned um, our foreign policy response um, with uh, what's going on in, in, in Europe with, with Ukraine. And um, something that sparked off for me when you mentioned that was um, how some of the national news media, I think it was, I, I think it was something on CNN that I may have seen um, where, you know, people said, uh, some of the reporters were saying, oh, well, you know, you wouldn't, you, you we're surprised to see something like this happen. In, in, in civilized society, right? That there are bombs going on, right? Whereas we know that bombs go off in countries all over the world, right? All the time. Um, juxtaposed to what you're saying, how we're looking at, oh, well, this is certain behavior is normalized in certain communities, but if it happens in another community, you wouldn't expect to see that in civilized society, right? I'm, I'm trying to draw a parallel between a way of thinking Right between a, between a, a, a mentality that whether it's on an international perspective or whether it's on a local perspective that has real impact for real human beings. The thing I want to contextualize to that point is when you mentioned shooting in certain neighborhoods, and now an issue becomes more prevalent in the news media. I remember when I think it was last year um, when there was uh, shots fired at the Nationals um, baseball game in D.C. And anyone who lived anywhere in the D.M.V. area, that's D.C., Maryland, and Virginia. You know, not even a stone's throw away, they'd be gun gunshots go off. And a matter of fact, before the stadium was built <laughs> in that area, gun gunshots would go off. But then when it became a thing, whereas, oh my goodness, this is going on in this place, like th there's a piercing of a sense of safety that happened that shifted people's consciousness in a different way, right? But why does it need to take that shift in consciousness for people to be concerned about 
their fellow human beings, just contextualizing what Chico said. Um, and then two other points I want to come to JT. Um, uh, the um, $5 billion that Chico mentioned was um, regarding the um, Break the Cycle of Violence Act. Um, it was, uh, I believe, a piece of legislation um, that is uh, 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 sponsored by uh, Senator Booker in the Senate and uh, Representative Horsford in the House, uh, which will call for $5 billion uh, for community violence intervention. I believe it passed the House, but not the Senate. It was supposed to be in the Build Back Better Act, but um, that did not pass. So when Chico mentioned they voted down to $5 billion. He's, I believe he's referencing um, the specific legislation. There's actually specific legislation that calls for $5 billion for community violence intervention um, that, was not, um, that, that was not passed. And then one more point about data and um, evidence. You know, Chico mentioned that Reddy has an RCT. RCT stands for randomized control trial, uh, which is a, a, a method uh, for um, uh, uh, measuring or evaluating uh, causality. Uh, uh, in other words, it's a way to ask, um, if we did this thing, did it cause this other thing to happen, right? And so you randomize things, um, you do things at random, and then you have a, a, a treatment group um, where you actually give them the intervention and the control group, you don't give them the intervention and see what the difference is. And it's used in medical science, um, and it's, it's, it's been tried to be used in the, in the social science area um, with some of our, with some of the violence intervention programs. Um, and I can talk more about the challenges behind that, around what is and what isn't evidence, because that's all what, that's used often as a way to not fund groups on the ground. Um, and um, Abby, if you could drop the link to my dissertation, I'm actually right about the um, uh, evidence-based policy in community-based violence prevention. And we can read about that and learn more about what is an RCT, what is not an RCT, and what is the implications for groups on the ground getting support. So I just want to contextualize some of those things. I want to come to JT and Dr. Sachs. Um, uh, so, and then folks get ready because we're going to shift into Q&A in, uh, in about 10 minutes or so. Um, we want to make sure that we get your questions in as well. Um, we've got folks on this audience. This is, you know, first of all, thank you, uh, Lisi. Thank you, um, uh, Rappaport Center, Boston College Law School, Boston College for hosting this event. So there are many people who are watching this call or watching this webinar now, or maybe watching in the future, who are either attorneys or aspiring attorneys or are somehow in the legal and policy field. We've talked a lot about funding and, and we know the money is needed. Um, but I'm wondering for those people who are maybe watching this and they came to this webinar because they're really interested in, in law and policy and the courts and that kind of thing and, and you know what's going on with, with uh, the Second Amendment. Um, and they may be wondering, wow, that all sounds really important. It all sounds really impactful, the work that folks are doing. But I don't know what to do from, from my perspective. Like, what can I do? Like, what role do I have to play in this? So, so JT and then, and then Hannah, if it, you know, I want to ask you, um, can you speak to the audience and maybe talk a little bit about um, what they can do, right? These these either these lawyers these, as, or aspiring lawyers, people in the legal and, and the policy fields, um, outside of funding, what can they do to have an impact on the work and support uh, what what you're doing? So it's just like 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 uh, Chico was saying when it comes to like Parkland and all those places, all these resources pour in, right? So much so that you can't even they, they had to turn some away. But when we think about this problem, people usually view it again, like Dr. Tillman said, it's something that's not going to affect me. So I'm kind of hands off, right? But it does. If it, it, when it lands on your doorstep, it's like, hey, what could I have done? The same way we, the same way we view ourselves as credible and experts in our field, and we use our platform and our voice to push our work, we need to align with people in other fields and other, other areas that use their voice to help our work move forward as well, right? And, and realize how, how marginalized this, this portion of work actually is, right? And we need people to really step up with influence, with voices, with, look, you, you're an expert or you're a celebrity or whatever in your own community or to your group of friends or to your pocket of people that you deal with, right? If you can help those people understand what it is, right? It's almost like an each one teach one. My biggest, my biggest goal this year, has been not to get upset by ignorance, but to use it as an opportunity to teach, right? 
and 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 I was at a national prosecutors conference uh, two weeks ago doing a presentation around CBI. What the heck am I doing at a national prosecutors conference? But I was there, right? And a guy basically called me an angry black man, right? And the look on everybody else's face was kind of puzzled. So it told me that he was way off base. But you said something earlier to lead that kind of made me think about it. You said that sometimes we get so passionate about the work that when people view us, they view us in the way that they typically just see us. Like, oh, you're angry and you're black, so you're an angry black guy. And, and I, my answer to him was literally, no, I said, you're part of the problem because you're labeling me something that I'm not. I said, I'm passionate about what I do. I'm passionate about what I speak about. We're talking about a, an incident that happened to a 16 year old boy that's probably gonna be traumatized for the rest of his life for being wrongly accused and incarcerated. And you're telling me that I'm, and you're gonna say that to me. So what if I was angry about it? Don't I have the right to be, right? So it's about using your voice, using your platform in whatever area you are to educate people about what's going on in black and brown communities because it may one day touch your doorstep. We see it starting to spread out into the, the suburbs. And like also, like Chico said, you got all these places now that are getting all this money and don't know what the heck to do with it because it ain't really been a problem that they don't had to deal with before, right? So it's really about how do we educate the masses about what, what this country really looks like or what the, thing, the changes that this country really needs to make to support the work. Um, but even if you can't look at it from a lens to support the work, look at it from a lens to how to support the safety of your family and the generations that come behind you. Because my biggest fear being uh, having uh, two, two young adult children in Baltimore City is not what they are doing. I fear that they could be caught in a crossfire just by simply riding or simply going somewhere doing their normal routine every day, right? And for the first time in my life as a black man, I feel unsafe. You know what I mean? And, and, and it's for different reasons, right? It's not because of the community that I feel unsafe. I'm used to that. It's because of everything else this country does that I feel unsafe because I know that the systems and things aren't in place to really protect us. So I encourage people who sit back and wonder like, how do I get involved? And Dr. Sachs, I love the fact that I have, I have been so fascinated by the fact that so many doctors are really stepping up and taking an interest in this type of work as to what happens with their patients afterwards. I've never seen this type of interest in a medical field really want to step up and say, well, what happens to that person when we leave? That started from somewhere. Somebody had that idea. Somebody started, somebody pushed that narrative and look what it's doing to the field. It's starting to change the field and the way doctors think about the work and the way doctors think about patients and like from the, from the ground up, we couldn't be more happier than to work with medical institutions and places like that who we know it can be difficult with our guys when they come in and injured. And if you don't know how to deal with them, you know, it, 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 creates, uh, it creates confusion or creates more problems. We want our guys to come back and get their wounds treated because we know that that prevents long-term health disparities. We want them to take care of their wounds and get the aftercare to follow up and connect with mental health, whatever resources that, they, that they are, to, are available to them, we want them to connect. The biggest misconception is that people don't think these guys want services, they need to know, they just have a lack of trust for systems. Yep. So people use their platforms to really help push the narrative that as systems, we have to change the way that we view violence and the way that we view you know, uh, the people connected to violence. And then we have to use our platforms also to push the narrative to, the, to your local government, your state government, your federal government, write letters to those senators, write letters to those local politicians about where you really, how, how you want this money to move into the communities to really help solve some of these issues that might one day land at your doorstep. JT, thank you for that. And you know, you, you, you've nailed it in, in so many ways, but reflecting on what you're just saying, I think one of the most important things for everybody listening is to figure out how to, in, inside yourself, reject the learned helplessness that the status quo depends on. And what I, what I really mean by that is that so often these, these tragedies happen, they capture media attention for a second, for a minute, they stop our country in our tracks very temporarily. People say something's, gonna ch something's gotta change. And then way too often it quickly shifts to, nothing's ever gonna change. DC can't fix my problems, there's nothing that can be done. And we need to change that language to, we are making things change. This is active and it takes all of us. And really the important work 
yes, we need national funding. Yes, we need all of those things in DC, but I don't look to DC to solve a lot of my problems. How do we do this work locally? I am convinced is, is one of the critical paths forward. And for that, all of us, especially everybody on this type of webinar, there is a place and work for you. And I wanna be really concrete about that. We have an, a collaboration right now that's, uh, that's with us, the Louis D. Brown Peace Institute, which is one of the most incredible organizations based in Dorchester, working to support survivors and people affected by murder and break retaliatory cycles of violence. And Emerson College, one of the country's leading uh, uh, colleges in media and arts and journalism. And we have a multi-year collaboration dedicated to this question of how do we change these narratives? How do we transform narratives of gun violence? You go to transformnarratives.org, you will see some of the work that's come out of this and find ways to, to, to get involved. Every single semester at Emerson right now, there's two to three courses going on, each partnered with community organizations, not kind of these one and done events where somebody gives and talk and leaves. No, these are survivors taking and teaching classes side by side with Emerson students and faculty with us from the hospital also involved. For example, Teen Empowerment, an amazing organization right now doing a gaming class with Emerson students and faculty and, and our hospital. We have a virtual reality course right now that's taking some of the resources that the Peace Institute has developed um, on their own because they felt like the medical system did not have the resources that work for them. And they're converting it into these VR platforms so that we can expand access. I mean, really interesting, innovative, because innovation is needed here, um, ways to think about how to bring whatever skill sets you have, because you have so many of them, and bring them to, to bear on this problem. We have to break, our, break down these silos that treat the hospital and legal system and community organizations as sort of separate entities. This is going to work or is working or will work, will work better as we, develop, as we build these collaborations. And there are ways for you to get involved there. The Mass Coalition, is, as uh, Dr. Hudson, as you mentioned, does great work getting on the, get on their mailing list because there's a lot of, of times where they need people to show up, make calls, and they'll and and they'll um, they offer a lot of guidance. So really rejecting that learned helplessness. It's hard. Panels like this are amazing. They're also heavy, and you can leave feeling like there's no way to take to take a first step if you can't tackle all of global poverty and the military industrial complex and every. You know, if you try to take on every single issue, it's hard to take that first step, but there are a lot of first steps. There's a lot of first local steps that, that, that can be taken. And I just really encourage everybody here to reject that learned helplessness that, that this issue gets way too often mired in and think about the local organizations that, that you could join up with or ours if you're here in Boston um, and, and really get to work. So thank you. I do wanna just uh, uh, see if there, what, Question during q and I'm only seeing, uh, there's some couple statements that I'm seeing. Thank you for those statements, but um, I wanna focus on the questions. And uh, I think in terms of some, one of the questions that I see is, I wanna stay with you, Dr. Sachs talked about it being heavy. Um, uh, this question is, every area needs, really needs to be taken. Medical, racial, impact on family, impact on our culture, we are becoming or are a, we are becoming or are a culture of violence. How can we go more deeply? How can we do more to transform our culture in media, life, games, et cetera? And um, you can like, take the Dr. Sachs or anyone, anyone on, our, on our panel can take it if they, if they choose. Thanks, I'll jump in for, for two seconds saying this is, what our, this is what our Transform Narratives of Gun Violence Initiative is about. Again, it's transformnarratives.org is literally about this question saying that we can't, uh, getting the narrative right in the media matters. People in communities that are most affected by this tell us time and time again that the media journalists only show up in their communities on their worst days. They only tell these headlines, these stories with sensational headlines about who was shot and none of the stories about what led to somebody ending up on both sides of that gun or on either side of that gun. None of the stories about the, the amazing resilience and the amazing events and amazing other work that's happening in those communities. And I think if people start to see those stories differently, it's going to lead to a real change. So again, come join us um, because we do need to change those dominant narratives in order for the solutions to 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 really start to flow and be and be funded. And it's across all of those elements. You know, I think it's 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 about how do we? That's what I was mentioning. A gaming course, literally. How do we have all of this this media at, at our disposal? All of this and 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 think about coming together in new ways to tackle this problem. Chico or JT, turn it over to you. Yeah, um, the thing, the thing that really um, makes me hopeful, because I don't want to make it seem like, is 
other cities, other countries around the world, which have taken the approaches we suggested, don't nearly have the challenges we have with um, gun violence. So there is hope. Um, it's just a matter of us. And I love how you um, eloquently said it, Dr. Stacks, on a local level, just coming together. Um, I think one thing we left out, um, the grant process created a culture that um, has often impeded collaboration, meaning it was competitive. It's only a certain pot of money available and the organizations within a city or community competed for those particular dollars to survive. So now with this new allotted resource where there's enough resources for everybody, the challenge isn't everybody getting the resources, it's being untrained of this competitive spirit and being convened or I'm gonna use a violent word, coerced by the funders into a more collaborative space. Because if you think about it in Chicago, Baltimore, Roca might not work well with Safe Streets because they both going for the same dollars. So they promoting the organization or the model as opposed to saying both of us need the money. So now that there is robust funding, we got to find ways to work together and complement each other. Um, I support, I'm support. i supporting Syracuse um, build out their system. And the challenge is, the biggest challenge I had in the beginning, and it's funny, everybody want to do street intervention or hospital intervention. And I said, listen, 10 groups can't do that in the same community. I say it's other things like victim services, um, trauma-informed care. I say it's other things that need to be done but they have been conditioned by what existed for so long that they think all of them have to compete for the same thing. And I, it's almost like on a baseball team, everybody can't pitch and back catch. Somebody got to play shortstop first, second, or it's nobody going to be in the field. And that's what we really got to move to. Like we got to get people to utilize their expertise and we got to get people willing to do other things to complement instead of compete with one another. And we gotta make sacrifices. Um, if I work with Roca or if I work with Safe Streets, if I collaborate with um, my sister, Dr. <clears throat> I can't come in and say, well, this is how I do it. And this is the way she, she might say, well, Chico, this is our approach. And I say, well, this is our approach. And we gotta find, we gotta find some, we got to compromise and can't be so immersed in this doctrine or this model where we can't move away from the way we normally do things. So, and the reason why this is so important, if it's going to take all of us, there has to be that willingness to bend in certain areas in order for the whole system to move forward. And that's what I would say for people on a local level. You take the good out of each organization and you move that forward and the expertise as opposed as one organization leading everything. And that's what we have been accustomed to in most cities. Whoever the city or the county or the community favors, everyone has to adhere to that way of doing things. And we have to really be amenable to what other people have to bring into this space in order so for us to collectively move the body of work forward. Hmm. JT, do you want to get on this question or should I move on to the next one? No, I just agree 100% with that. Like, you know, the silo days is over with. Like, I, I try to tell people all the time, like, look, we can continue to work in silos if we want to, but look what's happening in the streets. Are we getting anywhere with that? See, young people continue to die every day because the stubbornness of adults. But we want them to change their behaviors and we want them to do certain things that we ask them to do. But how good are we at actually modeling that behavior that we want them to do, the behavior that we want to see from them, right? So I agree with Dr. Tillman 100%. Like, 
That that's the biggest issue when you go everywhere. I call it blooming a million flowers. You fight for a million dollars for a housing program and and an intervention program and all this because that's what the grant said you had to provide. Knowing damn well you don't know nothing about housing. So why are you taking a housing grant? Just so you can get the money, right? No, 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 no. Why can't you refer a program that does housing, that you know does a good job at housing to that grant and let them take the money and you figure out how y'all collaborate on that, right? I mean, that's that's what it's really about. So I appreciate that comment because that's, that's where we are and that's where the work has to move. Like we really have to figure this out and really figure out how to break these silos and really learn how to truly be collaborators. And JT, I don't know your, your experience, but mine is it's also a lot more fun to do that work that way. It's a lot more interesting. It's a lot more creative. I know what medical people think. I, that's the world I was lived in and raised in. You know, I know it. When I'm all of a sudden in a meeting, I walk down to Emerson College, they have a class in color mixing there of literally like how to make film stuff. When you just learn this new language and new resources and new creativity that that is just is just out there in a city like Boston is we're a tiny city like we we can come together in in these interesting ways and we each have different values to add. Academia yeah. is set up to really help and and add value to some organizations, helping with some of that evaluative component that develops some of those metrics that can help get the grants and show that these unbelievably transformative programs are doing the transformation that we know that they are. We can like speak that sort of grant budgety type, you know, that, that grant type language. How do we come together? It, this work can be hard in, and, and recognizing that there's some part, there are some projects you start, you know, exactly where they're going when you, when you start doing this work the right way is nothing like that. It's putting together groups, organizations that have never been at the table together, putting them at the table. And I promise the creativity and the energy and the inspiration that comes is like nothing I've ever experienced trying to do this this work solo, sort of sitting there staring at some data set in my own office. It's it's an entirely different ball game, and it's really the the it's the way to do this work, and it's the way to be sustained. I think in doing this work over the long over the long haul. So we've got under ten minutes to go, under nine minutes to go. So I'm going to try to slide in two last questions, and then we can do our you know close out statements. Um, uh, so, so this is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Uh, yesterday was was Go Purple Day. I had on my purple tie yesterday. Now I have on my orange for gun violence prevention today. But um, oftentimes we talk about uh, gun violence. We talk about community-based violence interventions, gang violence, community violence intervention, whatever the terminology we want to use. Oftentimes, domestic violence is not is not included uh, in that conversation. Um, we can even split domestic violence, right? Because that's that in and of itself is an umbrella term. We've got you know intimate partner violence. We've got lots of different ways that violence happens inside the home. Um, and oftentimes people don't make the connection between the violence that happens inside the home connects to the violence that happens outside the home and the streets. So to to any of the any of the the panelists, um, is there anything that you can remark on the connection between? Um, this broad umbrella of domestic violence and this broad umbrella of community violence and where intervention plays a role. I mean, I think a lot of times we've been taught in this type of work uh, originally, like just based on street code, like a lot of that stuff you stay out of, right? You're like, yo, if it's, if it's you, don't, you don't get involved in that, right? But when you start doing the work and you start really understanding the violence, you know, and the effect that it has on people, the effect that it's having on the people involved, the trauma that, that people suffer as a result of domestic violence, street violence, however you want to, you know, whatever label you put on it, it, it's just as important to pay attention to that, right? Um, and, and, and I'll say in some instances, even more, because when it happens in the home, who knows behind, who knows who's behind those closed doors, what kids are seeing it. Right. The kids are seeing that type of stuff. So then they become they start normalizing abnormal behavior. They start thinking that that's the way that they're supposed to treat their spouses or, or you know, that's the way that things are supposed to go on with them when they get older. And then to the other part is that it spills out into the street. Those people have mothers. Those people have brothers, sisters. Those people have uncles. They have people who will act on their behalf if certain things happen. So, you know, one of the things that I really honed in on my staff was when COVID hit, I told them, look, we got to really pay attention to child abuse. I want y'all to really look, look for signs of, you know, really pay attention to when something's not wrong with a kid. 
and pay attention to domestic abuse because people locked in the house together, they can't go anywhere. And you know that, you know, it, it's going to happen. It's the same thing when it rains or when weather's bad outside, the incidents that happen inside go up, right? They just don't get as reported as much, but we know that they happen because you see the girl come up the house the next day with a black eye. Well, you know, she that didn't just happen for no reason. You know what I mean? Um, and so again, but it does play a, hu a huge role so what we've been doing is really trying to figure out how do we address that from the space that we share with the community. And we really start doing like family strengthening type activities, you know, like really uh, trying to bring families together to, to learn how to be families and, and learn how to, how to uh, fathers, help with young fathers learn how to, you know, be, be productive fathers in their households. Um, and then young mothers need support too. So how do we support the family? How do we support the family structure? without judgment, without all the things that we usually attach to the support, how do we just support that family structure to help the environment for any young person that we serve? Because we know that once we have them, we have them, but they got to go back home. So we want them to go back home into a stable, healthy environment. So how do we help support those environments? So we've been, we've really been trying to figure out ways to kind of address just what you've been saying around the domestic violence and around the, the, the intimate partner violence, um, because we've seen I don't know if we just seen upticks or we just been paying attention to it more, but it's definitely there and it does definitely spill out into the streets. The other thing I'll say lastly is that what people have to understand is that the landscape of violence is because of women to become much more involved in violence and not just as 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 uh, accessories, but as trigger pullers as being directly involved in, in this type in this type of thing. So I think that domestic violence is even more touchy on that end because you have more females who are actually prone to participate in violence in a way that we're just not used to. You know, we're not used to seeing a lot of female trigger pullers here anyway. Um, and so the landscape is shifting. So we just had to pay attention to it and figure out what's the best way to address these things and really help that family structure. I think one of the, one of the, Main th uh, one of the big things that we do in, at the hospital level is recognizing that doctors often were never taught to talk to patients about firearm safety and 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 safe gun storage and many many of those elements that are clearly relevant. Intimate partner violence is one. Somebody experience in a relationship experiencing intimate partner violence is many times more likely to end up dead if there's a gun in that home compared to if there isn't. And then that's important when you're a doctor seeing a patient and thinking about what that person's experiencing and what their what their risk might be. And it's just another way, another example of, of a topic where talking about this issue, talking about access to, to, to guns is directly relevant to, to people's health. I do a lot of my own research in suicide prevention in older adults, another population where we have to do better about thinking about how as clinicians we talk about guns in the home and what that means to, to safety of somebody, for example, who, who may have just been diagnosed with cognitive impairment or dementia and what it means to be aging with guns at home. And I just bring that up as just other ways where, again, the reality, the clinical reality on the ground of, of trying to take better care of the person right in front of you is so different and so divorced from the, the, the really uh, way too shallow national discourse around this issue that it all really comes back to how do we take better care of the person right in front of us in the community that, that they're in. And I think that's true across, across a range of issues. And intimate partner violence is certainly a, a, a critical one. All right. Um, 30 seconds or less next, on this next question, and then we'll go to closing statement. 30 seconds or less. Um, since you talked about things being heavy, um, what's one thing, or you can do more than one, whatever, just try to keep it brief, um, that we can celebrate, right? We, we know a lot, you know, we talked about some, a lot of heavy stuff on this call. We, we know a lot about what, what needs to be done and the work that's being done, but, but, but what, what can we celebrate? I don't want the last word, so let me jump in first. I, it, it's things like this. It's a group like this coming together, having a physician with people doing the work on the front lines in, the, in, in community organizations with a bunch of lawyers. An event like this would not have happened six years ago. I'm just telling you that the space is changing. Six years ago, when I was doing this work, you're trying to convince people that this issue matters and is important and that they should, they should care and be interested. Now people buy that. 
people know that and they're interested in the next question of what are the next 10 words? What do we, what do we have to do? How, what are the interventions that are gonna work? And that work is harder, but it's a lot more interesting and it's the right work. And I am, I celebrate that we're in that space of really coming together like this, trying to do the work. Yeah, I, I could go. Um, I celebrate the progress, um, the learning, um, the movement, um, and really more, the most important thing, I celebrate the people, man. It warmed my heart when I see people um, just dedicated to saving other people's lives and caring about our community in a way um, that I could never imagine. It feels so good. A lot of people say they feel alone, but when you meet people from all over the country that care just as much about you, working just as hard as you, um, you it gives you a feeling that's indescribable. Yeah, I think I had to echo the same thing. I mean, and that was my original thought <coughs> honestly, before they even said anything. It's like, I really feel like I just, I feel like we got a, a real shot now. You know what I mean? I feel like we have an honest opportunity because of the doc, Dr. Chico Tillman's been in rooms that we aren't in, but he can be in rooms and I'm going to, I trust that he's going to say what I probably would have said if I was in there, right? The Dr. Hudson's doing the research side of things that really understands the issues and really has seen it and understands it in a way that I know we wanted to be represented in the rooms that you're in, right? Dr. Sachs, just hearing about your work, just understanding like, even from the medical side, you understand it the way that we would like and would probably speak the way that we want to be represented in those rooms. I think that's what's exciting is that we really have an opportunity to be at tables through different entities that we just haven't been invited to before, right? And, and, and be able to really spread the work in a different way. And I'm just excited for the opportunity to really, uh, really see where this goes. Because as bleak as things may seem, as long as we, we wake up each and every day, and as long as one kid did something different today than he did yesterday, then I'm gonna take that as a success. And I'm gonna keep driving off of that each and every day because it looks different for every single one of the kids that we work with. So, you know, I'm just excited for the opportunity to continue to work. Excellent. We're just past time. Um, any, uh, all right, and, yeah, and I'm, getting, I'm getting the signal. So thank you so much. Um, if I could go, you know, Hannah, Chico, JT, Thank you so much. Thank you, um, Lissy. Thank you, Abby. Thank you, Rappaport Center, Boston College uh, Law School um, for, for having us um, and for having this wonderful conversation. And now we'll turn it back over to you, Lissy. So I want to say thank you really from the bottom of my heart. And there are so many comments that I want to say, but the first is I am so inspired by the work you do, by the tireless passion you give to all this work and say that what I really heard though is the frustration, Chico, really resonating about from all of you, the need to change the narrative, the need to change the, I think you phrased it, the ecosystem so that the services, the staff, availability, the resources just money, and the media coverage really focus on trauma and trauma-informed situations and the lifelong effects. I mean, I really heard the what it means for kids to not be able to sleep, what it means for their lives to go to school tired, hungry, to have seen domestic violence, in their home and to have seen gun violence on their street. I heard the Senator this morning talk about his meeting with seventh and eighth graders who all they wanted to talk about was their walk to and from school and the fear with which they leave their houses. So I, I wanna say, please don't end the conversation here with us, keep, me informed what can we i work at a law school here in newton massachusetts counts as boston what can we do to help continue this conversation and to help with the holistic view which is what everybody has talked about for the last 90 minutes the community collaborations and the 
elevating the platforms and all the voices that need to be shared to affect change. On the ground, in the state, local, and federal governments, there's so much to do. But the note I want to end on is hope, the hope that you actually resonate, that you bring to this conversation by the work you're doing and by the commitments of really your life's journey that you bring here. So honestly, thank you for what you do. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back. Our final panel of the day brings together an incredibly arrest, impressive array of lawyers, including a public official, the mayor of San Jose, California. All of these lawyers are creatively bringing forward and implementing gun safety and gun regulation strategies to help communities and victims of gun violence. Our moderator for this panel is Gary Klein. I'll introduce Gary and he'll introduce everyone else. Gary is a nationally known lawyer with decades of experience in consumer protection, civil rights, class action practice, and regulation of firearms. In addition to his background as a consumer protection advocate and litigator, Gary is a longstanding advocate for gun safety regulation. The Violence Policy Center recently published his report on the need for federal oversight of gun safety. That report is called Misfire, the gun industry's lack of accountability for defective firearms. He used to be a former assistant attorney general in Massachusetts, my old personal stomping grounds. And there Gary was responsible for overseeing civil enforcement of the state's assault weapons ban as well as other gun safety laws. He's also the main author and editor of Shattered the Gun Accident Journal, which is a daily record of unintentional shootings. Their journal augments published data on unintended shootings by providing stories that illustrate the tragic consequences of inattention to gun safety. There are now more than 500 reports in the journal archive. Gary, thank you for agreeing instantly to moderating this panel and for helping me get Allah on board. So I turn it over to you and thank you all. Thank, thank you very much, Lissy. I um, think it's gonna be hard for us to follow two such excellent panels this morning. Um, and um, I really think you did an excellent job pulling this whole conference together. I want to say for myself that um, while I understand the reasons we have to do these things on Zoom, I do miss the opportunity to be together with everyone and the learning that goes on simply by being in the same room together. And hopefully in, in future years, we'll be able to come together in person. Um, I am first going to introduce the other panelists. And then I have a, a short presentation to make myself um, followed by presentations from each panelist. Well, then. Uh, take questions. Uh, mayor Sam Licardo of San Jose, California, serves in his second term as mayor of the 10th largest city in the United States, having recently won re-election with 76% of the vote. During his tenure as mayor, uh, Licardo launched a smart city vision aiming to make San Jose America's most innovative city, in part by bridging the digital divide. He launched the nation's first digital inclusion fund, to provide broadband access, devices and skills to low-income families. And by 2020, the city's efforts with community partners have connected more than 100,000 low-income San Jose residents with free broadband. He has also led efforts to fund the construction of thousands of units of affordable housing, launched the nation's first and largest community choice clean energy utility, provided jobs to more than 4,000 teens living in gang impacted neighborhoods, launched multi-billion dollar investments in new transit and preserved thousands of acres of open space and hillsides from, de from development. Prior to uh, his service in elected office, uh, Mayor Licardo served as a criminal prosecutor at the federal and local level, prosecuting cases of sexual assault and child explo exploitation. Mayor Licardo is a graduate of Georgetown University, Harvard Law School, and Harvard University's John F. Kennedy School of Government. He's gonna to speak uh, today on local action to combat gun violence. 
Our second panelist is Josh Koskoff, who is uh, the lead lawyer at Koskoff, Koskoff and Beter. Mr. Koskoff represents the third generation of Koskoffs leading that firm, and he continues the family tradition of dedication to representing individuals against powerful opponents in challenging cases. He achieved a historic victory on behalf of nine families of the Sandy Hook school shooting against the manufacturer and marketer of the AR-15 assault rifle used in that shooting, settling the case for $73 million and securing the rights of the families to make discovery documents public. Koskoff also represents Sandy Hook families in a suit against controversial talk show host Alex Jones for profiting from false claims that the shooting was a hoax. In 2019, Josh filed another groundbreaking suit against Harvard University over its theft and possession of images of an enslaved man named Renty. Koskoff has received numerous awards and recognition for his work. He believes strongly in the role of law as an agent to improve his clients' lives and views the law as only working when it works for, uh, for all people and not just the powerful. His topic today is using predicate statutes to hold the gun industry accountable. Our third speaker on this panel is Ala Lefkowitz, who is Senior Director of Affirmative Litigation at Everytown Law. Ms. Lefkowitz directs Everytown Law's National Affirmative Litigation Practice, bringing impact litigation aimed at preventing future gun violence. Her work includes representing survivors of gun violence against reckless gun industry actors, as well as representing community members and businesses impacted by dangerous gun lobby-backed laws. Lefkowitz's work uh, challenges state and federal gun industry immunity and secrecy laws that infringe, on, that infringe on the rights of gun violence victims to seek justice in court. Ms. Lefkowitz is a graduate of Duke Law School and Claremont McKenna College. Her topic today is holding the gun industry accountable in court, avoiding pitfalls and setting yourself up for success. So I wanna talk briefly about restoring regular, regulatory oversight of gun manufacturers and gun retailers. I admit to a certain level of pessimism and expect that there will be a significant chilling effect on regulators um, based on the Bruin decision. I think that, that legislators are very likely to, um, uh, um, high, uh, to pull back in terms of aggressive new legislation and I think that as they do craft legislation, it will be uh, more targeted and probably weaker um, out of a fear of the litigation that would follow based on the revised standards in, um, uh, in Bruin. Um, I also wanna just briefly remind people that the uh, gun violence problem is not a single unified problem. There are several components um, which overlap. Um, one significant, issue obviously is intentional shootings and community violence. Um, there are, is also a significant and growing problem of gun suicide. And third, there are unintended shootings. Um, my work has generally been focused on the last area, unintended shootings and what we um, used to call accidents, but now are cautious about calling accidents because of the belief that most of these shootings are preventable. Um, what I do is I, I pick up stories from local media and aggregate them, publish them, categorize them for use as uh, anecdotes in uh, advocating uh, for gun safety. Um, and hopefully my blog is, is useful to advocates who are um, working to um, uh, communicate with their legislatures about uh, specific problems in, in um, gun violence. Um, my consumer protection perspective comes from having worked for 10 years at the National Consumer Law Center, and then for another 15 years um, uh, litigating consumer protection issues, uh, including issues of, of gun violence and discovering how difficult it is to address gun violence. Many of you know, but probably not everyone, that uh, uh, guns are the only uh, dangerous consumer product that are fully exempt from federal consumer product safety regulation. So what that means is that the, the responsibility for oversight of gun designs and for gun safety and to make sure that uh, guns don't have dangerous defects is left entirely in the hands of the gun industry. And what they do um, is limit 
any kind of evaluation of gun safety to uh, an organization um, that shares space with the gun industry's marketing arm um, so that the marketing and gun safety um, uh, functions of the gun industry are effectively joined. Um, they're in the same building, which ironically is in Newtown, Connecticut, um, right up the street from where Josh practices. Um, so in, prepare, in, in pulling together the blog, um, what I'm doing is, is identifying stories that appear only in local media about things like children finding guns in their home, loaded guns, and using them to commit self-harm, um, either by suicide or because um, they don't understand what they're doing. And you know, almost every week, a child under five years old finds a gun in their home and shoots themselves. Um, you know, one of the responses to those kinds of stories is obviously that we need effective child access prevention laws, as well as uh, safe storage laws. And um, I think that we're all um, interested in making sure that parents store guns in the home safely and unloaded, um, but we fail to ask an important question, which is how is it that uh, uh, gun, guns uh, can be fired by a child as young as two years old? Why isn't government stepping in to regulate gun design so that children can't uh, fire a gun. Um, another issue that comes up all the time, almost every week in, uh, in, in the blog are teenagers who get access to a gun either by finding it in their family home uh, or by uh, stealing it from a car. And kids so often when they find a gun really don't understand how to use it. And almost every week, there's a story about kids who um, shoot each other by accident at parties while handling a gun. Um, what uh, many kids don't understand is that not every gun has what's called a, a manual disc, uh, 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 magazine, excuse me, a magazine safety disconnect, meaning that um, kids will typically think that if they take the magazine out of the gun, it's safe and there's no round in the chamber. Um, most guns these days are manufactured without such a disconnect. And when the uh, magazine is taken out, the gun uh, will still be loaded with a round in the chamber and the trigger, uh, if pulled, will fire that round. Um, at the same time, guns less and less have effective um, uh, um, loaded chamber indicators. So it's harder and harder for uh, uh, an untrained individual to know for sure whether or not the gun is loaded. There's nothing that indicates to um, somebody who's using a gun for the first time whether or not it's loaded. And so incredibly, there's a, almost every story about a, a gun accident includes an allegation that the shooter uh, asserts that they had no idea that the gun was loaded. Um, and then there's stories every week about self-defense gone wrong. I mean, people have this misplaced notion that uh, owning a gun makes them safer and allows them to defend themselves, their family, and their home. And what they don't understand is that self-defense is a tricky thing and a very difficult judgment call even for experienced uh, gun owners. And so what you see are stories about people who shoot through the door when someone's jiggling the handle. It turns out to be their child who snuck out the window and was coming home late at night. Or people shoot family members who get up in the night and are walking around the house because they, you know, want to make a cup of tea, um, and and you know it 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 would it it is these stories are so common that um, one would think they should be part of the national narrative about guns that they should be something that's taught um, in gun safety courses so that people understand the risks they take on by uh, having a gun in their home. So I I think there are three forms of regulation that really should be a focus of advocacy. Um, for in, in every state. Um, some states have them and others don't. Um, one is meaningful gun safety training aimed particularly at new gun owners. Um, I think we've disengaged as a community of uh, people interested in gun violence prevention from things like safety training on the basis that we don't wanna advocate for anyone to have a gun. I think the problem we all face and that we see every day is that many people are gonna want to get and will acquire guns no matter how we feel about it. And I think we have an obligation to engage as regulators and as a community in making sure that those people are properly trained before they own a gun. 
I personally took the Massachusetts gun safety training class um, uh, when I first started working on issues of gun safety in the attorney general's office. And the first half hour of that training were NRA videos. The first video was to encourage people to buy uh, the NRA's insurance policy. The goal of that policy is to let you know that if you fire your gun in self-defense and you're charged with a crime, the NRA will, um, under this policy, pay for your defense. Um, a very negligible potential insurance benefit, probably fraudulent, something that was challenged in New York. Um, but this was being treated as the number one issue in, in gun safety. The second video was the, an NRA video about the importance of all gun owners joining the NRA. And after that, the gun safety rules discussed were limited to the NRA's gun safety rules and were not at all comprehensive. Um, I think that as regulators, it's time to seize control of these uh, training cu curriculums to make sure that they're robust, to make sure that they include training about safe storage, that they include training about the importance to new gun owners of learning how to use whatever gun they may choose to purchase, uh, of the risks of using a gun in self-defense, of the risks to family members of firing a gun simply because you think an intruder is present in the home, the risk that guns can penetrate walls so that if you're using the gun in self-defense, there's a risk that you're going to fire it and it's going to go off and hit one of your children while they lie in bed. All those things should be part of any meaningful gun safety class. And then last, I think it's really essential that we show gun owners the importance of having a gun with safety features, of the importance of having a loaded chamber indicator, of having a magazine safety disconnect, and probably most importantly of having a, um, um, a proper and effective gun lock. Um, I think we need as regulators to um, consider making sure that gun lock safety standards are adequate. I have um, many times demonstrated that the gun locks that are approved here in, in Massachusetts and the ones approved in California can be cut with a heavy scissor. They can also be picked with a, with a bobby pin in less than a minute. So, you know, if we're going to insist on safe storage, it really should be safe. And that means regulating um, what kinds of locks and what kinds of safes are uh, marketable and, and useful. Um, and then we need, obviously, um, to make sure that manufacturers are regulated in a way that the, they're doing proper testing of guns to make sure that guns aren't defective make sure that they aren't being made of cheap materials that uh, um, lead to defects, um, to make sure that they won't uh, fire when dropped, to make sure that the guns won't fire without a trigger pull, as many Remington rifles did for 40 years before the issue was addressed in a class action lawsuit. Um, all of these things are part, I think, of uh, the, the regulatory responsibility for public safety and, and really need to be Seized on, uh, seized again, um, so that the, there are uh, parents in the room and and uh, regulators who are making decisions about what is and isn't safe for the American public. Um, I'm going to turn the program over to Mayor Licardo, uh, who again is going to talk about local initiatives to prevent gun violence. Thank you, Gary. Actually, uh, really appreciate. The, uh, your presentation, I learned quite a bit myself. Um, I, I was introduced as one of the lawyers, but I should preface it by saying I'm a recovering lawyer uh, and quite certainly the least knowledgeable of these uh, four uh, in, in legal issues. But for some reason, I keep finding my way uh, back into litigation over gun issues. Uh, I'm the mayor of the city of San Jose, and we've been working on several local regulations that have been uh, capturing the attention, certainly of attorneys in the gun lobby, uh, as well as others, um, and really <clears throat> wanted to sort of start where Gary left off around uh, gun safety involving unintentional shootings, because I think there is a lot of opportunity for local regulation to play a role here. Um, and, you know, I, I should preface it with the recognition, or I guess the admission of sorts, that in some ways we've lost a battle here to prevent um, the widespread um, proliferation of guns in our country. We now are at 
roughly 400 million and counting. Uh, while there are many well intentioned and sensible restrictions on gun purchases uh, that either exist or should exist. And frankly, there are a lot more that should exist that don't. Um, the reality is that uh, we have really lost the battle to prevent the rise of the shoreline. We now have an ocean of, of 400 million guns, and we're left to really figure out how to regulate in a country uh, with 400 million guns where guns will simply get in any hand. Um, and so for us at the city of San Jose, we focus an awful lot, certainly on a variety of measures, including gun violence restraining orders and uh, and uh, opportunities to uh, reduce straw purchasing at gun stores, for example. But um, the two uh, initiatives that have caught the most attention and certainly the most litigation <laughs> uh, involve insurance and gun fees. And I'll start with insurance since it really relates most of what Gary's referring to involving unintentional shootings. We now have, what, five to 600 unintentional shootings a year that result in somebody going to an emergency room. Um, we know that, uh, I'm sorry, I believe the number is 25,000, excuse me, 500 to 600 deaths. Uh, I should have uh, should have qualified that, but more than 25,000 injuries. Um, so we know this is a very widespread safety issue. Uh, Certainly, there are many cities like ours that mandate uh, safe gun storage in the purchase of gun safes. Uh, we have no ability to regulate that, and we recognize the limitation of governments to simply intrude on homes to make sure people are doing what they ought to be doing. Uh, so we think insurance is a viable path, and on January 1st, we're going to be the first city or, or jurisdiction in the country to require uh gun liability insurance. And uh, the good news for gun owners is it's relatively easy to get. Many of them have it without knowing it. Uh, some can get it simply by calling their insurance company and asking to expand the policy or uh, at a very minimal cost, purchase a rider, but it's for the most part free if you have a renter or homeowner's policy. Uh, and what we're trying to address uh, is the reality that, that Gary described. Four and a half million children live in a home where a gun is kept loaded and unlocked. And we think an awful lot can be done about that risk, whether it's a gun safe or a trigger lock or uh, a chamber load indicator or, or a host of other measures, certainly gun safety classes. And um, insurance companies have a way of incentivizing that safer behavior. We've seen it in context, certainly, of automobiles where we've seen uh, deaths per mile uh, dramatically reduced by about uh, 80% over the last five decades because insurance companies and, frankly, uh, litigators <laughs> have been incentivizing uh, both manufacturers of cars as well as drivers uh, to be uh, driving in cars with anti-lock brakes and uh, inflatable bag uh, airbags and, and, and to be getting, you know, good driver safety discounts. This is all the magic of uh, premium discounts. And what we are hoping is that by really drawing the insurance companies into the industry uh, to ensure that there is some uh, uh, some amount of engagement by insurance companies uh, that eventually we're going to see uh, the kinds of incentives through premiums that will induce safer behavior. Now, obviously, this isn't going to magically work uh, one city doing it in, in, in a nation as large as ours. We have about a million residents. We recognize there's a few hundred million uh, we need to try to keep safe. But we're hoping that uh, if we can get through uh, this uh, immediate period, and I'll describe what we're doing now in terms of litigation, uh, if we can get through the litigation, uh, as I expect we will, uh, that other cities will be joining it. And certainly the state of California, we've seen proposals for, uh, certainly legislative proposals come forward, most recently from our budget chair in this state, uh, we've seen it now in New Jersey and other states as well. We'd like to see this spread throughout the country uh, so we can really engage the insurance companies meaningfully in the insurance industry. Um, in terms of the litigation, where we're at right now is that U.S. District Court has dismissed nine of the 10 claims that have been brought by two gun groups uh, that are suing the city over this. A third has withdrawn its, its suit. Uh, they may be refiling. We expect this is very early on in the litigation. We expect they will refile many of those claims uh, within minute complaints uh, and we'll continue to litigate. Uh, but preliminary indications are, are good. What we're seeing in the language of the district court's opinions is that they recognize as long as 
Uh, the laws are not depriving anyone of their gun. Um, we're not taking anyone's gun away. Uh, that this should be able to survive Second Amendment scrutiny. Now, obviously, we're just at a district court level, and we know the fights at other levels as well. But so far, so good. I'll say that. Um, then this other issue I really raised was around fees. And <clears throat> while gun insurance will be implemented in our city in January 1st, fees will take a few months later as we're working out some of the regulatory specifics. But uh, the current plan is that we impose a roughly $25 fee on every gun owner in the city of San Jose. And those fees would be used by a nonprofit foundation to invest in violence prevention initiatives. And that would range from everything from domestic violence reduction suicide prevention, mental health services, gun safety programs, a whole host of things. And uh, we would expect that these dollars would be targeted in those households, those families, where a gun is owned, because all the data is very clear that if uh, there is someone who has suicidal ideations, if there is domestic violence happening in the home, whatever the challenge might be, it all gets much, much worse if there's also a gun in the home. Uh, and the data is overwhelming. Uh, the risk is 5x, 20x, uh, depending on the study of, of death, if there's a gun in the home while all this is happening. And so we think by targeting mental health services, domestic violence prevention, so forth, in those homes where guns owned, we can actually do something to reduce gun violence. Now, obviously, neither of these solutions are the elixir we all need. Uh, these are just two more tools. We need a much bigger toolbox. Obviously, it would be helpful to see Congress more deeply engaged. Uh, but until we see that happen, we saw some modest success certainly over the last year um, with the signing of the bill in, in, in June. Uh, but uh, until we see much more proactive work at the, at the national level, we'll continue to push at the local level. And I think there's a lot of mayors who are going to be quite eager to jump in as soon as they see that we've survived legal uh, challenge. So anyway, I look forward to learning more in this conference and appreciate the, the time. Thank you, Mayor. Josh? Well, thank you. Uh, and I've already learned quite a bit from the two of you, and I'm sure to learn more from Ala, who I've already learned from over the years. Um, you uh, each talked about important aspects of this problem and how difficult the uh, problem is and intractable, and how the normal levers of government are, just aren't in play uh, for this industry. Uh, that they are for other industries. Uh, Gary talking about the restraints on consumer protection uh, that would normally look out for all of us uh, that aren't there for the gun industry. And uh, certainly the problem that there are 400 million guns out there. Um, one way uh, to engage in at least uh, the uh, those that underwrite this industry is, uh, if not the industry itself, is through lawsuits. Um, and uh, the that's the that's sort of my area here would be to explain to folks uh, what are the legal uh, possibilities to hold the gun industry accountable. And um, I came to this sort of naive, blissfully so, because when I saw the case laws out there uh, that was out there and the, the law that was out there, it was it was pretty uh, overwhelming and sobering. Um, but. Uh, I'm here to say that it is possible to hold a gun uh, industry accountable for their uh, marketing and other uh, negligence and, and recklessness, just like other, other industries. Uh, but uh, many of you may have heard of a so-called immunity from lawsuits for the gun industry. If you've heard about that, that most likely refers to the Protection of Lawful Commerce and Arms Act. Uh, which was a gift, in essence, by Congress in 2005 to the gun industry that uh, she was seeking because uh, it was the, the industry was afraid uh, not of losing lawsuits per se, but simply of the cost of defending lawsuits. And it tells you something when an industry is worried about its own solvency because of their fear of having to defend from lawsuits uh, that arise from the harm that their products cause. Uh, and, and so you, it begs the question as to the utility of such an industry and the, the degree to which it, it, you know, it impacts our lives if they can't if sustain the industry without 
by by having to defend these lawsuits. So that when I learned that it, it was pretty uh, eye opening. Um, what you need to know is that the Protection of Lawful Commerce and Arms Act does not protect unlawful commerce and arms. And there are uh, exceptions that I'm sure Alla will speak about a little bit as well. Uh, some of the exceptions are in somewhat in name only, but one of the exceptions that we uh, look at when looking at a potential gun case is called the predicate exception. And it pertains to what I just said, which is that Congress was willing to give the industry somewhat of a Christmas present or holiday present uh, by putting its thumb on the scale of on the side of the industry in lawsuits, but it wasn't willing to let uh, gun industry uh, skate on unlawful conduct. And so when you're confronted with a mass shooting, as I was in the Sandy Hook case and have been since, uh, we look at the law to see if any of the laws were broken uh, in the particular case and found some traction in a couple areas. One is in the area of consumer protection laws uh, that Gary spent his whole life uh, in the trenches working with. Um, and and every, law, every state has some type of consumer protection laws. Some states allow for uh, those, for third parties injured through uh, violations of a consumer protection law to bring a lawsuit, so they're standing. Other states require there to be what's called a business relationship between the wrongdoing of uh, uh, industry and the consumer. So if you bought an Apple computer uh, and Apple engaged in wrongdoing, you could sue Apple. But if you were a third party to that, you know, that uh, relationship, you couldn't. Uh, so, but in, in Connecticut, at least, uh, we established that third parties could bring a lawsuit for misconduct and violation of consumer protection laws uh, in which they were not uh, part of the original consumer relationship. So um, we, uh, we established in the Remington case that the marketing, uh, which many of you have now seen, uh, which promoted lone gunman assaults by young men and, and really targeted uh, uh, children and teenagers to promote their weaponry to, uh, for the purposes of uh, violent acts, promoting criminal use, was a violation of the unfair uh, of the Consumer Protection Act of Connecticut. Uh, that was the easy part, and then proving the relationship to the shooting is done through uh, more uh, for, for those lawyers out there, you know, by experts and by drawing inferences in the factual scenario. So we were able to link the shooting uh, substantially to the unlawful promotion. Uh, but you have to get very creative here. Uh, we did file another suit uh, in the Las Vegas shooting. In Las Vegas, uh, eight uh, gun we sued eight gun manufacturers uh, who were the manufacturers of 12 AR-15s used in the shooting, uh, which was the most lethal shooting in American history. Uh, all of these weapons were equipped with bump stocks. Bump stocks uh, are what we said was a simple modification of an existing AR-15, which uh, transformed the AR-15 from semi-automatic to automatic uh, fire. Automatic fire has been outlawed in the United States, in essence, since 1934, uh, in what's called the National Firearms Act, which was really came about because of the concern, the, the very serious concern for public safety uh, from uh, automatic weapons, notably the Tommy gun, that was being used by gangsters like Al Capone and Pretty Boy Floyd in what constituted big massacres back then, but by today's standards were almost uh, modest. Uh, four police officers in one uh, mass shooting, seven gang members in another mass shooting. And that was enough for Congress uh, of, and both sides of the aisle to come together and say, enough is enough, we gotta get rid of these things. They're, they're too deadly for our streets. Um, and uh, the NRA actually participated in helping define that weapon out of uh, out so that they could ban it effectively. They actually taxed it, but it had the same effect. Uh, they taxed it basically into oblivion. And uh, so all, and even even Colt got on board. So there was a different consensus back then that public safety was to be taken into consideration. Notably, what we learned in that uh, case was that the Tommy gun, while certainly a lethal weapon, is not nearly as lethal, uh, I mean, as the as a semi-automatic AR-15, which was chosen by the military in Vietnam 
over the Tommy gun in field testing uh, across the board. So what we have is the readily available AR-15 in semi-automatic mode in the US to anybody in some states over 18, uh, which is uh, you know, more lethal, exponentially more dangerous than the Tommy gun, which is universally thought to be too dangerous for our streets. So that's a little bit of a, a contextualization of, of what an AR-15 is. And I know I'm getting well off track, but there's a lot of downloading here. So anyway, in essence, what we said in the in the uh, because we're trying to we're trying to find a, a unlawful act that is in violation of a state or federal statute applicable to the sale or marketing of firearms. That's your goal when you're looking at a, especially a mass shooting case. And what we said, and I think is true, is that the bump stock, because it is a simple modification, transformed a semi-automatic weapon into automatic fire, making the whole kit uh, in violation of federal law. Uh, we actually got through that. Uh, we actually an argue, We actually prevailed on that argument with a federal court, uh, and so. But the we got um, we got torpedoed by a, a Nevada state statute that uh, was very liberally interpreted against us by the Nevada Supreme Court, and uh, no doubt there were uh, political implications of Nevada saying that all that AR-15s are effectively machine guns. But I think that this is uh, enough information to download. I get the, the, the takeaway here is that you'll hear it said that, that the gun industry is immune and that's just, that's just not true. It's, it's just really hard to sue them, but they aren't immune. The statute uh, that you hear about is not bulletproof and the Sandy Hook case has proven that, um, but there are other ways uh, through this statute. And not every case involving a death uh, is even um, uh, answerable or falls within this immunity in the first place. So the first goal is to find a way around it. And I'm, I'm looking forward to following up this discussion and, and calling Gary to find out about some of his cases regarding child safety locks, for example, uh, because I think there is definitely a room in and around the statute to file suit there. And lastly, I'll just pick up on the mayor's point. Uh, when the insurance industry pays out $73 million, it is doing something that it very much does not like to do, uh, which is pay out. Uh, they like to, and, and so I, the, the hope in the aftermath of the, the Sandy Hook case is that by engaging the insurance industry as becoming, helping us as being part of the solution, and uh, making sure their insureds uh, stop courting risk, which is what the gun industry does, and starts to work on reducing risk. The hope is that that will have, you know, an effect of reducing the types of uh, death and destruction we're seeing in our communities and our in our schools. Um, so we'll see. I'll turn it over to Ala now to Jewel. I have a lot more to say about this, I'm sure. Thanks, Josh. Um, and I'm excited about being on this panel with you and Gary and with Mayor Licardo, uh, and I guess serving as the cleanup hitter, <laughs> as a, uh, maybe uh, for the panel. Um, you know, I thought what you said uh, about it, Plaka is, is really just right on, right? It's not that the gun industry is immune. It's that it's really hard to sue the gun industry. I think that's a much better explanation of it and, <laughs> and an accurate explanation of it. Um, and in that regard, I think it's worth pointing out that since PLACA was passed in 2005, not a single gun manufacturer has had to face a civil jury uh, for uh, its contributing to gun violence. So that is almost two decades of not having uh, been uh, gone to trial, uh, again, in, uh, for contributing to gun violence. And as Josh has talked about, really only recently has um, have there been developments, positive developments in getting, um, you know, uh, settlements with with uh, gun manufacturers. And I invite our audience to think about any other industry in America, manufacturing industry, that has been able to operate with that kind of impunity. It's certainly not the pharmaceutical industry, uh, which in recent years has been. Uh, you know, held to account both civilly and criminally, actually, and it's not the tobacco industry. Um, 
And it's certainly not the automotive and automotive industry as well. And I bring that example up because I think I always kind of chuckle when people say, well, you would never hold a car company responsible if someone hold a, held a car. That's an argument that we hear a lot. And my answer to that is, of course we would. If you have a car dealership that is knowingly sell, uh, selling cars to individuals who don't have licenses or who are, aren't old enough to have cars or who you know happen to be ine inebriated at the time that they uh, buy the cars, then of course that car dealership and any um, supplying manufacturer would be held responsible. And I imagine that some of the folks watching this are probably thinking, what, what exactly is it that the gun industry is doing wrong? Uh, and what is it that we want to hold them accountable for? Um, so I think, um, you know, I thought it would might actually be useful to take some concrete examples uh, and to to kind of read them out to folks uh, um, to 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 highlight some of the conduct by gun manufacturers. I'm going to start with an inspection uh, that was conducted by the federal government of a major gun manufacturer uh, in 2007 and 2008, um, and this is shortly after Placa was passed. And I'll read uh, from a letter that was written to this gun manufacturer. As you are aware, the findings of the ongoing compliance inspection have revealed numerous violations of the Gun Control Act of 1968, the National Firearms Act, and internal control issues that are concerned that concern the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosive. And this is in a letter from the ATF to the president of Smith and Wesson. Um, this was a compliance inspection done in 2007 and two, through 2008, in which the ATF found 13 categories of violations by Smith & Wesson. Not 13 violations, 13 separate categories of violations, which having been in the space for almost a decade now, I'm was surprised that there were that many categories of violations to violate. Um, some of the violations that Smith & Wesson was charged with were issuing duplicate serial numbers as a business practice in violation of federal firearm regulations, failing to report lost or stolen guns after inventories revealed missing firearms, um, transferring firearms and handguns out of state directly to non-Smith & Wesson employees, possession of unregistered NFA firearms and products such as grenade launchers. Um, the ATF refer, uh, found these violations to be overwhelming in scope I think this is one that really stuck out to me, an internal email in the ATF wrote about Smith & Wesson. Based on what we learned today, Smith & Wesson's computer acquisition and disposition records are so antiquated and their internal controls are so weak, our confidence in any inventory attempted is going to be limited. And after that, um, the ATF actually recommended revocation of Smith & Wesson's manufacturing license and fast forward uh, some time, uh, Smith & Wesson settled by paying $500,000 and agreeing to have an internal compliance uh, department for three years. So that's one example of wrongdoing identified by, um, by the ATF of gun manufacturer. Another one is something more recent in it, it, a case that, I was, uh, that our team was working on. Um, and I think it's a very direct example of a gun manufacturing facilitating gun trafficking. In November 2013, an individual by the name of James Samuels called up a, a gun manufacturer. Uh, the gun manufacturer was called Jimenez Arms. And he said, hey, I bought some of your guns at a gun show. I'd like to buy them directly from you. Um, I work part time at a gun store. So he started buying guns from him and his arms directly using his own credit card and having them shipped out of state. He lived in Missouri, him and his arms uh, is, was based in Nevada. And he even got so bold at a certain point where he told him and his arms to ship them to an address which was actually directly his home. Um, another time when him and his arms called a gun store to figure out where these guns were going, um, the gun store told them, it's okay, this guy already has buyers for the guns. Um, now, everything I've said is completely illegal. You cannot uh, sell handguns to individuals out of state without doing background checks. Um, there's no kind of exception to these laws for individuals who claim that they work part-time at, uh, at a gun show, uh, at, a, at a gun store. 
Um, so those are just two examples of bad conduct by manufacturers. And the question here is why aren't manufacturers being held more responsible for facilitating gun crimes, uh, for facilitating gun crime? And the first answer is exactly what Josh said it was, which is PLACA. I would propose that a lesser unknown um, reason for this is something called the TRT rider, which is a federal appropriations rider. Um, and I think, you know, Josh has, given the limited time here, I think Josh has done an excellent job of covering what PLACA is and the fact that it does have certain exceptions. I will note one very important recent development in the PLACA landscape is New York's passage of a public nuisance statute that applies directly to the sale and marketing of firearms, um, which, uh, of course, as it fits into the predicate except, exception, which allows um, lawsuits to continue if the defendant has violated a statute applicable to the sale and marketing of firearms. And that is something that I believe is going to be in, uh, used to hold uh, negligent uh, and um, elite, uh, me members engaged in a, in a public nuisance responsible for their conduct. Um, and that is that statute is actually being currently being uh, challenged in court and is right now is in front of the Second Circuit. And then with regard to the TRT rider, I think it's important to know about it, but it's essentially a secrecy law. Um, it it uh, has been interpreted to prevent um, the ATF from disclosing trace data or data about uh, which um, gun stores or gun manufacturers or distributors are sources of crime guns in their community. And, you know, it, I mean, the bottom line is if you don't know, if the community doesn't know, if individual victims of gun violence don't know who is supplying the crime guns, then it's impossible to hold them responsible. So that's, I, you know, I think the, both of those things have to be, they're kind of opposite ends of the same coin or opposite sides of the same coin. Um, the important thing to keep in mind for folks who are in this space is that, um, for example, uh, you know, a lot of this information is in the possession of local law enforcement, not ATF. For example, local, local law enforcement is, um, are the entity, are the individuals that, uh, recover the firearms so they are able to tell you, well, most of the guns we recover are blank manufacturer or blank manufacturer. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, and then finally, I would just say, you know, one tool that I would like to kind of put out there is in addition to lawsuits, you know, being able to go to the regulator here. There is a regulator that is, you know, has oversight over, uh, over the gun industry. Um, and I think it is important that um, you know community members and individuals and city officials, um, you know, make the make the regulator aware um, when a gun company is engaged in illegal conduct. And I will say that actually going back to my earlier example of with Jimenez Arms, that is exactly what we did. We notified and ended up actually suing the ATF for giving a license. Um, to Jimenez Arms, despite what we alleged was blatant and willful illegal conduct. And to fast forward, uh, ATF ended up recommending the revocation of Jimenez Arms license. So I, you know, I, I do think that is an important tool for people in this space to keep in mind. So I will just end it there um, and turn it back to Gary. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Ella. Um, thank you, Mayor. Uh, two quick points, and then we'll go to questions. Um, one is that, that um, you know, we do spend a ton of time talking about new laws and regulation, and uh, I think it's important to step back from time to time and remind ourselves that new laws, new regulations are only as valuable as there is enforcement of those laws. And one of the things we haven't done a particularly good job of is funding enforcement of specific gun laws. We often use them only as ancillary to charging of crimes, meaning we wait until someone commits a crime and, and then we find out or, or we add to their charges that they didn't safe store their gun or they had, you know, they were possessing the gun illegally. Um, and so I think we need to be sure that as we think about these new laws, we think about how effective and how likely they are to be enforced. Um, the other point I want to make is that I heard Josh say that PACA is not bulletproof, and I'm sure 
the irony of that statement of using bulletproof in that context was not lost on him and was intended. Um, it reminded me, though, of an effort I made a couple of years ago to um, take gun metaphors out of my speech completely. And let me just say that I missed that target entirely. Um, it does show you when you think about how many gun metaphors you use every day, it does remind you how deeply gun culture is embedded in our society and how hard it is to separate ourselves from the ethos about guns that pervades America, that we associate with the American West, and um, uh, you know, which has now been adopted by the NRA in terms of rugged individualism and freedom. And I think you know, one of the, the issues we face in terms of doing work to prevent gun violence is how to, to create marketing messages on our side of the V that are equal to and just as loud as the marketing messages that, that uh, come from the, the um, gun culture side of, of the community um, so that people hear both messages equally, at least, if not hear the messages on our side at a greater level. Um, let me direct the first question um, to the mayor. Um, can you talk about, um, particularly in the wake of the Bruin decision, what you think would be a sensible approach for to concealed carry? You know, Gary, I, maybe I should go back to comment you made earlier about the difficulty of implementing uh, enforcing regulations. Was that in reference to to what what we proposed, or was it regarding other regulations? Maybe I could address those concerns. That, that that would be fine. I mean, feel free to go ahead and talk about, you know, for example, I understand the value of an insurance regulation, but I, right. I, I wonder if it's going to impact conduct um, uh, and whether it's, it's um, meaningfully enforceable. Yeah. So maybe it'd be helpful to actually talk about that. If that's, if that's the concern. Uh, sure. So, uh, as any driver has insurance, of course, is required to have proof of that insurance uh, wherever they might drive their car. Um, the regulation here would require that uh, the gun owner keep uh, evidence of the insurance policy and their payment of the fee with the gun. Uh, if that gun's stored at home, wherever it might be stored. Um, and uh, the failure to keep evidence of that policy or the, or the payment of the fee is itself subject to fine. Uh, so that's how we're enforcing it here in the city of San Jose. Of course, uh, we just announced the fines, which escalate from $250 to $1,000 uh, to the great consternation of many gun groups uh, who are convinced that's, well, I, I won't speak for them. Uh, but um, look, we, we love to be able to be in a situation where uh, if the gun laws were different in this country where failure to comply would result in the loss of the gun in the same way that failure to drive with insurance <laughs> might result in the loss of your car. Um, I think that would probably take some evolution in, in state laws and perhaps in, in um, judicial interpretation of the second law amendment, I don't know, uh, but clearly we're not there. So in the meantime, we'll enforce with fines. And the point is, uh, people will say, of course, only law abiding gun owners will follow the law. And that's true. <laughs> only law abiding gun owners will. But you just described uh, the reality of unintentional shootings, which afflicts 25,000 um, patients in hospitals every single year. Uh, I would venture to guess the overwhelming majority of those folks are people who regard themselves as law abiding. And if they believe uh, they have a right to own a gun, as they do, uh, I'm convinced that they'll follow the regulations. The um, Another deterrent that we ought to be thinking about, it seems to me, is to hold people responsible if they are negligent and that negligence allows their gun to be stolen if that gun is there, then used in a crime. I think that's most feasible in a state like Massachusetts or California, which does require some gun registration so that you can trace back the uh, owner from whom the trace back the gun to the owner from whom it, uh, it was stolen. Um, but I think that would have a strong deterrent effect as well as I think make people more conscious of the benefit of safe storage um, because they have that potential liability. Um, let me turn next to uh, Josh. I think one of the things that we've all learned from litigating in this space 
is the importance of discovery. I think um, much of the information about things like uh, gun defects and um, problems with guns is um, most clearly in the hands of manufacturers who get consumer complaints and not very often in the hands of any kind of a public entity, uh, particularly since there's no entity like the Consumer Product Safety Commission that collects complaints. So I am sure that you have gotten a great deal of discovery through your litigation efforts. And uh, I'm wondering what you've learned about the gun industry in the course of that lit of your litigation that surprises you. Um, well, I've, I've learned that the, the iceberg looks just like the tip, you know? What we see as the finished uh, product of a marketing campaign uh, is not accidental or unrelated to an effort. Um, I've seen uh, that the industry uh, functions in many ways like any other industry in, that would sell a widget. Uh, although uh, there appears to be no consideration whatsoever for compliance or uh, public safety or liability for that matter, as, as the other uh, industries noted in this discussion, tobacco, even automobiles. I mean, tobacco is no paragon, the tobacco industry is no paragon of, of, of you know, morality, but, uh, but the, the gun industry is just not a buttoned up industry. Uh, and because it hasn't been subject to liability, it doesn't expend, spend a lot of money on personnel uh, who are looking after public safety. I think that the, the, it's not a sophisticated industry. It's uh, the people in the industry tend to uh, have a cognitive dissonance with anything that they do resulting in the types of things that the mayor has to deal with every day in his community that we all have to worry about in our own communities and, and our families. Uh, there's just uh, a belief in the type of simple, uh, uh, almost Hollywood version that you kind of touched upon, the narrative of uh, coming out of the NRA uh, and um, the seeding of all, of all responsibility to third parties like criminals uh, of, of things that, that the industry can actually uh, play a role in reducing. So um, it's very sobering, but not surprising. And uh, the, the, by the way, Gary, the documents, we are in the process, just yesterday I went through about a thousand documents uh, that I hadn't had a chance to revisit since the settlement and we'll be releasing those uh, in, a, in hopefully a, a very uh, user-friendly way to the public by the end of the year. So you can see for yourself what uh, went on behind closed doors at this industry, which I think is gonna be reflective of uh, the industry at large. Um, uh, I mean, there's a lot to say about it, but um, but it's uh, there's there's an awakening I think coming uh, to the public as a result of our documents. That's terrific. Um, one of the things that surprised me is that after even after the decision you received, many manufacturers continued to market their guns with incredibly violent messaging. I think that's more true of some of the smaller, less solvent gun owners. And I'm wondering if you think that they're, you know, the kinds of gun owners, um, I'm sorry, the kinds of gun manufacturers um, that are least solvent are the ones who are most likely to continue bad practices. I mean, I think they all are. Uh, like the, the industry is, let's face it, it's not known as an industry of much self-reflection. Uh, and uh, any thoughts I had that, the, the lawsuit would result in an awakening by the industry towards uh, in a movement towards uh, risk management rather than risk courtship. Uh, the next was sort of ended the, the day after or sometime within a short period of time after the settlement was announced. The NSSF, which you referenced earlier, which is the marketing arm of the industry, put out a statement essentially, uh, essentially trying to delegitimize uh, and to distance itself from any responsibility or, or or, or conduct uh, or, or awareness of its conduct. And you know, you're talking about an increasingly competitive space. Uh, uh, just again, this is something that I've learned. I thought, I think maybe 
the, the viewers will find interesting. Uh, imagine uh, the, the, an AR-15 uh, is, uh, is no different regardless of who sells it. At Smith & Wesson, so it's the same product being sold by many different companies. Uh, and it's like a fork. It's going to put that's going to put salad in your your mouth, right? An AR-15 is going to function the same way regardless of who's selling it. The only way to distinguish your product from your competitors is by your marketing. And so that's what led to the extreme marketing that Bushmaster engaged in because of the increasing competition as a result of a surge uh, of interest in these weapons that was that was deliberately uh, effectuated by in the mid 2000s. But when you have increasing competition, you have to outflank your competition. And how do you do that when you're all selling a fork? Or in this case, an AR-15, you paint it differently. You sell a different emotion. You get more and more aggressive if you want to court that younger market that isn't interested in target shooting or hunting. They're interested in uh, instant um, you know, manliness or a solution to all their problems. Uh, that's a very uh, that's a very lucrative consumer base of future consumers. So you're seeing, and again, I don't think that there's been any sobering to your point in the marketing. They're still trying to out out compete their competitors and outflank them. Uh, I wanted to ask you about the recent New York uh, public nuisance law that's aimed at the gun industry. Um, I understand that it's been challenged as unconstitutional. You think that's going to survive that legal challenge? And should other states be thinking about passing similar laws? Well, I'd like to punt the constitutional question to Allah, who's uh, brought it up. But uh, I'm I sorry, like I, to... that, that question was directed to Allah. Oh, it is. Okay. Because I, I, I was going to happily to monopolize the rest of the discussion. Go ahead, Allah. Sorry. Um, you know, I, I did want to go back to something that Josh said, but I will answer the question that was asked first. Um, I... I, I do think the law is pretty clearly constitutional. Um, you know, it's currently being challenged in New York um, as um, preempted by PLACA. Um, as Could you back by, up one step and just describe the law? For yes, yes, absolutely. So basically what um, New York's public nuisance statute does is it takes um, New York's like decades old public statutes, which I actually have in front of me, but basically says, um, when an individual, of an individual is liable uh, when they engage in conduct either unlawful in itself or unreasonable under all the circumstances and knowingly or recklessly creates or maintains a condition which endangers the safety or health of a considerable number of persons. So New York essentially took that language and added, um, you know, gun, the, the, the statute says no gun industry member by conduct either unlawful. So they added that right to the statute. Um, and uh, it was challenged as being preempted by PLACA as unduly vague and as um, violating the dormant commerce clause. And, you know, I, I find the, it was, and um, a, a judge in the Northern District of New York um, dismissed, uh, dismissed the challenge by the gun industry um, and the law still is in effect and is currently up in front of the second circuit. I find the preemption argument interesting um, because uh, despite the briefing on it um, that has been put forward both at the, at the district court and the appellate court, um, it is very clearly not preempted by PLACA. It is in fact very clearly allowed by PLACA. That is what the predicate exception is. Um, so I find that to be a remarkable argument. Um, and then, of course, I, you know, I, I'm not going to go into all the detail, details, but with regard to vagueness, again, the fact is that this law utilizes much of the same language that it has been utilized by public nuisance statutes throughout the country uh, that have been upheld and that, you know, it many times haven't even been challenged, but are, are, are well accepted tenants of the law. So I, I do, you know, you know, you never know. Uh, at the end of the day, but I do think that the laws are constitutional, the law is constitutional, and I do think um, they're going to make a difference, and I do think that other states should be passing them. I did, I just wanted to respond to something that Josh said about the discovery in these cases, in which is that I just completely agree in 
in really the cognitive dissonance that are, that um, it seems to exist uh, among certain members of the gun industry about their contribution to gun violence. Um, it's just, uh, I always kind of, whenever I'm filing a lawsuit, have this fear of, well, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe this was an accident. Maybe this defendant didn't do something wrong. I always have that thought in the back of my mind. And I have, uh, I have yet to be, uh, you know, prove, you know, yet to be ultimately surprised because it really is truly shocking to me um, how much um, the defendants, at least in our lawsuits, have engaged in conduct that is blatantly reckless and, you know, intentional and negligent in every word that you could think of. I mean, I, I don't want to use absolutes, but I, at the, at the very least, the vast majority of gun stores that have been defendants in our lawsuits don't even have a handbook on how to engage in gun sales. No like actual policies on how to engage in gun sales. And I just find that to be, you know, a, I, it would be comical if it didn't result in people dying. Um, so I just wanted to add that. Right, and it would be um, evidentiary at a very high level in any lawsuit against any other industry. Ricardo, I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts about whether any of the things you're attempting in San Jose are ultimately limited or will be challenged as preempted by California law as well as federal law. Yeah, state preemption has been a challenge, certainly for, for lots of cities and moving forward with laws like what we're proposing and other laws. Um, the good news is we think there's some pretty clear pathways uh, with regard to California. Uh, statutes. Uh, we know this varies from state to state. Um, we're very clear, for example, that we cannot be involved in licensing uh, firearms. Uh, we can't be involved in the registration of firearms. So we intentionally don't create a registry. We don't have the city hold on uh, to the data. Uh, we've created a, a separate 501. Well, we haven't created, I should say, if we're going to be uh, doing a, a request for proposals from 501c3s that are going to be involved in handling the dollars uh, and uh, really managing the uh, uh, the issue of the data and keeping the city away from it. Um, and we think that will be um, an effective way to avoid uh, any concerns around us creeping into areas that are, are regulated by the state. Now, we know other cities are even you know, face even greater barriers in terms of preemption. But uh, we think that there are enough states out there that allow some room um, for local policymaking that there is an opportunity for there to be some innovation at the local level. And, you know, often this is the way it happens for states to be able to adopt, uh, you know, broader protections is you get a lot of cities that jump in and eventually the legislatures uh, go along. And that's what we've seen repeatedly, certainly in California and other states. Uh, what you're doing is is fantastic, and hopefully it would be adopted at the statewide level. And um, as you say, so because the federal government is effectively um, gridlocked and and isn't doing very much at all, um, I think state initiatives really are important, um, both to protect citizens of that state, but also to set models for for national action. Um, Josh, you raised AR-15s at one point. Um, one question I have is whether you think it's feasible to regulate guns for rate of fire. If, if I remember correctly, the evidence was that at Newtown, the shooter was able to empty a 30 round magazine in six seconds. Um, and that was one of the reasons for the horrific casualties there. Uh, able to reload in you know less than a minute and uh, then fire off another 30 rounds in another six seconds. Does it make sense to think about whether guns can be regulated for safety by um, regulating how fast they can cycle mm -hmm. and uh, fire. Well, this was the challenge faced in 1934 was what is it about the gun that at that point, the Tommy gun that uh, made it uniquely dangerous. And it was felt that it was the rate of fire in, in essence. Uh, and so it has been regulated by rate of fire, uh, but technology's changed. And it's true that a rate of fire is a, is one aspect of the lethality of a weapon. And, and you know, any, any, any type of firearm is pretty good at killing somebody else at close range. So what we're talking about is, in mass shooting instances is really the ability to kill a lot of people 
within a somewhat confined area in a short period of time. And so uh, the rate of fire, oddly enough, is probably, uh, it probably militates, uh, again, it probably lowers the lethality in that situation because uh, the oftentimes the only time to intervene is gonna be in the change of the magazine. And so if you imagine a 30 round magazine being, 30 rounds being spit out in two seconds and, your, and the barrel of the weapon is rising, you A, you lose control of the, I mean, the shooter loses control of the weapon and B, wastes all that ammunition and has to then change magazines allowing for intervention. So in, in reality, the semi-automatic rate of fire is also plenty fast as you referenced, the shooter in Sandy Hook used semi-automatic, but also allows uh, for the ability to, sh to kill 30 people with a magazine rather than one or two just by spitting it all out. You know, so does that make sense? So rate of fire historically was considered, and that's where they, the consensus was back in 1934 in relationship to the Tommy gun. But this is the, the conceit here is that uh, anybody who really understands firearms would say that this semi-automatic AR-15 is more lethal for the purposes of carrying out a mass shooting. And I just want to, just one quick point, Gary, on your, so right about the language uh, that is used and the failure of the gun violence prevention side of the equation to develop good uh, uh, talking points, good language around the issue. Your use of the word gun safety, uh, and I know you didn't come up with that term, but it's probably the worst term I've ever heard in my life for people who are trying to tell the public that guns aren't safe, right? You're, you're, all we're doing is starting by capitulating on this idea that there is such a thing as gun safety, but listen to what the mayor just said about the fact that a gun is much more in a home purchased for gun safety or, or prevention is much more likely to lead to your death by gun or injury by gun. Uh, and so I feel like we need to figure this out pretty soon. And I think that the audience might be engaged on this to try to figure out how to counter, how, how, what is the counter narrative that we're talking about? And the narratives like you're talking about Hollywood, they found their way right up to the Supreme Court in the Bruin arguments. Uh, in Bruin, they, they imagined the hypothetical uh, victim of a mugging in New York City. I mean, I don't know what century these people are contemplating, but anyway, a mugging and therefore the muggy is, uh, is uh, defended by ownership of a gun. No, they're not. The muggy is going to get have their gun taken, and they're going to get shot and killed instead of simply mugged. And so we uh, we just uh, are losing. We on the sense side of of uh, human beings and caring about our brothers and sisters and our families. We're just losing this battle. And uh, you know the, the gesticulations we go through to try to not antagonize the other side. Gun violence prevention is another problem in my view because we're not for, because they, when you hear violence, you're thinking of what that's what the NRA is talking about. They're saying it's not us; it's the violent criminal that is causing all this. So when we say gun violence prevention, we're also a little bit you know bowing to the narrative that it's through the violent intervention of a third party that the harm is. And in fact, what we're looking for is the accountability of this industry to lower risk. Um, there's no gun violence per, in that term for a child picking up a gun, right? And accidentally shooting themselves. There's no real gun violence in, that, in, a, in a person committing suicide in the way that term is used. So I think we just, this is gonna take a lot of creative people who are smarter than me in, uh, in creating counter narratives so that we can polarize on this issue uh, and, and give the community a choice. And I take your point that nomenclature matters because I worked on the problem of high rate mortgage lending for many years <laughs> until someone started calling it predatory lending. Um, uh, and we made, started to make more progress. Hella, uh, do you wanna talk a little bit about safe spaces legislation and the status of those issues in New York? No, I think that's a little bit outside my uh, outside my bandwidth. Um, so uh, you know, I, I'll just start a discussion, and and maybe we can talk about it at a at a at a very high level, which is that 
you know, many people think that safe spaces legislation is a appropriate response after Bruin in New York, almost immediately after Bruin was decided, essentially outlawed carry of guns, public carry of guns in a variety of spaces, including places like bars and, and uh, other uh, venues that serve alcohol, um, you know, churches, public spaces of some kind, schools, et cetera. Um, and much of that um, uh, legislation, uh, when it was enacted into law, was immediately challenged. And there's now a decision um, staying most of the legislation so that uh, the safe spaces are not protected. Um, I think it is, you know, sort of the first response to Bruin and the first um, casualty of Bruin um, that we're going to struggle to figure out what is uh, appropriately a place where people shouldn't be allowed to public carry. Um, yeah, I, I wonder now, obviously, this is the, the bias of a, of a mayor who would just like to believe that all spaces <laughs> <laughs> should be somehow or another gun free. But, uh, you know, I appreciate many folks are d digging in deeply to try to identify those public spaces. But I don't think we should give up the notion that we should be able to determine with objective criteria, as Bruin urges, that we use objective uh, criteria about who can and cannot carry uh, in public. Um, and I, I know this may seem far-fetched in light of the 2008 Heller decision, but you know, Bruin's very clear about this need to, to attach ourselves to the historical reality uh, that existed at the time of the passage of the 14th Amendment or prior to that to the Second Amendment. Um, you know, what we know in 1790s was there were federal laws that essentially required uh, men to have guns um, for the purpose of being called up for the local militias. Uh, and the state militias were viewed as a means to defend the country against likely British invasion. Um, that was the sentiment at the time. It was articulated in congressional statute. Uh, and I don't see why uh, well, of course, I, I know why folks might say this won't work, but I'd like to think um, a jurisdiction could come up with the notion that you can have concealed carry if you are a member of the local state militia. Uh, that seems historically consistent uh, with the intent, uh, despite Heller, and I think we know that there's a lot of problems with historical analysis in Heller. Uh, I think this issue ought to be revived so we can take a fresh look at the historical record. Thanks. Um, I'll, but that killed the question. conversation, didn't it? <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's a really important point. I, I um, have concerned that, you know, we're a long way from there right now as a society, and it's going to take incremental steps to get to get back to where the Second Amendment is interpreted in a rational way. Yeah. Um, Ala, there's a question in the chat about which national gun safety groups are working on a repeal of the TR writer? You know, I, I, I'm not involved in the legislative stuff myself, but I will say that at every town we've been very involved in um, filing litigation uh, uh, pertaining to the TR writer. Um, specifically, we had a case go up to the Second Circuit. So, um, Kind of a little, a little maybe boring and too technical, but the TR writer technically says um, that the ATF shall not use any funds to disclose um, uh, trace data that's in its database. Um, and it doesn't actually say that it can; it just says it doesn't use any funds. Um, and the, the ATF has been relying relies on the TR writer to to not disclose any trace data. Under the TR, you know, under the TR writer. Um, but it's interesting because A, you know, there's lots of ways for the ATF to produce this trace data without having to spend its funds, right? It's pretty normal for FOIA requesters to pay for producing uh for documents that are produced. That's like actually the standard. Um, but on top of that, for a statute to qualify as a withholding statute under FOIA. Um, it actually has to specifically reference FOIA. Uh, so it's, it has to say this is a withholding, uh, in, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but it has to say this is a withholding statute under FOIA. Um, the TR writer doesn't do that. 
so it's, you know, we've, we have argued, I, I believe we're correct on this, uh, that the TR rider actually doesn't qualify as a, as a, as a way for uh, ATF to not disclose this data. Um, you know, we were successful in the Southern District of New York with that argument, and but then we got reversed at the Second Circuit. Um, there is another case in the Ninth Circuit um, that didn't fully deal with some of the key issues, but actually, you know, did have a positive, a, a good um, interpretation of the TR rider to allow uh, the ATF to disclose a little bit more than it's used in, than it's doing. So the TR rider, I would say, is being dealt with right now through litigation. Thanks. Another question in the chat goes to sale of gun parts, uh, particularly when they're gun parts that um, can only be used to build a gun that would be illegal under state or federal law. Um, not sure who is best to take on this issue. I, I will offer my view to start, which is that it is and always will be illegal to sell people the parts that have parts under various consumer protection laws that can only be used to build a legal product. What you're doing is you're putting your consumer, your purchaser in legal jeopardy. Um, and I think that state regulators have some ability to, to pursue those cases um, even now without further and uh, new legislation in the area. Does anybody else have a, a comment or a thought about that? I, you know, on that generalized subject, particularly as we think about what bump, bump stocks uh, did uh, and in Las Vegas and continue to do uh, to too many uh, semi-automatics, I, I'm actually interested in knowing, uh, are there products <laughs> or is there a viable approach to actually uh, creating technologically bump stock, in, bump stock inhibitors uh, that prevent um, the, the conversion to, to fully automatic weapons? It seems like that might be the basis uh, for liability if a maker of an AR-15 does not have a device that in fact inhibits the uh, the use of a, of a bump stock, is, is that conceivable? Absolutely, well, in terms of bump stock, yes, because uh, you could have a fixed stock that would not be, uh, a, I mean, there's probably a point at which something can't be prevented, but a fixed stock would have uh, done the trick, most likely. Um, and, and what the ATF says is you can't, um, that if, that if the, the rifle can be modified with a simple modification or elimination, of an existing part. So part of the bumps, the thing is that one of the features of an AR-15 is its co component nature so that you can swap out stocks and different uh, features readily. That's why the military loves it because they can outfit their weapon to suit their personal needs and the type of combat they're engaging in very easily. And it's the ease of use is, is also a selling point, but it's not just a bump stock in the uh, Uvalde shooting, uh, there was a Hellfire trigger used that we believe simulated automatic fire. If you've seen the video, you've heard the rapidity of fire that was definitely in line with automatic fire. Uh, and that's something we're looking into. Simple, again, simple addition uh, that makes the trigger function effect effectively providing automatic fire by a single pull. Uh, you know, but the, the manufacturers know <laughs> this. Uh, and there's sort of like a, a head in the sand approach, uh, but they, they uh, at some level, I think it's pretty clear that they uh, want to promote the idea that their weapons can be converted to automatic fire because their consumer base wants automatic fire. They would take automatic fire in a heartbeat if it, they could go out and buy a weapon. Uh, that's who they're selling it to. They're not selling it to the sober hunter or even to the uh, you know, the parent that believes in having a, a gun for home defense or, 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 or somebody who owns a shotgun, they're selling it to somebody who wants to shoot a lot of bullets really fast in, uh, you know, combat type, uh, you know, mission that they're selling. Um, so it, I wonder so, if any yeah. plaintiff has pursued that, that theory of liability at this point. Uh, yeah, we did. Okay. <laughs> Basically. 
Uh, but we just, and we would have, we got through. That was uh, in Nevada. In Nevada, yeah. And it's just that we got, we got dinged by a state statute in Nevada having nothing to do with what I was just saying. But um, that is, that is what we are, that's what, that's what we were looking at. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's just a, it's, it's an end run around the law uh, knowingly. And, um, and it's just a shame that, that there's, there's not the kind of oversight that, they, there are in other industries. Um, I think I think the bad news on this issue is that the bump stock regulation has been challenged, and there's an injunction that was issued in Ohio uh, preventing its enforcement. Um, and uh, many manufacturers have responded to the bump stock ban by selling actual conversion kits. So well, cold, many cold. AR-15s. Um, yeah. You, you can actually acquire a kit to convert it to fully automatic. And so anybody interested in evading the law and machine gun ownership is pretty, pretty likely to be able I mean, to. It, it, is, it is a, it's a conspiracy in essence. Uh, and, uh, and I would just point out that one of the problems when you have the conversion of the Supreme Court opinions that are coming out, you know, you have this new opinion that basically gives the Supreme Court carte blanche to say, we don't like what this agency said. So we're not going to give it credence, right? Uh, so the ATF uh, ruling on bump stocks, which correctly held that it was effect effectively an uh, automatic weapon, at least in terms of the bump stock, uh, you know, the Supreme Court could decide that they don't like that, and they could just toss it, you know, under this under this bizarre new uh, ruling that came out of their of the you know the. Uh, authority of an agency to for the final decision. So I, I'm very concerned about that. Um, look, I mean, at some point, this just comes down to who's on the Supreme Court and who's in the United States Senate. The um, well, and who's who's on the Supreme Court is a key issue. And just to pick up on the point that my friend and former colleague uh, Tim Casey made this morning, you know, what is the historical analogy to? A bump stock, you know, when you're looking at uh, Second Amendment regulation, and uh, you know, is it that there was a ban in revolutionary times on putting a double wad into your musket? I really can't even <laughs> conceive of yes, you know, how to think about this particular problem. Yeah, I mean, that's that, that's of course that's we're and we're seeing that in all different types of uh, challenges now, and like not to get sidetracked, but the but the Alex Jones case, for example, you know, the laws of defamation and First Amendment. Didn't occur in the in a time of you know uh, where you could press a button and reach 550 million uh, people across the globe uh, with a bald faced lie. So, uh, but but certainly it's very much uh, uh, it's very obvious that there's a lot of gamesmanship going on at, on our high court. Anybody? We have just a couple more minutes. Does anyone have any final comments they want to offer? Well, I just wanted to say a big thank you to uh, to those who are fighting the the, the fight, uh, the good fight in the courtrooms throughout our country. I really appreciate um, every town's partnership. On uh, we've we've consulted with them several times and uh, benefit from their insights. And appreciate all that you're doing out there in the community, uh, Josh and Gary. So thank you, thank you for fighting the fight. Uh, and thank you, Mayor. It's really important what you're doing. It's really important to keep the issue front and center at a local level. And more cities need to. Uh, pick up on your work and, and do similar things. So I want to close out the panel and say thank you to all of you. Josh, you said there were people far more creative than you, but from where I sit, all of you are remarkably creative from talking about consumer protection laws to implementing ordinances that are going to provide and require insurance where the fees will then be used to fund nonprofit initiatives who are working to protect communities. I will no longer say gun violence protection <laughs> and I'm gonna try and figure out the nomenclature of gun safety because that's a, those are very interesting comments and Allah and Gary, the work that the two of you have done and Gary, the ideas that you raised about gun storage and gun locks and why aren't there more regulations that are requiring gun manufacturers to do those kind of things so that we protect kids, mostly kids, young people. 
So all of you, thank you, thank you for all the work, all the innovative work, the creative work, and the passion you bring to your work. And Mayor Licardo, we appreciate having a mayor who is willing to come on here and probably I'll be reaching out to you to see if someday you'll be a mentor from one of our Rappaport fellows who on occasion say, I wanna be a mayor someday. And I'm always looking for people to do that. So thank you everyone. And for those of you in the audience who have spent the entire day with us, it's Friday afternoon. <laughs> thank you for being here. I think we have all learned an enormous amount and felt the passion and inspiration of the first panel who talked about the Bruin case specifically and everyone in the second panel who talked about being on the ground and doing so much on the streets to keep communities safe and all of you working as lawyers. So thank you on behalf of the Rappaport Center, all of you. Have a great thank weekend. You. Thank you.